Welcome to the Coopersmith Career Consulting Crash Course on the Science of Nutrition. In this course, we are going to be discussing different types of foods, what nutri nutrients they have, what are healthy and unhealthy about various types of foods, and lots of very important issues that are relevant to all of our lives. We will discuss information based on the assigned textbook, and then you will hopefully take the final exam. Uh, again, you have a little chart over here which tells you how you'll do, but hopefully you'll get towards the bottom of the chart in this range rather than in this range, of course. And if you uh, pay attention to this uh, crash course, I think you should have no trouble doing that. Uh, this course description is really just an indication of what we're going to discuss, a little bit of biology, a little bit of chemistry, various other aspects of science, and of course what is necessary for a well-balanced diet. You can read these course goals at your leisure. This is a textbook that you're assigned. Uh, we have a lab edition that you can do as well for extra credit if you like, And but with you can all read that in the study materials. I don't have to go over that with you necessarily. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to go right with the materials. And we're going to start in chapter one, and that is the role of nutrition in ourselves or with our in our health. And the study of food is how food nourishes our bodies and of course how food influences our health. Now we've got six groups of nutrients over here. You can see the top three are the ones that give you energy. The bottom three don't give you energy but are nevertheless very important. The top three are carbohydrates. Those are things like many types of vegetables, breads, things like that. Fats and oils, which are oil and various types of fats, margarine, butter, that sort of thing. Proteins, meat fish, vitamins, which come from fruits and vegetables, also you can take multivitamins and various other types of foods, minerals, which are scattered in various types of foods as well, and of course water, which is, doesn't fit into one of the other categories, but of course is just as essential for human health. And those two can really be divided into macronutrients and micronutrients. Macro means a lot, like macroeconomics, big picture. And then there's micronutrients, which means the smaller type. The macronutrients, the ones that are required in large amount, are basically the three energy producing types of nutrients that we discussed, carbohydrates, fats and oils, and proteins, and the micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. Water, I guess it's not on this chart, but water I guess would go into the macronutrients since we need probably more water than all other types of nutrients combined. So those are very important. So let's start with energy. Energy from nutrients is measured in calories. Calories, uh, again, people think that calories are these little magical things that are floating around in food, and if you eat them, you're going to get fat. Well, that's not exactly what a calorie is. A calorie is, it's an amount of energy. It's an amount of heat. And the amount of heat that is a calorie is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. Really, that's a kilocalorie. A kilocalorie means a thousand calories. Kilo means a thousand, like kilogram is a thousand grams. Kilometer is a thousand meters. So a kilocalorie is a thousand calories. A kilocalorie is also known as a food calorie. A regular calorie, a single calorie, is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius, that's a really small amount of energy. A kilocalorie is a much bigger amount of energy that's required to raise a thousand grams by one degree Celsius, or of course one gram by a thousand degrees Celsius, or any combination thereof. The reason why kilocalories are important is that food calories are really kilocalories. If you eat a piece of bread, it doesn't, and it says in the label that it has 80 calories, it doesn't really have 80 calories, it really has 80,000 calories, because the food calorie is actually a thousand calories, but that's okay. Don't worry about it because we're used to thinking in terms of calories, which are kilocalories, so you don't have to worry that your piece of bread really has 80,000 calories because in the calorie measures that you've been thinking about your whole life, it really is just 80. But theoretically, from a scientific perspective, a food calorie is really a thousand calories.
Carbohydrates, and you can see the three major groups, carbohydrates, fats, and oils, and proteins. Those are the ones we discussed before that give you protein. Carbohydrates and proteins have about four calories, or four kilocalories per gram. So, for example, a piece of bread that has about 80 calories probably has about 20 grams of carbohydrates. Fats and oils, as you might be able to guess, have more calories. They have about nine kilocalories per gram. And alcohol has about seven kilocalories per gram, more than carbohydrates or pro and proteins, but not as many as fats or oils. Of course, you could also combine. There are some foods that might have carbohydrates and fats and oils and proteins. Uh, if you have, for example, a tuna sandwich, you're going to have some fats and oils in the mayo. If you have mayo in there, you're going to have some carbohydrates from the bread, and you're going to have some proteins from the tuna fish. And in terms of the amount of energy that it provides you, uh, then that you can add up the number of grams of carbohydrates times four, then proteins times four, and the fats and oils times nine. And the reason why it makes people gain weight to eat too many calories is because if you eat more than your body needs, your body is able to take those materials and turn them into fat and store them in your body for future reference. Now, in the old days, that was really important because people would go without, without having access to food, so the body was able to take fat that was stored and used it, use it. In today's day and age, we have plenty of food, so the battle is the opposite. The battle is most people want to try to consume as few calories as possible so that the body does not have extra calories that it takes and stores as fat. Now let's take a look at some examples that you might be given in figuring out energy that's being given by these various types of calories. We're going to look at calculating the amount of calories that one eats. For each nutrient, multiply the number of grams by the amount of kilocalories it has per gram. Remember, fats were 9, and proteins and carbohydrates were 4 each. So let's take an example here. We've got John Doe who eats a lunch that has 75 grams of carbohydrates. Sounds like a lot, but you'd be surprised how quickly you get it to, get to 75 grams. You're talking about like a bagel. <laughs> it's about the 75 grams, or pretty close to it. Uh, 15 grams of protein, 12 grams of fat, and how many calories is John's lunch? Well, pretty simple. Take the 75, multiply it by 4, because you've got 4 calories, or 4 kilocalories, in every gram of carbohydrates. That's 300. We've got 15 grams of proteins. That's 15 times 4. 60, then we've got 12 grams of fat, so 12 times 9, because that 9, uh, gra 9 calories per gram, when you're talking about fat, is 108, and you add all three of them, and you get 468 kilocalories that John Doe ate for lunch. If you're wondering what would have uh, about 468 calories, probably a Maybe a tuna fish sandwich with extra mayo, or, <laughs> or a tuna fish sandwich with very, you know, with a very fatty mayo that it's made with, or something like that. It doesn't. 468 calories for a meal sounds like a lot, but truth is, it's really not a lot. You'd you'd be surprised how quickly it adds up to that. If John Doe would then go ahead and drink 13 grams of alcohol with his lunch, he'd have a martini or something uh, with his tuna fish sandwich, then that, you got to add 13 times 7, 7 calories per gram, that's 91, 91 calories, and all of a sudden John Doe's tuna fish sandwich slathered an extra mayo with his martini would have a grand total of 559 calories. Okay, let's take a look at, um, okay, if you want to look at the amount of calories per, um, from fat or from carbohydrates or from protein, sometimes if you look at a cereal box or any food, it'll tell you the number of calories and then it'll tell you number of calories from fat. Let me make this a little bigger, and or from fat, or from number of calories from from whatever. How do you calculate that? Again, it's fairly simple. Just use the same basic numbers. You can divide the calories from fat by the total number of calories and multiply that number by 100 in order to get the percentages. So just again, what that means in English is, let's say, let's give an example. Life cereal provides 112, 120 calories. 15 of them are from fat. What is the percentage? that you would have in terms of calories? And the answer is very simple. Just take 15 divided by 120, which is 0.125, and 0.125 is the same thing as 12.5%. Percent literally means per 100, and so therefore whenever you want to figure out a number and turn it into a percentage, you have to multiply by 100, because then you have percent, which means per 100. So 15 out of 120 is 12.5% of the calories from fat. 
If you only know the number of grams of fat, that's not a problem either. All you got to do is multiply it by 9, which is the number of calories per gram when you're talking about fat, and then you can figure it out from there. Let's take another example. A one serving snack bag contains 300 calories and has 15 grams of fat. And we are asking you, what is the percentage of calories from fat in the entire snack bag? Well, let, first thing you got to do is you got to figure out, okay, how many calories are from fat? Well, we know there are 15 grams of fat. We know that each gram of fat has 9 calories. 15 times 9 is 135. So 135 out of the 300 is from fat. Divide the 135 by 300 and you get 0.45 and 0.45 is the same thing as 45 percent. So in this snack bag if it has 15 grams of fat and 300 calories total that means 45 percent of the calories are from fat. What are the rest from? Well in a snack bag probably uh, carbohydrates. I suppose theoretically there could be some proteins in there but if you're talking about potato chips or barbecue twists or any of these other you know regular junky snack bags you're probably looking at carbohydrates and fats and that's pretty much it. Let's turn now to the various types of nutrients that we discussed and look at them in a little bit more detail. First, carbohydrates. What is the main purpose of carbohydrates? Carbohydrates are the primary source of fuel for the body. More than any other single source of nutrients, our energy comes from carbohydrates. Where do carbohydrates come from? Well, from most of the staples that we eat. All kinds of grains, wheat, rice, of course, which includes pasta, bread, many types of vegetables, things like that, things like vegetables. Many types of fruits also have carbohydrates in them. Have what's called fructose, which is a type of fruit sugar, which is also sugar. All types of sugar are carbohydrates. All types of starches are carbo carbohydrates. Legumes, which includes beans and uh, like, well, I guess um, certain, well, beans <laughs> is the only example I could really think of. But many things are carbohydrates. Fats and oils, which have a very high energy content, a very high calorie content, as we saw more than twice as much as protein and starch, are an important energy source that are our bodies and that are for our bodies at rest and during low intensity exercises. And they are a source of fat soluble vi vitamins, which means vitamins that can be absorbed in fat, that's what solute means, and essential fatty acids. There are certain types of acids that occur in fats that our bodies need. So believe it or not, our bodies actually need fats. Now, of course, they don't need nearly as much as we tend to give them, <laughs> because fat tends to taste very good. So generally speaking, unless we're very careful, we tend to eat a lot of it. But fats are an important source, and they're a very, a very important source of various nutrients, and of course, they have a very high energy content. Their composition is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, C, H, and O. Uh, carbohydrates are actually just have carbon and hydrogen, not necessarily oxygen. That's If you notice the word carbohydrate, carbo is carbon and hydrate is hydrogen. Uh, fats tend to have car uh, hydrogen and oxygen. Actually, the truth is that... Um, Carbohydrates also have also have oxygen. So the truth is, all the, these three things are in car, are in carbohydrates and fats as well. Um, food sources: butter, margarine, vegetable oils, various things like that. Actually, you know, I really I'm going to cut this because oxygen is really uh, definitely in carbohydrates. Hydrate. I'm sorry for misspeaking before, but hydrate actually means hydrogen and oxygen. So a carbohydrate has all three. A sugar, a starch, has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, fats and oils definitely have carbon and hydrogen, although I don't think they always necessarily have oxygen in it as well. One thing you'll notice is that all energy-giving food have these two, carbon and hydrogen. And the reason is because that's what makes something organic. Something that's organic, which means the basis of human life and other all, all types of life really on Earth, are those two elements, carbon and hydrogen, which makes something organic. And so therefore, energy-giving food has to have carbon and hydrogen in it. Then you have proteins. Proteins have a fourth element. They also have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they also have a fourth element called nitrogen. And nitrogen uh, adds certain things that carbohydrates and fats do not have. Proteins are important not only to give you energy, which they could give you energy, but aside from that, they, they also are necessary to 
build cells and tissues, maintain bones, repair damage, regulating your metabolism, which means the functions of which the body uses in order to keep alive, your fluid balance, they also, and proteins are made of what are called amino acids. Amino acids are important building blocks in many essential components of our cells. Things like even our DNA, which is the blueprint for all life, are built on, are built of, of chains of amino acids. So proteins are really necessary. If you live on only carbohydrates and sugar, I'm sorry, only carbohydrates and fats, you'll have plenty of energy, but you won't have these essential proteins that you need, and so it's not a good idea. Where do proteins come from? Meats, dairy products like milk, eggs, things like that, seeds, nuts, legumes, things like beans, legumes, can have actually both uh, starch and protein. In fact, that's true very often. Foods can have both starch and protein in them, or both starch and fat, or both fat and protein. Uh, for example, meat has both fat and protein in it, so just because it has one doesn't mean it cannot also have another one. There are vitamins, of course, that's the next in issue regarding nutrients. We definitely need vitamins. These are organic molecules that inorganic molecules. Again, I'm sorry, there's some important typos over here. Uh, vitamins are actually inorganic molecules, which means that they do not necessarily have carbon and hydrogen, but they also are necessary to regulate the body's processes. Therefore, they do not supply energy to our bodies, and there are fat-soluble vitamins, which means vitamins that are can be dissolved in fat, and there are water-soluble vitamins that can be dissolved in water. Uh, Fat-soluble vitamins includes A, D, E, and K. You don't have to remember those necessarily. Just remember that fat-soluble vitamins exist that dissolve easily in fats and oils. They can be stored in the body, but too much of them is no good because it can be toxic. That's why too much vitamin A is no good. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, carrots have vitamin a, that doesn't mean you're going to overdose on carrots or anything like that. You don't have to worry about that. But for example, if you take pills that give you more and more and more vitamin A, uh, you know, carrots you're not going to you're not going to be able to eat enough to, to harm you. But you don't want to take lots and lots of pills that give you a tremendous amount of vitamin A because these vitamins in too high a quantity can actually be toxic. There are water soluble vitamins like uh, B, uh, C and B. They remain dissolved in water and they are eliminated by the kidneys, so cannot be stored in our bodies. So, for example, you can go ahead and have all the vitamin C you like. Just I'm holding right here a uh, a bottle from CVS of pills that contain a thousand milligrams per pill of vitamin C. Uh, they say that it keeps away colds in the winter. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't necessarily know whether that's true or not, but uh, but I have them nonetheless, and I'm not worried about overdosing because vitamin C is a water soluble vitamin. It can it, re it is retained by the water, and the body can just flush it out with the rest of the water that the body gets rid of. So it's not a problem. You're not going to overdose on vitamin C. So don't worry. You can eat all the oranges and lemons and uh, nectarines that you like. In order to tell you how much of each of these things you need, they have created, I'm not sure exactly who they are, but the people who are in charge of these things, whoever they are, have created these DRIs, dietary reference intakes. In other words, if someone tells you, well, you've had too much fat today, I guess the first question you could ask, according to whom? Who says? You know, 12 hamburgers for at a barbecue is too much. Well, the answer is, You've got to look at these DRIs, and there are a whole bunch of examples of DRIs, which basically tell you how much is enough and how much is too much. Here are some examples. You have the estimated average requirement, which is the average daily intake level of a nutrient that will meet the needs of half the people in a regular category. These are used, we don't really hear of that one too often, what we do hear all the time, and we hear this or see this on the sides of... Uh, boxes and cans of food is the RDA. Sometimes it's called the US RDA, the United States RDA, which stands for the Recommended Daily Allowance, which is the intake level necessary to meet the needs of virtually all people given in a given stage life and a given gender. The RDA may be a little different for men and women in terms of, in, in terms of some types of vitamins, minerals, uh, fats, proteins, etc. They also might be different depending on whether it's a child or an elderly person, pregnant woman. All of these things can have an effect on what the U.S. recommended daily dietary allowance is. You also have the adequate intake, which is the recommended average uh, 
average for a nutrient, and this is used when the RDA has not yet been established for different types of vitamins, and, you'll, and the, the maximum you should have, the tolerable upper intake level, is the highest in, that's not likely to have adverse effects. So consumption of a nutrient above this level, this UL, is not considered safe. And all these things, I don't think you have to memorize them. You've probably heard RDA a lot anyway. But just remember that these things are all established for the purpose of trying to educate people on what they need and what they don't. So for most nutrients, have an estimated average requirement, recommended daily allowance, adequate intake, etc. And for energy and macronutrients on the right side, which, is, which includes, of course, uh, things like carbohydrates and fats, you have the estimated energy requirement and the acceptable macronutrient distribution range, <laughs> which essentially tells you how many proteins you should have as opposed to how many fats. What some, Again, that's why you'll see sometimes on the sides of, of boxes calories from fat, because there are certain limits of how many of your, cal of your calories should be from fat. If you have a calorie, if you have a normal calorie intake but half of it is from fat, that's not healthy because you're probably not getting enough protein. Okay, now in terms of research, scientific research, this is really kind of the part of the first chapter of every types of, type of science that you're ever going to learn. How are things generally learned in terms of nutrition or really in terms of any science? This slide could be in a course about biology or a course about earth science or a course about chemistry or physics or whatever. The answer is, is things are generally studied through what is called the scientific method. The scientific method starts with an observation or multiple observations where you read statistics or you observe things, you see things, you measure things, and based on your observations or based on your general knowledge, you create what is called a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an educated guess that establishes one way or another whether something you believe is correct or incorrect. Once you do that, once you develop your hypothesis, you can design, collect, and analyze data which means you can conduct experiments, you can test things out, you can uh, look at the statistics other people have compiled, you can do all sorts of things in that respect, and you can then make a determination of whether your hypothesis is correct. If there is a broad-based scientific agreement based on numerous tests of hypotheses, then a scientific principle can become a theory. And of course, even a theory, if it's later disproven, can be challenged or changed. That's the general idea of the scientific method. You have observations, which means you see what goes on, you develop a hypothesis, you experiment, which means you test your hypothesis to see if it actually works. If your hypothesis is that eating a root is going to uh, cure your toothache, well then I guess you got to find a lot of people with toothaches who are willing to eat roots and you give them all roots, maybe you have two groups, one that you don't give the root to and one that you do give the root to, so that you can have what's called a control group, which means a group of people that are not that you're not experimenting on, and you see, did it work? Did this root cure more people than the group that did not have the root? If the data does support your hypothesis, you repeat your experiment, hopefully you accept your hypothesis, and hopefully if enough people accept it, it becomes a theory. If your data does not support the hypothesis, either you can reject your hypothesis if the data doesn't support your hypothesis, either you can reject your hypothesis and start from the drawing board and say, okay, I give up, or you can change your hypothesis a little bit. Maybe you can say, for example, uh, the root helps, helps cure the toothache if you wash the root in water and then you try it again and experiment it again and see if your observations uh, will confirm your hypothesis this time. Some other things that are important in studying, especially for nutrition, nutrition is obviously very important in terms of studying because you want to be able to test drugs, be able to test different types of foods, etc. You want to make sure to have a control group. A control group, whenever you're testing the effect of one substance, you want to have another group that doesn't have that substance. You want, you're testing a pill for headaches, you want to have one group that does get the pill, another group that doesn't get the pill. Number two, you want to have an appropriate sample size. 
You don't want to have one person in each group. Maybe you want to have a hundred or a thousand people in each group in order to have a large enough sample size. If it's just one person in each group, there could be other reasons why the headache got cured or did not get cured. But if you have a thousand people and your product works on 800 of them and the other group only has 200 that get cured, it's a pretty good indication that your pill is doing a good job. The other possibility, another thing that makes it even better, is if you give the people in the control group, you give them what's called a placebo. A placebo is something that the, 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 they think, their subjects think is the pill. The subject thinks is the thing that you're experimenting, but it isn't actually. So for example, uh, let's say you have a thousand people that you're testing this pill on. You give 500 of them the drug that's supposed to make them feel better, and you give 500 a sugar pill, which or a pill that does nothing, a placebo, something that looks like the pill and tastes like the pill, but isn't, isn't actually the pill, and you, and, and you test to see is there still a significant difference. The reason is because there exists a theory, something called the placebo effect, it's really a psychological phenomenon, that people sometimes get better if they think they're taking medicine, even if they're really not, because psychologically it helps their state of mind and they get better for that reason. So if you give them a placebo and you and your pill still does better than the placebo over a lot over a big sample size, that's a pretty good indication that the pill is working. And sometimes it even works. You don't even have the person that's doing the administration of the pill know which one they're doing. The theory is that if the the, if the person giving the pill knows that they're giving a placebo, maybe their body language will give it away, maybe they'll be a little bit less enthusiastic, or whatever, and that will cause some sort of psychological effect that will decrease the effectiveness of the study. So doing a double-blind study where you give half the group the real thing and half the group a placebo, and the person that's giving the pill and the person that's receiving the pill has no idea whether it's a placebo or the real thing, that's a really good way to measure whether your pill is actually effective. Who are professionals that are considered nutrition experts? Well, there are registered dietitians who are qualified for offering food, pan, food plans. Uh, they very often will help people to lose weight, help people that have diabetes or food allergies or some other problem. There are licensed dietitians, there are medical doctors, professionals with degrees in nutrition. These are all people who are considered nutrition experts. And finally, in chapter one, I want to briefly go over alcohol. Alcohol is a chemical compound characterized by what is called a hydroxyl group, which is essentially a group that's attached to a molecule that contains a hydrogen and an oxygen. You notice the word hydroxyl is, then, is, is like, or seems to be from the same root, as hydrogen and oxygen. It's commonly known as beverages containing ethanol made from fermented fruits, vegetables or grains. Fermented fruits you'd, would be brandy or cognac or wine. Uh, vegetables would be, I guess, vodka would be an example from fermented potato. Fermented grains would give you bourbon or scotch or, uh, you know, whiskey, something like that. Um, some vocabulary words regarding drinking alcohol. A drink of alcohol is the amount that is provided of a half a fluid ounce of pure alcohol. Uh, one drink is considered 12 ounces of beer, 4 to 5 ounces of wine, or 1 ounce of heavy spirits, like 1 ounce of scotch, 1 and a half ounces of scotch, something like that. If it were 100% alcohol, it would only be a half an ounce. Uh, scotch, which is about uh, usually 30 or 40% alcohol, let's say 40%, so it's 1, 1 and a quarter ounces is a shot of alcohol. Beer, which doesn't contain so much alcohol, you need 12 ounces. Regular wine, about 4 to 5 ounces. Proof is a measurement of alcohol content. In fact, proof is usually twice the percentage. If something is 40% alcohol, that usually means it's 80 proof. In fact, that always means it's 80 proof. That's what it means. Um, moderate alcohol consumption is considered about either two drinks for a man per day, one drink for a woman. But moderate consumption means doing it consistently. Having one drink a day or two drinks a day, it doesn't mean drinking a six-pack at once. That's called heavy drinking, even if you didn't drink all week. You don't get to save it up. You know, you don't get to not drink the whole week and then have ten drinks and then say, oh, well, okay, I'm just a moderate drinker. Uh, if you drink, the, obviously, heavy drinking at one time could have a substantial effect at that one time. So you're not really gaining anything by not drinking, drinking the whole week if you're going to have ten drinks at one time. Now, there are some advantages of of alcohol, and of course there are some disadvantages. 
some benefits, it does tend to reduce stress and anxiety. Alcohol is what is known as a depressant. It settles your body down. You chill out a little bit when, you're, when, when you've had alcohol. Uh, it also decreases appetite and decreases, sometimes decreases food consumption or extra food consumption. Also, interestingly enough, it can lower your rate for heart disease. It increases the level of good cholesterol and lowers the concentration of bad cholesterol. So it can actually help for heart diseases. I mean, my grandfather used to, to, his doctor told him to always to drink one drink a day, and he did. And uh, and, his, and well, I mean, he lived to 88, <laughs> so I guess that's a, that's pretty good. Anyway, um, but the point is, there are of course some disadvantages, even to moderate drinking. A slightly increased risk for break, bre uh, breast cancer, slightly increased risk for high blood pressure. Um, alcohol also, of course, has a high calorie content. So if you drink a lot, uh, you're, it is going to put on weight. You're talking about seven, seven calories per gram, which is almost as high as fat. Alcohol also reduces inhibitions. You, know, you, feel, more, you, feel, you feel more chilled out, but on the other hand, that also mean, could mean that you eat more because you're just not paying as much attention. There are also some other advantages, like red wine and grapes have antioxidants, called Rivaritol. For Raritol, uh, interesting. That's they they call this the quote unquote French paradox, where in France they eat all very fatty foods. Their their foods are very often in cream, and nevertheless France has a relatively low heart disease rate. And they think that one of the reasons is because the French drink a lot of wine, and red wine and red and purple grapes have these antioxidants which help lower uh, problems, diseases such as liver diseases, heart diseases, diabetes, etc. Also, on the other hand, though, it can also it's also linked to higher bleeding of the brain, resulting in a stroke. So I guess it really depends on which way you want to go. If you want to go of heart problems, then don't drink. If you want to go of a stroke, then do drink. Okay, well, that's a little little simplistic, but it does increase slightly the risk of bleeding from the brain, which can lead to a stroke. And you can also have problems with drug-alcohol interactions. If you take painkillers or you take other drugs, sleeping pills, whatever, and you drink, that could magnify the effects of these drugs, and it could cause complications or overdoses that are unintentional. And so therefore, many medication lab labels advise consumers not to drink while they're on that, that medication. Now, of course, then you've got the abusers. Alcohol abuse is means excessive intake of alcohol more than just moderate drink more more than just moderate drinking that includes binge drinking which is a consumption of five or more drinks in one occasion that's really a lot of alcohol makes you makes you drunk uh, alcoholism is a disease characterized by chronic dependence on alcohol which obviously could cause problems in health it, it's very expensive. Uh, it can cause overdoses. It can cause all sorts of problems. People operating machinery or driving while they're drunk obviously are in tremendous danger. A hangover is a consequence of drinking too much alcohol. If you drink too much, the next morning when you wake up, you might have things like headache, fatigue, dizziness, muscle aches, nausea. Uh, I don't know if I've ever been hungover, so I don't know if I can really tell you what it is, but I imagine some people listening to this might have been hungover once or twice, so you might know what this means. Alcohol poisoning, which can also happen from drinking too much, is a potentially fatal metabolic state, including involving cardiac or respiratory failure, which is a big problem, and also alcohol can cause liver disease such as cirrhosis uh, because the liver filters out poisons from the bloodstream including those by alcohol and if the liver is overstrained by too much drinking that could obviously cause problems. Let's take a look at a couple of sample uh, multiple choice questions and we have the answers here. We're just going to look at these. Uh, John's friend has recommended that he take an iron supplement before undergoing surgery. He is worried about cons uh, consuming too much. Which of the following nutrient standards would, should he want to, to should he use to try to to try to make sure that he know, determines the highest amount that would be safe for him to consume? So in this case, it would be the UL. Remember the four things that we looked at before. The UL, the tolerable upper level intake, is the maximum that you should take. So if you're worried about what is the maximum that you should eat safely, these other things recommended in dietary allowance is uh, based on how much you should have, whereas the upper level, upper intake level, is the maximum that you should have. 
Okay, um, for average weight males, binge, drink, binge drinking is five alcoholic drinks within a short period of time. For Harry to be considered binge drinking, how many ounces of beer would he have to drink? Well, remember that a drink of beer was considered 12 ounces. For hard liquor, it was one to one and a half ounces. For wine, it was about five ounces. For beer to be a drink, it has to be 12 ounces. So five drinks times 12 ounces is 60 ounces. So in order to be considered binge drinking on beer, you'd have to drink 60 ounces. Now, 60 ounces is a lot of beer, uh, so you can imagine that binge drinking is a lot easier, or a lot, uh, I shouldn't say easier, but a lot, um, well, yeah, easier if you're drinking hard liquor or even wine than it is if you're drinking beer. Chapter 2 is about designing a healthful diet, trying to make sure you get all the nutrients that are necessary for the materials that your body needs. A helpful diet is adequate, which means it provides enough energy, nutrients, fiber, vitamins, minerals, all the things that the body needs to survive. On the other hand, it's also moderate, which means it doesn't have more than it needs. It has the right amount of food for maintaining proper weight and health. Also, too much of a nutrient can cause toxicity in some cases. Like as we discussed before, too much vitamin A, too much of the, of the fat-soluble vitamins or too little of a nutrient can cause deficiencies. What you want is not too much and not too little, which means you want something that is balanced, has the right combination of foods to give you the right combination of nutrients. On the other hand, you also want something that is varied. You want to eat many different types of food. If you live on one particular food, no matter how healthy it might be, it's not going to give you all the nutrients that you need. Something could have protein, but it's not going to have vitamins. It could have calcium, but not have magnesium. It could have, uh, you know, it, it, one individual food, no matter how wonderful the food is, is probably not going to get it, get it, do it for you. What you need is a variety of different types of foods to get you all the different types of nutrients that you need. Examples of unhealthy diet would be something like eating only pizza, macaroni, and cheese, and lasagna. Each of those individual foods are certainly can be part of a healthy, balanced diet, but they're all the same kinds of foods. They all give you a lot of starches in terms of the bread and pasta, and they give you protein specifically from the cheese, but it only gives you one type of protein. You want to have many different types of protein because different types of proteins have different types of amino acids, which you need. Uh, other examples of unhealthy diet, eating only potato chips, pasta, bread, rice, these are all things that are all starches. E even if you would also eat vegetables, you still probably wouldn't, it still probably wouldn't be good if you only ate potato chips and other types of vegetables, pasta and vegetables, it's still not good because you need protein. And you could take vitamin supplements to get the vitamins you're missing, but really the best thing is to get it in your food. And furthermore, as we discussed before, you want a variety of different types of sources of proteins. Proteins have many different types of amino acids, and if you get all your protein from one source, you're probably not going to be able to get all the different types of proteins that you need. The diet lacks other nutrients found in other protein sources, and it could also cause nutri nutrient deficiencies in iron and zinc because they are only found in other types of proteins, like meat. Iron deficiencies are problematic. Generally, any deficiency of a, of a vitamin or mineral that you need could be problematic. The best way to take to eat nutrients of course, is through the food itself, not necessarily through vitamin supplements. Vitamin supplements can work. Vitamin supplements can be okay. They can be useful for a particular vitamin, or if people are not able to eat foods that provide a particular nutrient. For example, if you just can't stand citrus fruits because uh, they're too acidic or for you just can't stand the taste and so therefore you want to take some vitamin C pills. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but you want to try to get your vitamins and minerals from as wide a variety of actual foods that you have, that you can't, as you can. The ideal nutrition, nutritional strategy is to eat a healthful diet containing a variety of whole foods which will provide the nutrients necessary in the best possible, most efficient manner. Whole food, of course, means food where you eat all the nutrients in the food. For example, if you take a potato, which is a healthy food, but you cut off the skin, which is the healthiest part of the food, then you're, you know, it's the, then you're making it less healthy. Then especially if you cut it up and fry it and turn it into potato chips, it becomes even less healthy and more fatty. But the idea is that's the idea of whole wheat also. Regular white wheat that we have is they cut away the outside of the wheat kernels but the whole wheat contains materials that have these nutrients in them. Okay, <clears throat> how do you read a 
that pan the effect panel. How do you read a nutrient effect panel? Well, virtually every food today, when they come from the store, they come with nutrition fact panels. And these are very useful in planning a healthful diet. You've probably seen these many times. I will uh, put a couple of examples over here. The one on the left over here is from macaroni and cheese, and you can see it has 320 calories. Calories from fat is 90. Just out of curiosity, if you notice that it says total grams, uh, total fat is 10 grams, and that's because each gram of fat, as we discussed before, has 9 calories. So if it has 10 grams of fat, 90 cal nine times 9 is 90 calories. If you want to know the percentage of grams from fat, obviously you could just take the 90 and divide by 320, and you'd get 28125, which is 28.125%, 28 and an eighth percent. It also tells you saturated fats, trans fats, which are not good types of fats, the cholesterol. It also tells you the number of carbohydrates, 44 grams. Notice 44 grams of carbohydrates is, uh, what, 4 calories a gram? So 44 times 4 is 176. So we had 100, what did we have before? We had 90 calories from fat. We have 176 from the carbohydrates. Uh, so that's, then, well, then you have uh, some sugar, you also have some protein, you have the various calories come from the various different sources, and it also has some vitamins and minerals on the bottom. It has 4% uh, of the RDA, the recommended daily allowance, or the recommended dietary allowance, 15% uh, calcium, 0% of vitamin C, and 15% of iron. These are important because you want, if you want to make sure that you get enough calcium up to the RDA, up to the re recommended dietary allowance, you have 15% from this foods. So maybe later on in the day you'll eat something with 20% and you'll get up to 100 altogether. If you want to calculate which food you're eating in order to make sure that they have enough nutrients, these labels are very helpful. If you look, and if you notice on the bottom, there are really it's the recommendations for the number of calories you should eat in a day. There are some people for whom a 2,000 calorie diet is better, some people for whom a 2,500 calorie diet is better, and so it depends on your gender, age, size, different things like that. Uh, but so they they put for each one, they they put the uh, the, the the statistics for each one. For if you have two, if you if you're on a 2,000 calorie a day diet, you should have 65 grams or less of fat. For a 2,500, they call 80 grams of fat. In other words, they're suggesting on how you should break down your 2,500 or 2,000 calories. Let's look at the one on the right. The one on the right happens to be from a random food. Uh, we have 250 calories in whatever this food is. <coughs> 110 calories from fat. It's almost half of it from fat. 12 grams of fat, notice 9 grams of course, same thing, 9 calories per gram, 12 times 9 is 108, okay, so it's close enough to 110, round it off. Uh, saturated fat and trans fat, you got a, you know, you got some of these, which you don't, which is not good. It also has some cholesterol. It has a substantial amount of sodium, 470 milligrams, which is 20% of the recommended dietary allowance for an entire day. It has potassium, which is good. Um, it has a lot of potassium, 20% of what you should have in a day. Uh, 31 grams of carbohydrates. It's also got a little vitamin A. It's got a lot of calcium. You know, which indicates right away that this could be a milk-based product or a cheese-based product. I mean, there are many clues, by the way, over here that it's a milk-based or a cheese-based product. First of all, it's got a lot of calcium, which is a hallmark of milk-based products. It also has fat, it has carbohydrates, and of course it has proteins. It has some five grams of protein. Uh, I would, I don't, I don't, honestly, I don't even know what this is specifically, what this is from, but. I can imagine something based on milk and something that's got a lot of fat in it, obviously. 12 grams of fat per serving, almost half of the uh, material. <coughs> and something that has some milk in it, but may have some other stuff also. Maybe like vanilla pudding. <laughs> I'm just guessing over here what this might be. Or some kind of a real milk-based pudding. It's got the carbohydrates, but it's, uh, or some kind of a you know, a, a milkshake or something to that effect is what I'm guessing this. Maybe some kind of a, a of an ice cream dish. Oh, well, anyway, again, I'm just speculating over here. Not sure exactly what it is, but you can see what the nutrition label looks like. Here's another example of a nutrition label. This is nutritional facts seen in different types of seafood. 
You can see there are many different examples of seafood over here, from the blue crab all the way to the catfish, clams, cod, all the way in the bottom to the tuna and the tilapia. And notice that very often they have totally different amounts of calories and various types of vitamins. Fish isn't all the same, of course. Uh, you have blue crab over here. In terms of the number of calories, it's fairly similar, except salmon has a very high number of calories. Salmon, I think, leads the, leads the list at 200. There are others that are more like 100 or even less. Calories from fat, you can see uh, salmon also happens to have a high fat content at 90 calories of fat, almost half of the total number. Uh, again, their saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium. Look at some of the others, though. Uh, iron, for example, there some of these are good, like clams seem to be a good source of iron. Uh, scallops and shrimp. Uh, oh, oysters, 45% of the recommended daily allowance in iron. Uh, some of these are good sources of calcium, 10% for the o ocean perch. Vitamin C, eh, not much <laughs> for anything. That's really a hallmark of citrus fruits. Vitamin A, you've got 10% with the clams again. That's pretty much it in terms of high values. Protein, see fish has a lot of protein. Fish is substantially a protein, and that's why individual servings have a lot of protein in here. 20 grams uh, for many of these things, 24 for the salmon, 27 for the scallops. Pro fish happen to be excellent sources of protein. And you can see many of them are relatively low fat contents. That's why fish is generally considered a very healthy protein, because the fat content is generally pretty low. Not always. I mean, salmon obviously has a lot of fat, but the fat content is generally speaking pretty low, and the protein content is very high. And also it could have some other uh, benefits over here. Uh, if you are looking, of course, for a percent of the calorie intake, then you would just simply divide by the total number of recommended calories. So if you're talking about a 2,000 calorie diet, and you're talk and let's say if I ask you one serving of flounder has what percentage of the number of calories you should have in a day, and it says in the diagram over here that it's based on a 2,000 calorie diet. Well, flounder, where's flounder? Over here, okay, 100 calories. So it's 100 divided by 2,000, which is 0 0.05, which is the same as 5%. Again, just multiply it by 100 to convert it into percentages. Eating out in restaurants can actually be a challenge for people who are health conscious. And that's because restaurants, they're going to charge you a lot of money for their food, so they're probably going to want to give you food that tastes good. And so therefore, they're probably going to add a lot of fat and calories, because fat and calories tend to taste good. And also, you don't get to read the nutritional labels. When you're in the supermarket, you could read the side and say, wow, that's got you know 758 calories and 59 grams of fat. I'm not going to eat that. But on the other hand, when they put it in front of you in a restaurant, your plate does not come with a little label that says, beware, this dish has 1,125 calories. So restaurants very often involve high-fat foods, and they give you big, <laughs> big portions. They give you large portion sizes, again, because they want you to be satisfied, and they want you to not feel bad about the $38 check that's coming in a few minutes. Uh, a restaurant meal can be equivalent to a recommended fat or daily intake for an entire day. In fact, the uh, the Bloomin' Onion, which I saw online, which is um, like a, a dish, I think they have it at Dougie's also, uh, <laughs> and where they have this this fried onion with batter, this huge fried onion with, with batter all over the place, and they serve it as an appetizer, but it has something like uh, 2,200 calories and, uh, you know, 100 grams of fat, or some insane amount like that. And, you know, if they would put that in a, in a supermarket and they would say this has 2,100 calories, nobody would ever go near it. But because they put it in front of you in a restaurant and you just eat it and don't worry about the calories, that's, you know, that, those are some of the challenges of eating out. How can you eat out at restaurants healthfully? Well, a lot of these are common sense. You can avoid breaded or fried foods. Breaded foods happen, tend to have a lot of carbohydrates. Fried foods, a lot of fat. Order salad with low-fat or non-fat dressing instead of soup. Ask for steamed vegetables instead of fried vegetables. Substitute vegetables instead of potatoes or rice, which are very high in carbohydrates. Avoid cream sauces and cheese sauces, which can be very high in fat. Order small portions, uh, share an entree with somebody else, or order a chicken or a veggie burger instead of a beef burger. Again, you don't have to always do these things, but doing these once in a while certainly will help. Some examples of what are good choices as opposed to not such good choices. 
Well, the idea is even if two things have the same number of calories, you still have to look at what nutrients are in there. It's better to have 200 calories worth of things that are nutritious than 200 calories that are totally empty. Soda, for example, which has about 100, a 12 ounce can of soda has about 150 calories. It's not that many calories, but it's kind of empty calories. It doesn't give you any protein, doesn't give you anything in terms of vitamins, minerals, nutrients, so it's kind of a waste. Uh, if you look over here, some good examples and some not such good examples. We have breakfast on the good side. You've got some oatmeal, some skim milk, and some whole wheat toast and grapefruit juice. You've got your vitamin C, you've got your protein, your skim milk, you've got uh, you know, a relatively low-carb piece of bread, um, a little butter, I guess it's a little fat, but not the end of the world. On the other side, you've got uh, puff rice, puffed rice cereal, whole milk, and some grape drink. So the toast and the butter are the same, but that's pretty much it. Uh, the white toast as opposed to the whole wheat toast, as we discussed before, not as healthy. A uh, puffed rice cereal doesn't have a lot of nutrients, and the grape drink doesn't have the vitamin C that the grapefruit, the grapefruit juice did. For snacks, good snack, yogurt, high in protein, high in uh, other cultures, things that are, they actually have high in probiotics, which are bacteria that the body needs. Um, and also an orange, which has also high, high in vitamin C. A bad snack would be something like a little piece of cheddar cheese and a can of soda. <laughs> These are all pretty obvious, but you get the point. Um, the point you want they, what they're trying to tell you over here is good snacks have fruits and vegetables, uh, drinks with vitamin C, drinks uh, things with protein, uh, things that have whole foods rather than just components of the food and things that do not have empty calories you know bad a good snack uh, half a bagel and half a whole wheat bagel and an apple bad snack can of coke and a and three cookies three three oreos and some jelly beans <laughs> etc again you, i think you can get the point okay We've got some multiple choice questions, and I'm going to delete the answer until we look at the questions to give you a chance. Which of the following would be good practice when eating out healthily? A. Order cream-based soups to increase your calcium intake. Ah, nope, that's not so good because, well, the cream-based soups don't really, may, they may increase your calcium intake a little, but it's also going to dramatically increase your fat and calories. Ordering a large entree to yourself. Instead of a chicken, order a beef burger, order a low-fat or non-fat salad dressing. I think we all realize right away that the answer is D. Chicken tends to be lower in fat and calories than beef, so C is incorrect. And, uh, well, it was just suggested before that you want to share entrees, although, you know, again, that's something that most people don't actually do. All right, anyway, if Laura were to consume all of her protein from meat and fish, she might develop deficiencies over which over time. Again, protein from meat, they both have good sources of protein, but which do they not contain? Calcium and phosphorus, riboflavin and vitamin A, zinc and iron, protein and vitamin D. Well, I'll tell you now that calcium is something that as we discussed before, milk-based foods have. Fish and meat do not have. Phosphorus is another, another example of something that mission, fish and meat do not have, and therefore the answer is A. Vitamin A, zinc, iron, protein, vitamin D, riboflavin, these are all things that uh, meat and fish do have, so it would not be a problem based on that kind of a diet. Chapter 3, Are We Really What We Eat? Well, the first thing regarding eating is digestion. Digestion means breaking down large molecules into small molecules. Eat a piece of bread, well your body's got to break down the starch molecules into simple sugar molecules that can actually be used in the body. Same thing with protein. You eat complex proteins, body's got to break them down into simple amino acids. That's really what digestion is. When we eat, so we'll start from the top of the body and go through as we move down into the body, we want to eat First of all, the strong smell of good food stimulates our appetite. Nerve receptors in the stomach send signals to the hypothalamus, which is the part of the stem of the brain which tells us what we want to do and really regulates the desires in us. Blood glucose levels trigger hormones called insulin and glucagon. If we have, then this helps to regulate. The body says, hey, we've had enough sugar, or the body says we need more sugar by producing these, uh, these hormones that tell the body what it needs, and that sends a signal to your brain that says, you know, give us more sugar or give us, you know, less sugar. Oh, that, that's pretty rare. Anyway, body hormones also stimulate the feeling of hunger. Also, 
food stimulates our sense of taste and, and sight. Certainly, when we uh, when when we see food, when we smell food, when we touch food. I don't know about hearing food. <laughs> Maybe when we hear the sound of a skillet uh, being uh, preparing waffles or pancakes in the morning, we then it helps stimulate our desire to eat. Again, I think we can all relate to that because we've all we've all experienced that. In our body, our body is made, well, atoms are the smallest unit of matter altogether. Atoms mean things like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, as we discussed before. These are bonded together, and they form molecules, such as H2O, which is water, CO2, which is carbon dioxide. And as I said before, simple molecules are the result of digestion. When we eat something that's a complex molecule, our body breaks it down into simpler molecules. In a living thing, the smallest unit of life is a cell. A cell is actually itself very complex, but humans are made of millions and billions of cells. There are some organisms, like bacteria, which only have one cell for the entire organism, only have one cell for the entire thing. Cells make up tissue, like nerve tissue, mu muscle tissue, etc., just like com components, many cells together, are tissue, and tissues make up Organs. Organs are sophisticated organizations that form a specific function. Organs are parts of your body that do something. Your heart, your lungs, your brain. And an organ system is a bunch of organs that work together. Your digestive system, your excretory system, your nervous system, endocrine system, these are all systems within the body. So now let's go back and look at these things a little bit more detail. The cell itself has a cell membrane, which is the outer layer of the cell. Cholesterol, which you know it has a bad reputation, but it's necessary to some extent in the body. It could also hurt by clogging up the the bloodstream. But some cholesterol is necessary because cholesterol and, and proteins are embedded in the membrane, and that allows certain things in and certain things out. The membrane is what is called selectively permeable. Some things are allowed in, some things are allowed out. Other things are not allowed in or out, depending on what the cell needs and what the cell needs to get rid of. Within the cell, there's like a liquidy, watery, you know, material in there, and that is called the cytoplasm. And within the cytoplasm, you have the organelles. Organelles are the little components of the cell in which stuff happens. You have the nucleus, which is the heart of the cell, so to speak. That's the part where the DNA is, the genetic information, the instructions. Where it really more more than the heart, the nucleus is probably the brain of the cell, where the instructions are. The mitochondria is the cell's powerhouse that does what is called the respiration, which means the energy production. And you have the ribosomes, which produce the proteins that the cell needs. Again, this is what a cell basically looks like. This is the selectively permeable membrane of the cell, allowing things in and out. You've got the organelles in the middle. This gooey stuff all around would be the cytoplasm. You have, uh, then you have the nucleus in the middle, and then you have uh, ribosomes, mitochondrion, mitochondria, and the various other cell membranes. Okay, now let us move to digestion. Now that we've discussed what's in the body, now we have to discuss what happens to the food when it comes into the body. The process of digestion starts immediately as soon as you put the thing in your mouth. We're going to use the example of peanut butter cookies, although it could be crackers, could be pretty much anything. Digestion begins in the mouth. Chewing is mechanical digestion. There's two types of digestion. There's mechanical digestion and there's chemical digestion. Chewing breaks it down. In order to break down the food, first thing you need to do is break it down into little pieces. And what does that? The teeth. So the teeth breaks the cookies into smaller pieces. And also your saliva, which is floating around in your mouth all the time, breaks down carbohydrates. It doesn't actually break down uh, meat or fats, but it does break down carbohydrates, like the cookies, crackers, or whatever it is. That's why, by the way, if you've ever chewed a cracker with lots of saliva and then taken the cracker out of your mouth and looked at it, and please don't tell me you've never done that. We've all done it, okay? 
uh, it you can see that it's kind of changed form a little bit. It's it's more sticky, and it, aside from just being wet, you can also tell that it's actually changed form. And the reason why it's changed form is because it's been partially digested by your saliva. In the back of your throat, you have the epiglottis, which covers the opening to the trachea. The trachea is the windpipe. The esophagus, which we'll get to in a minute, that's the food pipe, where the food goes down. Then you also have the trachea, which is the windpipe that, that goes to the lungs. You don't want food going down there, you only want oxygen going down there. So to make sure that food doesn't slip down the trachea, into the trachea, you have the epiglottis, which covers it during swallowing. Now, of course, every once in a while, you by, by accident get a little food or or drink down down the windpipe. Maybe you're talking, maybe you're, you're moving your head around a little bit, and then you kind of cough it up, but it's not a good idea if you can avoid it. Uh, so the the esophagus is where the food travels. The mass of the cookie that's been chewed uh, goes through the esophagus, and it ends up in the stomach, which we'll get to on the next slide. Generally speaking, whenever material moves through the digestive system, the force that causes it to move is called peristalsis. Peristalsis is what gets the food down the esophagus, through the intestines, etc. Anyway, the GI, by the way, stands for the gastrointestinal tract, which means the area through which food goes as it is being digested. So it goes through the stomach, where it gets broken down, and chemically and physically, by gastric juice, which has a very strong acid in it called hydrochloric acid. So the chemical digestion of proteins and fats are broken down uh, by the juices and acids in the stomach, and then it goes into the small intestine after it goes through the stomach, and the small intestine is where most of the digestion takes place. Small intestine, even though it's called the small intestine because it's very thin, is, ha is very long also. If you'd spread it out, it would be, I don't know, 20 feet long or something if you spread out your small intestine. But the food keeps making its way through the small intestine, and as it does, it get, gets broken down by various chemicals that are secreted into it. Then, whatever the body needs is absorbed through the walls of the small intestine and into the body. You have these different sections over here. Again, those are just parts of the small intestine. That's not really critical. What is important is just understanding these basic uh, materials in the, um, in, the, in the digestive tract. Excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry, this is quite small, so I'll just tell you outside. I mean, it's not critical that you know all these things anyway, but first of all, the sphincter separates the esophagus from the stomach, which is like a little trap door almost that makes sure that food uh, actually goes into the stomach and doesn't come back up, although sometimes it does back up into the esophagus. That's when you have heartburn sometimes. But with that, we don't have to worry about that now. The point is that you have gastric juice in the stomach, which contains various types of materials, hydrochloric acid, pepsin, gastric lipase, mucus. These are all things, mucus actually lines the stomach, and these are all things that help break down the food as it comes in there. You have chemical digestion of, 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 stum of fats and um, fats and proteins, and again we discussed all of this, and now let's look in the small intestine, which again we've looked at. This is the main, uh, the main organ for absorption of foods. Once they're already chemically broken down and physically broken down, then they get absorbed into the bloodstream. There are little hairs in the small intestine that absorb the nutrients, and these hairs are called villi. These are folds in the lining that are, have come in close contact with these now broken down proteins, fats, starches, vitamins, minerals, whatever it is. And then these go ahead and enter the veins, namely the bloodstream, through blood vessels, veins that are winding, them, the winding their way through the small intestine as well. Um, okay, so you have these water-soluble nutrients, which that can dissolve in water. Uh, carbohydrates, proteins, minerals enter the portal vein. Fat-soluble nutrients, the ones that dissolve in fat. Lipids, which are fats, and some some vitamins enter the lymphatic vessels, which transport them to the bloodstream. Again, these are just the way in which the small intestine actually absorbs the nutrients that we need. Then we have, by the end, by the time the food's gone through the small intestine, whatever the body needed has already been absorbed. 
but some of it the body just doesn't need. The body either is not able to digest or it's just the body just doesn't need it for whatever reason. As it continues, undigested food components move through another spinter called the lochecal valve, and that goes into the large intestine, which is the colon. By this point, it's already waste, because at this point, the body doesn't need it. If the body would have needed it, then the, through the villi, while it was in the small intestine, it would have been absorbed into the bloodstream. And then, so the rest of it is non-digestible material, fiber, bacteria, water, whatever it is, and eventually it turns into what is called feces, which we all hopefully know what feces are, and feces are then released from the body uh, a little bit later on. Some other parts of the digestive system, you have these accessory organs. In other words, organs that we didn't already mention that are not the stomach or the esophagus or the small intestine, large intestine, mouth, but help in the digestive process. One is the salivary glands that produces saliva for the mouth. Saliva is necessary for many reasons. Uh, number one, if you want to spit. <laughs> um, but aside from that, if you, you for to help digest foods, to help swallow foods, you need a little uh, saliva, and to help digest crackers and cookies and peanut butter cookies when you eat them. You also have the liver. The liver produces bile, which emulsifies, which means breaks down fats. And when you eat, fat from the food causes the bile to be secreted into the small intestine in order to break down the fat. In other words, this bile, which the liver produces, is going to help you break down the fat. You also have the pancreas, which produces many digestive enzymes and hormones, and it helps digest sugars, carbohydrates, and help the body's metabolism. And you also have the gallbladder, which is kind of in between the liver and the intestine, the liver and the small intestine. And so the liver produces the bile, and then the gallbladder holds it, and then waits until the fats come streaming down the stomach into the small intestine, and then it releases the bile into the small intestine. Now let's look at some diagrams. I know this it was a lot to cover so far in terms of what we did, so now we're just going to look at these in terms of drawings. Well, we've got the mouth, which has the teeth, which break down the materials physically. What does the tongue do? Aside from talking, obviously, that's one aspect that the tongue has, but in digestion, what the tongue does is it moves the... F we don't even notice it because we just do it automatically, but the tongue moves the food in position to be chewed. I mean, try chewing without your tongue. It's not so easy. You could do it. You know, you could shake your head around until the food gets under your tooth, but it's a lot less efficient and a lot more difficult. It's a lot easier when you just have the tongue to kind of swish the food all over the place where it can get chewed. You have the trachea, which is the windpipe, the esophagus, which is the food pipe, the epiglottis, which blocks the trachea during chewing, the salivary glands, which um, produce the saliva. Okay, then we have it go down through the, uh, well, we don't want to go through the trachea, so instead we go down the esophagus. This movement, remember, called peristalsis again, kind of squeezes the food, this green stuff, straight down through the esophagus to the stomach. And then once it gets to the stomach, look at that. We've got a stomach right over here. We've got another spinter to, to keep the food in, in the stomach, and then the stomach kind of squeezes together and crushes the food to mechanically digest it, and secretes this gastric juice, pepsin, gastric lipase, and all these different things to, to chemically break down the food while it is in the stomach. Then we've got the small intestine, from the stomach. Here's the gallbladder. Remember the liver was over here somewhere, which produced all the bile, stored it in the gallbladder, and as it moved in here, then the gallbladder releases the bile, and the pancreas releases other types of materials like insulin, glucagon, things like that, to help break down the food. And as the food is moving in, as the food is going all the way through this path, it's getting absorbed by the villi into the bloodstream. By the time it gets down here, if there's anything left, whatever that stuff is, is no longer usable by the body, so the body it continues to the large intestine. What are some problems you have with regard to the intestinal, the digestive system? Well, heartburn is called, caused by the hydrochloric acid in the esophagus. Remember the stomach? I'll go back up to the stomach drawing over here. Well, this was the stomach, and here's the esophagus. Now, there's a lot of hydrochloric acid in the gastric juice in the stomach. Sometimes, if the stomach produces too much of it, and there's just not enough room in the stomach, some of it could back up into the esophagus. And whereas the stomach has very good lining, 
that prevents it from being hurt or irritated by uh, acid, by the hydrochloric acid, the esophagus doesn't have that sort of lining. So, you know, where you feel heartburn, which is, you know, right below your, I guess, right at the lower triangle of your, uh, of your rib, where your ribs meet, uh, you can, you, you feel it because that's kind of like where the stomach meets the esophagus and that's where the, uh, the food, the, I'm sorry, the, the hydrochloric acid backs up into. So that obviously can, can be very unpaint and very unpleasant. You have gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is basically heartburn that happens a lot. Diarrhea. Diarrhea is where the normally after, when you get to the large intestine, the body is supposed to reabsorb most of the water to conserve for future use, and then when you go to the bathroom, number you know number two, um, it's it's pretty dry. Well, when they when the body is is not reabsorbing the water for whatever reason, then the feces become very wet, and then you have diarrhea. The opposite is when the body absorbs too much water; you don't have enough water, and then you have constipation where it's hard to release the um, of the feces. You also have irritable bowel syndrome, which is basically anything that interferes with the uh, function of releasing feces from the body. Food intolerance, which causes s some people have bad reactions to certain types of food, food allergies, uh, celiac disease, which is intolerance for gluten, which is something found in wheat, rye, and barley, which could cause people to obviously have trouble eating wheat and trouble eating grains, trouble eating carbohydrates. And this can damage the small intestine, and it requires a diet lacking wheat, rye, and barley. People sometimes that have this, you know, use spelt or some other grain that's not one of these. All right, uh, gluten-free foods can be made from rice, flour, potato flour, corn flour, things like that, anything that's not wheat, rye, and barley. So let's finish off the chapter with some multiple choice. The human body is organized into the following from smallest to largest. Well, let's see. Atoms, molecules, cells, tissues, organs, systems. Well, that sounds about right. Remember, atoms are the smallest things possible. They build molecules. Molecules build cells. Cells make up tissues. Tissues make up organs. Organs make up organ systems. So right away, I think we think A is the correct answer. B is incorrect because atoms are all the way down here. And, well, you can see right away why the others are wrong. Okay, second one. After you eat a meal of hamburger with french fries and a cup of soda, the fat in the meal ultimately causes A, a slowing down of the entire digestive process. Again, not necessarily. I mean, no reason why it would necessarily cause a slowdown. It causes the digestive process. Bile to be secreted to the small intestine and emulsify the fat. That sounds pretty good, right? Because you've got fat in this meal. You've got a burger which has some fat. You've got french fries which certainly have fat. They're fried in oil. So in order to emulsify, which means break down the fat, you're going to need bile. So I think that's definitely true. Indigestion, which is bad digestion, some problem might or might not happen, but there's no, uh, you know, there's no guarantee, certainly. You hope not, as a matter of fact. And pancreatic lipase to be secreted into the stomach. Well, pancreatic juices are secreted into the intestine, not the stomach, so right away you know that's wrong. And so therefore, the only answer that I see as being correct is B. Starting with the next chapter, we are going to look into the various nutrients and how they are made up chemically and some of their more important characteristics. First up, carbohydrates. As we discussed earlier, carbohydrates have three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and they are one of the three macronutrients with protein and fat, the ones that give us our energy. They're an important energy source, especially for nerve cells. Essentially, as I mentioned earlier, they probably give us more energy than any other single type of nutrient and they're composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The two basic types of carbohydrates are simple carbohydrates, also known as monosaccharides, which, create only, which contain only one molecule, like glucose. Glucose is regular, plain old, run-of-the-mill sugar, you know, the sugar that we have. This is the most abundant type of carbohydrate and the main form of carbohydrate found in the blood. It's also the form produced by plants. Plants don't eat food, but they make their own food through a process called photosynthesis, and the food that they make is glucose, individual, simple, plain old, run-of-the-mill sugars. There's fructose, galactose, fructose is the kind of sugar uh, in fruits. Again, there are various types of sugars, but these are all monosaccharides. Mono is the Greek meaning one, and saccharide is 
the some foreign uh, some early language meaning sugar. Uh, you may you may know the the sugar substitute called saccharin, and the reason why it has that that name is, is because it is a sugar substitute. Then there are the disaccharides that contain two molecules: lactose, maltose, sucrose. By the way, if in case you didn't notice, anything with an O S E at the end means at least in nutrition means the sugar glucose, fructose, sucrose, maltose, etc. Then you have the complex carbohydrates, also sometimes known as the starches. Spaghetti, bread, things like that. They're called polysaccharides. Poly means many, because there are many sugar molecules. They contain multiple molecules, and they require the most steps to be broken down by cells. Remember, the cells can only use it when it, when it gets knocked down into a monosaccharide. So when you have spaghetti, the digestive system has to break them down into individual sugar molecules. Sugar, obviously, is easier to digest because the body doesn't have to break it down. The cells could use it right away. Next, let us take a look quickly at some of the uh, sugar, uh, some of the chemical diagrams for how these things work. Now, it's not important that you remember these individually, but if you look at just some of the general principles by which sugars abide. Sugars usually have either six carbons or five carbons. Actually, all these examples have uh, five carbons apiece. Uh, then there are a bunch of hydrogens and a bu bunch of oxygens. Usually it's something like twice the number of hydrogens as carbons, and oxygen is roughly the same amount. For example, this is glucose, which has five carbons. How many oxygens? One, two, three, four, five. Also, how many hydrogens? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Roughly in a two to one ratio. Two hydrogens for every one oxygen and for every one carbon. Fructose is sweetest natural sugar in fruit. High fructose corn syrup, again, that's fruits and vegetables also, uh, have a type of sugar called fructose. Galactose, these are all examples of monosaccharides because they have a single individual sugar molecule in each molecule. Then when you combine sugar molecules, you get disaccharides. Glucose and a galactose gives you a lactose called milk sugar. People who are allergic to milk or uh, who digestive system doesn't handle milk very well is sometime, are sometimes known as lactose intolerant. And the reason is because lactose is the kind of sugar that you see in milk and dairy products. Two glucoses together equal a maltose, and a glucose and a, fr glucose and a fructose equals a sucrose. These are found in sugar cane, sugar beets, honey, these are all different types of sugars. Complex carbohydrates include things like starch, which are a storage form of glucose, and basically a whole bunch of glucose molecules together. You have in things like grains, things like bread, spaghetti, all different types of grain-based starches. Then you have glycogen, which is a stored, it's the way glucose is stored in animals, in liver and muscles. And you have fiber, which forms the support structures in plants. Obviously, fiber also has certain important roles in human beings. Glycogen, and we've already discussed this briefly, but again, a lot of these are repetitive, is the way in which animals store glucose. And it is stored in the liver and in the muscles. It is not inherently, in and of itself, a source of dietary carbohydrate. It's just the way in which our body stores complex carbohydrates. Fiber is a very important component of our diet. You have dietary fiber, the kind that really comes from the non-digestible parts of plants. It really helps with our digestion, and that's why we need it. So that's why when you look at uh, a food, a bread, whatever it is, and you see it's high in fiber, it's usually good for you because it helps facilitate your digestion. There are types of solute fiber that do dissolve in water, and insoluble fiber that don't dissolve in water. Solute fiber which is digested by the bacteria in the large intestine, reduces the risk for cardiovascular disease by lowering blood cholesterol. And insoluble fiber also helps, found in whole grains, to re it, uh, it 
promotes regular bowel movements, alleviates constipation. Basically, it helps you with regularity of bowel movements. So both are really good. Soluble fiber helps decrease heart disease, and insoluble fiber helps promote good digestion. So both of them are really good. Um, benefits of a high fiber diet include reducing the risk of colon cancer, which is again in the large intestine, which is we you know the reason why that's true is because it has it helps facilitate the smooth functioning of the colon, reducing heart disease. It also can enhance weight loss. Uh, it helps prevent hemorrhoids, constipation. It, it can cure constipation. It can have all sorts of wonderful effects. Inclu some really good sources of fiber are things like whole grain bread, whole grain things in general. Enriched flour is something you don't want. Enriched flour means the regular flour, the flour that probably tastes the best. That's the one where they've stripped away the outside and stripped away a lot of the fiber. And the whole grain doesn't taste quite as good, but it's definitely a lot healthier for you. Not so good to have excessive amounts, but again, and it's also, of course, important to drink a lot of water in terms of your digestion. In addition to having plenty of fiber, it's also a good idea to have plenty of water to facilitate smooth functioning of everything running through the digestive system. The reason why you need carbohydrates, of course, is because you need it for energy, for daily activity. Carbohydrates and fats are what the body generally prefers for most bodily function, functions, and glucose is the thing that your body needs to respirate, the thing that your body needs for energy. So your body having glucose gives it a supply of energy that you need. And that's why a diet in low in carbohydrate will very often result in ketones. Ketones are, well, uh, elevated, everybody's got ketones, but uh, elevated ketones, which is not good for the kidneys. And the reason for that is, is because if the body needs to draw all of its energy from proteins and is going to be breaking down a lot of proteins, proteins have ketones in them, that's going to cause an increase in ketones, which could cause problems with kidney functioning and various other problems. So eating carbohydrates help, pre help preserve the spare proteins for other for other uses. Now there is a lot of talk of low carbohydrate diets. You know, you may have heard of the Atkins diet. The theory behind the Atkins diet is you eat a lot of fats and proteins but don't eat a lot of carbohydrates and the idea is that the body then has no choice but to break down all the fat that you need and therefore you lose weight by not eating a lot of carbohydrates. Now that works for a lot of people but it also has some risks. It's good because A, people tend to eat too many carbohydrates so decreasing carbohydrates generally is good and number two because added sugars are not good for the body generally speaking. You want to have some carbohydrates but you don't want to have too many. Obviously, the risk is that you might not have enough energy to keep you going, but again, you know, you could make up for that by probably eating just enough carbohydrates or fats instead. You can also be at risk for, for having too many ketones, which essentially means that you are breaking down too much protein. And fiber is very, very beneficial to the body. So even if you don't, even if you, you decrease your carbohydrate con consumption, try to increase your fiber consumption. Um, so, for example, there are, there are some muffins. Just to, just to give you an example, there are some English muffins that are that are high high fiber English muffins that have like 25 grams of fiber, even though it only has about uh, 20 grams of carbohydrates. So if you have things like that, you can actually uh, do both: decrease your fiber intake, but um, decrease your carb intake, but increase your fiber intake. One of the things the body has to do is regulate blood sugar. Glucose, as we discussed, is another form, is really just another word for simple sugar. Now, the blood needs sugar in it because it needs to deliver sugar to the individual cells. On the other hand, too much sugar in the blood could cause diabetes and could cause serious health problems or even death. So you don't want that. Extra glucose is stored as glycogen in the liver or muscles, and the body produces a substance called insulin, which is in the pancreas, and what it does is it regulates blood sugar content. It, it stimulates the liver to take up glucose and convert it into glycogen. So in other words, if the bl blood has too much sugar in it, then the, the liver becoming active and converting glucose into glycogen could decrease the amount of, of sugar in the blood. So insulin is obviously necessary to regulate the amount of sugar that you have in your blood. Glucagon is a special type of hormone that's secreted by the pancreas. It does, does the same thing. It also has the effect of regulating 
and ensuring that your blood sugar level is appropriate. One way to measure the blood glucose level is through the glycemic index. It's a measure of the food's ability to raise the blood glucose level. Foods with a low glycemic index, glycemic index excuse me, are high in fiber and are better for people with diabetes because obviously they tend to decrease, they tend to not increase blood sugar level. So this is the diagram. You have insulin and glucagon both produced by the pancreas, and the key thing to remember is that they both help regulate your blood sugar level, because if you don't have good blood sugar level, you could, you could have what is called diabetes. Uh, diabetes, well, really what it is, diabetes is an inability to regulate blood glucose level, and it could cause infections, nerve damage, kidney damage, blindness, seizure, stroke, etc., etc., etc. I mean, personally, I know people that have passed away, or I knew people that have passed away from diabetes complications. Obviously, it's not something you want. Type 1 diabetes is a type of diabetes that people are born with, and type 2 diabetes are, is what's called adult onset diabetes. People, when they become adults, usually because they're overweight, but not necessarily, but usually people who are overweight, their body sometimes loses the ability to control blood sugar level, and that's what's called type 2 diabetes. Then there's gestational diabetes. Sometimes pregnant women temporarily get diabetes when they're pregnant. Uh, diabetes... The, these are some of the symptoms, type 1 diabetes. Again, you can see they're slight different, but they both have, obviously, serious problems associated with them. Things like uh, fatigue, irritability, infections, blurred visions, cuts and bruises are slow to heal. These are all things that could happen as a result of diabetes. And oh, they're both called diabetes, but there are some slight differences between them. Type 1, which again is usually what people are born with, very, you know, when children have diabetes, it's almost always type 1 diabetes. The body doesn't produce enough insulin, and it creates high blood sugar levels. Frequent urinary, urination is just one possible uh, symptom. It could be an autoimmune disease. In other words, it could be some sort of a malfunction of the immune system. Uh, it could lead to all sorts of problems, obviously, and it could also be genetic, which means parents who have diabetes are more likely to pass type 1 diabetes to their children. Type 2 diabetes, which progressively over time, uh, which is adult onset diabetes, triggered most commonly by obesity, and it include, the body cells become insensitive or unresponsive to the insulin that's produced in the bodies, and there are all sorts of problems that it could cause. People who ha do have adult onset diabetes uh, have to dramatically decrease their sugar consumption and even their starch consumption in general, because remember, um, starch does get broken down into sugar also, and also they have to constantly monitor their, uh, their blood sugar level, and if it gets too high, there are certain, you know, you can take insulin, both types of diabetes can take insulin from outside the body to help uh, manage blood sugar level. Okay, and now let's look at some multiple choice. Uh, again, these are some examples. Doug has a very low dietary intake of carbohydrates. His body performs incomplete breakdown of body fat. So which substance is most likely to result? Well, if, it don't, if you don't have enough carbohydrates and you don't break down body fat, well, the only thing that's left is proteins. And if you break down proteins too much, which one are you going to get? We discussed this. You're going to get ketones, which is the problem. And that's why the answer there is B. Individuals with celiac disease must eat gluten-free foods. Which can they be made of? Well, remember, these are the grains, wheat, barley, and... I'm sorry, wheat, rye, and... Uh, which, what was the third one? Barley, maybe? Anyway, <laughs> the three grains. Wheat, oats, and barley, or rye, whatever. Anyway, so A is incorrect because that has wheat. B is incorrect that it has rye. C is incorrect that it has wheat. And so D, rice and potato flour, is in fact correct because that is the one that people with, that need gluten-free foods will have to eat. In the next chapter, we look at fats that next level of nutrients after carbohydrates, which we covered in Chapter 4. Fats are called lipids, or lipids are really the building block of fats, and they do not dissolve in water, unlike carbohydrates, and especially sugars, which do. Lipids, are the, which are the building blocks of fats, are a diverse class of molecules that do not dissolve, as we just discussed. Uh, triglycerides, which are also really types of fats that are in the body, uh, triglycerides are necessary, too much of them are no good. Sometimes high triglycerides can cause health problems, of course. Are composed of three fatty acid molecules, 
and a fatty acid is an acid, which is a long chain of carbon atoms that are surrounded by hydrogen atoms. That's really what an acid is in general. Fats usually have just carbon and hydrogen, whereas other acids very often have other um, atoms in them. A glycerol is a three-carbon alcohol. It's the backbone of a triglyceride. This is essentially what a triglyceride looks like. You've got a fatty acid on the right over here. You've got a glycerol on the left. And you put them together, and you've got a triglyceride. The key thing that's important to remember is that triglycerides are types of fats, and they are in the human body, of course. Fatty acids can vary based on their length based on the length of their carbon chain. This thing over here on the bottom is the carbon chain. You can see this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, well, I don't know, about 15 uh, carbons on the chain. Short is less than six, six to 12 is medium, and a long one like this one is 13 or more. They're also based on level of saturation. How many, car how many hydrogen atoms surround each carbon? In this example, you've got a saturated triglyceride because all oh, the carbon is surrounded completely with hydrogens. Every carbon's got two hydrogens and this one all the way on the end over here is surrounded by three hydrogens. You can see they're completely saturated with hydrogen, whereas ones that are missing H's over here would be unsaturated. Uh, as you may know, saturated fats are not good for you. Unsaturated fats are better for you. So saturated fats, they have no double bonds. They, this is an example of a saturated fat. And they have hydrogen atoms surrounding each carbon. Examples are butter, coconut oil, animal fats. Unsaturated fat, by the way, what saturated fat also means is it is generally solid at room temperature, whereas unsaturated fats are usually liquid at room temperature. Most types of oils, peanut oil, olive oil, vegetable oil, they're liquid at room temperature, and the hydrogen atoms can be arranged in different positions. They can have, there are trans fats, where the hydrogen atoms are on opposite sides of the chain, the train, of the chain. These are important, of course. It, it's not that critical that you remember the specific uh, al allocation of hydrogen atoms, but it is important that you know what all these things are, essentially. Saturated fatty acids, bad for you have completely saturated with, with hydrogen. Unsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature. They're generally better for you. Uh, the two types of unsaturated fats are monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats. Monounsaturated fats, notice that word mono meaning single, uh, means you have one double bond, whereas polyunsaturated fats have at least two double bonds. Okay, here are some examples, just a little diagram here. Here you've got a saturated fatty acid. They stick together well, and therefore they are solid at room temperature, like lard and margarine and butter. Whereas monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids, they are, these fatty acids are liquid at room temperature, like most oils. Here are some examples of the chemical formulation of various types of acids. You have fatty acids, all oh, these are fatty acids over here. You have some that are saturated, which means they are completely full, filled with hydrogen. Every carbon's got two hydrogen with it. Monounsaturated has only one double bond. And you can see not every, over here there are examples of carbon with only one hydrogen rather than two. And then and here you've got a double bond, so you've got polyunsaturated fats. Again, this is really just kind of a review. Where these are important, and this we're going to start looking into, now we're going to start looking into the fats' role in nutrition. Uh, saturated and trans fats are harmful to your health because they lower good cholesterol and raise bad cholesterol. And therefore, it's a good idea to try to limit your intake of saturated fatty acids and trans fats to as little as possible. Uh, you can drink fat-free milk or 1% milk with coffee instead of whole fat milk. Uh, you can also whole milk, which is about 3% uh, fat. Uh, this will avoid the risk of heart disease, cancer, and other diseases. And of course, it will also include your, include your lipid profile, which is how much fat you have in the blood. And you should maintain fat intake only about 20 to 35% of your total energy. In, in other words, in terms of all of your calories, the general consensus is that only between 20 and 35% of it should be fat. And if you, when you do eat fat, you should try to get them from unsaturated fats and non, not trans fats because saturated fats and trans fats are not good for you. Nuts, on the other hand, which are high in fat, 
very high in fat, but on the other hand, they are also rich in healthy, unsaturated fats, and they also contain nut, protein, minerals, and fiber. So even though nuts are generally high-fat foods, they are also considered to be healthy foods. Of course, you eat too many of them, they have too many calories, you're going to get heavy no matter what, but relatively speaking, as fatty foods go, nuts are pretty good ones. Nuts have a lot of calories, 160 to 180 calories for one serving of nuts, about four tablespoons depending on the nut, you know, like peanuts, almonds, cashews, things like that. But what research shows regarding nuts is that people who eat one or two ounces of nuts don't gain weight from increased calorie in intake. They're generally more lean and more muscle, and people find nuts satiating, which means uh, fulfilling, and therefore they eat less later. Also, one possibility is that energy in nuts might not fully absorb into the bloodstream, meaning that they, in effect, have fewer calories than they actually have the potential to uh, to produce. So nuts overall, obviously, you want to eat them in moderation like any everything else, but nuts overall tend to be relatively healthy as fats go. We need fats, first of all, because fats are a primary source of energy. As we discussed earlier, 9 kilocalories per gram, as opposed to carbohydrates and proteins, which only have 4. Fats also fuel physical activity. When you need energy to use in physical activity, fats do that. Fats can help you. However, body fat is stored for later energy use, which means that if the body doesn't need the fat that you eat, the body will take it and store it as energy. And in fact, the body doesn't store protein, the body doesn't store carbohydrates, it pretty much stores it as fat. Whenever you have extra carbohydrates or extra, pretty much any kind of calorie-laden materials, the body will convert it into fat and then stick it. That's why people that are heavy are considered fat, because there's fat in the body that's making the person look heavy. Anyway, so, uh, that there's, so, what, so fats are stored in the adipose and muscle tissue, various types of tissues that make energy for the body available for the, uh, even when you, if a person doesn't eat, if a person's fasting for a day or two, well then the body's going to have to burn fat in order to carry on the normal metabolic processes. In other words, the normal things that people do every day. Also, fat transports fat-soluble vitamins. Remember, we learned earlier there are some fat, some water-soluble vitamins, like vitamin C, but there are some fat-soluble vitamins, in other words, vitamins that can be absorbed in fat. How does the body transport that around to the rest of the body in terms of to get everything what is needed? The answer is it uses fat cells. So fat molecules are very important in that respect as well. Fats also help maintain cell function. Remember, we discussed uh, how the the cell membrane has fatty cells that are necessary to allow things in and out of the cell. Fats also can help us feel satisfied after eating, so perhaps we're less going to eat fewer carbs than uh, maybe we cut down on the number of carbs we eat, which could also help. There are some substances called fat blockers. One way that you can do it, I guess you can either not eat the fat at all, <laughs> or you can eat well, you can have what is called, eat what is called a fat blocker, something that blocks fat. And this is kind of a shortcut where you can eat the food that you like, but um, try to block the fat from being absorbed into the bloodstream. One example is Cheetosan, which is a non-digestible substance, mainly extracted from marine crustaceans, which means, um, you know, animals in, in that live in the ocean, things like, uh, I guess, uh, crabs and whatnot. Um, it can bind up to four to six times its weight in fat. In other words, you eat the, these tablets, and it can actually block, like by trapping this amount of fat and forcing your body to not digest it. It can also block the absorption of bile acids, which break down the fat for the body. So, um, so that that could also decrease cholesterol because the body doesn't the body isn't producing this bile which is which it needs in order to break down the fat to use for the body. I just well I just paused the video and I found an advertisement on the internet for Cheetosin, which is uh, something that this is from the vitamin shop, and you can see it only costs uh, ten dollars and twenty nine cents. Uh, you have to be 18 <laughs> years or older to order online. I guess they don't want children uh, getting into this sort of stuff. But you can see over here what they say about it. Um, it's a non-digestible dietary fiber derived from chitin and whatever this other thing is found in the shells of crabs and other shellfish. It supports glucose and fat metabolism. And, well, anyway, they 
tell you all sorts of things about it. Whatever. Anyway, um, that's one example of a product that hope, that tries to allow people to eat fat without gaining weight. There are some side effects of chitosin which uh, aren't so good. Gastrointestinal distress, flatulence, which of course we don't want, and of course people who can't eat shellfish wouldn't be able to take chitosin because chitosin is made out of shellfish. Uh, now, unfortunately, unlike these, uh, these you can. I just was looking at this little Q and A over here, and this uh, the site offering chitosin. It says, "Why did you choose this?" And uh, need to lose weight uh, helps him break down belly fat. Saw this in Oz, whatever that is. Um, I think it's a television show. Anyway, need to lose weight. Weight management helps absorb fat. Best value for the price. It works. Saw it on Dr. Oz. I guess that might be a... I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, the point is that uh, research showed, even though all those people thought it was great and, and thought it was great to lose weight, over an eight and a half week period of time, Jitosin only helped people lose an insignificant amount of weight. Not sure why that is. Maybe people figure they're taking this and so they can eat more. <laughs> and it, it only has a certain level of effectiveness. So it's not quite as uh, as wonderful as it cracked as it's cracked up to be uh, according to the research. Hypertension means high blood pressure, which is which is something that could cause uh, vascular cardiovascular disease. So you really don't want high blood pressure if you can avoid it. And it's a major chronic disease in the U.S. It can also cause damage to the kidneys, reduce brain fu brain function, and of course it can cause death, which you know is obviously something you don't want. Uh, there are two phases of blood pressure: the systolic and the diastolic. Uh, when you, your heart every second or so, approximately once a second, pumps. Go in, out, in, out, in, out. Now, obviously, when your heart is pumping, the blood pre the blood is going to flow faster because the heart pumps the blood than than in the moment that you're not pumping. So when you are pumping, that is the systolic pressure when the heart actually does pump, and then when the heart relaxes, it goes down to a diastolic pressure. So you, when your blood pressure might be 120 over 80, that means 120 systolic, that means 120 is the level of blood pressure when you are pumping, and 80 is when it is not. That's normal blood pressure under 120 over 80. Uh, under, in between 120 over 80 and 140 over 90 is considered borderline. Over 140 over 90, over 140 over 90, let's say 150 over 100, is considered hypertension, which means that your blood pressure is a little bit too high. Some causes of hypertension include things like tobacco use, age, the older you get, the higher your blood pressure generally gets, dietary factors, like eating a lot of salt, obesity, low physical activity. Now, of course, just like you need... You, you don't want to have blood pressure that's too high, you know, you also don't want to have blood pressure that's too low. Uh, if your blood pressure is 90 over 50, it means you're probably not getting enough blood around your body, and that's not good either. So you want to have it kind of in the middle, approximately, uh, let's say, you know, 110 over 70 is fine. 110 over 70 is actually very healthy. Uh, but you don't want to have it much, much, much lower than that. You don't want to have it, you know, 90 over 50 or anything like that. Okay, let's see some sample questions. Which is a symptom of low blood, pr blood pressure? Remember, low blood pressure means not enough blood might be flowing through your body. Well, it's a stroke would, if anything, be high blood pressure. A stomach ulcer has nothing to do with that. High energy, obviously, if you have less blood flowing through your body, that wouldn't apply. The only one that applies is confusion. So we're going to say the answer is B. Matthew has just been diagnosed with hypertension, high blood pressure. That's what hypertension is. Hyper means high, and tension means, well, pressure. Uh, and his physician has instructed him to reduce his sodium intake, his salt intake, which would follow, be, be good advice for Matt. Do not rinse canned corn with cold water before eating. Well, that's bad advice, because if you do rinse it, you're washing off the salt, so you're decreasing the amount of salt. Snack on fresh fruits and vegetables instead of potato chips. That's really good, because fresh fruits and vegetables have low salt, whereas potato chips have high salt. So I think B looks good. Let's see. C, eat a variety of soup with made with plenty of consomme. You will probably know what consomme is, kind of broth. Now, consomme may taste good. It's low in calories, but it does have a lot of salt. And eat canned peas instead of fresh is also a bad idea, because things that are canned tend to have higher salt. Our third type of macronutrient is 
protein. Proteins are even more crucial than carbohydrates and fats because not only do they give you energy, they also contain crucial components of body tissues. Proteins are made of amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, and there are about 20 different kinds of amino acids that are necessary. There are some that are essential amino acids, which cannot be produced from our, by our bodies and therefore have to be obtained from food. And there are nine of these essential amino acids that we need to eat from outside. The rest of them are non-essential because they can be made by our body. Amino acids uh, have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen as well. The amino group has nitrogen and hydrogen over here and there are different types of amino acids and over here over you have a list of the essential amino acids and the non-essential. The ones on the right can be made by the body, the ones on the left cannot be, so you need to eat these things. Now of course we expect you to memorize all of these and if we ask you, you know, which of the following four our acids are considered non-essential, and we say glutamine, thi thi whatever, valine. Of course, I'm kidding. You don't, <laughs> you don't need to remember these, so don't worry. I'll, you know, pick your head off the uh, off, off the ceiling <laughs> or what, or wherever you went when I said that. You don't have to memorize that. Just remember that there are essential amino acids that we need, and essential and non-essential that we can make ourselves. And that, of course, is why you want to eat a variety of different types of protein. Some proteins might have this one. Some proteins might have that one. Some proteins of that one. So if you only eat tuna fish all day, you'll get a lot of protein, but you may not be getting all the amino acids. On the other hand, if you have tuna fish and you have um, you know, eggs and you have milk and you have meat and you have fish, well then, well, tuna fish is fish, but you'll probably be getting a nice good combination of amino acids, which is good. Protein synthesis is when the body makes proteins. The DNA, the, the material which is stands for something called deoxyribonucleic acid, uh, which are made from amino acids, so um, the proteins certainly are comprised a component of DNA as well. They are the blueprint for the cell, and they de determine the structure of the protein molecules for the body. Then, again, this is really more of a biology issue. We're not going to focus on this too much. But basically, you've got DNA in the cell, in the nucleus of the cell itself, and something called RNA, ribonucleic acid, mRNA stands for messenger ribonucleic acid, carries the message to the rest of the parts of the cell, including the ribosomes. The ribosomes make the proteins for the rest of the cell. So essentially, that's how the DNA gets its message out to the rest of the cell. Hey, create this. Hey, create that. A protein's shape determines its function. And the reason for that is, essentially, is that enzymes, which are the materials in the body that actually cause things to happen, most more often than not, are based on what's called a lock and key model. Here's an example of an enzyme with a substrate. Enzy this is an enzyme, and this is a substrate, which means something that the enzyme is locking onto, or something that's, that's working on. So the the idea here is that you can see the shape is key because if this enzyme is this shape, it can work on a substrate of that shape. If they were a different shape and they didn't fit, well then the enzyme couldn't work on it. So obviously you do not want to have a situation where the enzymes, where the proteins, get all get all bent out of shape. Yuck yuck. And that is a process called denaturation. Denaturation is a chemical process that causes protein to lose its shape, which could happen when it's too hot. When there are acids and bases, heavy metals, alcohol, these are all things that could be negative. Now the body can recover from it. I mean, it doesn't mean if you have one particular energy that if you have one particular enzyme uh, event that doesn't happen, it doesn't mean that you're going to get sick or anything. But obviously, the body wants to try to avoid having this happen too often. There are many ways we can get proteins in our diet. We can get them from dairy products like cheese, milk, yogurt. Uh, we can get them from meat products, poultry, chicken, meat, fish, soy products. You know, vegetarians need to get their protein also. You know, they don't get it from vegetarians or even vegans don't get don't eat meat or some of them don't even eat milk or cheese or anything or eggs, any kind of animal products. Well, they can get it from soy products like tofu. Beans is another example of vegetarian source that you can get proteins from as well. All of these products contain a significant amount of protein. And this chart is, again, something that 
illustrates the point that we were discussing before that in different you want different types of proteins in your diet because you want to combine to make sure that the that the, the diet has everything it needs so legumes for example which have some uh, amino acids like beans things like that if you add them to nuts and seeds which have different types of types of protein and well again long story short all this means is that you should try to have multiple different types of protein in your diet to make sure that you get all the aspects all the elements of the various types of protein molecules in order to survive and thrive why do we need proteins well there are many reasons why we need proteins Number one, to help the cell grow, repair, and maintain the cell. Enzymes, as we discussed before, do pretty much everything for the body, and those are made of proteins. Hormones. Uh, those are secretions that the body makes that help take care of various tasks for the body. Those are made of proteins as well. Fluid and electrolyte balance. Well, these are things that are really necessary for proteins. Electrolytes are like salts and um, chemicals in the body that allow things to be transported, allow, uh, um, pro so proteins, act I'm sorry, proteins transport electrolytes in and out of the cells. There are different types of salts that the body needs are important, and proteins allow those things to be moved in and out of the cell. As we discussed earlier in the course, remember the uh, the lipids in the cell membranes that allows the, allow things in and out? Well, the, li the lipids comprise the cell membranes, but the proteins are the things that actually open and shut the cell to allow things in and out pH balance, which means acidity, or basic. Basically, uh, the pH scale is from 0 to 14, with 0 being a very strong acid, 14 being a very strong base, and the body generally likes to be around a 7, right? Likes to be smack dab in the middle. Well, proteins can act as buffers between acids and bases so that they don't uh, cause all sorts of nasty chemical reactions. Also, antibodies, which are made from proteins, protect against diseases. They're a type of protein that fights off infections in the bloodstream. And, of course, also, proteins can be used at 4 calories per gram, or 4 kilocalories per gram, as an energy source for the body. And because of all the different ways that proteins are so vital to the body, it's important to conserve proteins for their vital functions, not to provide energy. In other words, if all the protein you ate had to be used specifically for energy, well then the body would not be able to use the amino acids for the various other functions that are necessary. And one way you could do that is by eating an adequate amount of carbohydrate and fat, which is really the main source of energy, so that the proteins can be allowed to be used for what they need to be used for. How do proteins break down? That's our next thing. Well, unlike carbohydrates, which actually get chemically digested by the saliva in your mouth, proteins do not. Proteins first get broken down in the stomach. And the stomach by HCl, hydrochloric acid, which as we discussed earlier is a component of the gastric juice that is in your stomach, First of all, it denatures the protein, which or denatures the protein, whatever it is, which means break it down and change its shape so that it can be acted on by the body. It breaks down the peptide bonds. Peptide bonds are the types of bonds that occur in protein. And they convert inactive enzyme pepsinogen into an active form of pepsin, which break down the proteins into amino acids and short protein chains called polypeptides. I know you got a lot of hard vocabulary words over here, but long story short, the hydrochloric acid breaks down the protein into things that are necessary that the body needs, and protein bonds are called peptide bonds, and so therefore many bonds of many proteins molecules that are bonded together are called polypeptides. It's also very important to keep a, a balance in the nitrogen the amount of nitrogen that we have in our body. Now remember, nitrogen doesn't come from any of the other sources. Fats generally have carb of carbons and hydrogens. Uh, sugars and starches have carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. Uh, nitrogen, which is a necessary component for the body, only come from protein of all the nutrients that we eat. So we want to make sure to keep a good nitrogen balance. Too much or too little is not healthy. So if you have a positive nitrogen, balance, which is sometimes found in pregnant women, people during periods of growth, or when their bodies are undergoing tissue repair, when the body's producing more proteins, proteins are doing more things uh, that are necessary for the body. 
Again, it's not necessarily a terrible thing, uh, but that's called a positive nitrogen balance where you have more than you need. All right, let's take a look now at really the second half of the discussion of proteins, and that is the discussion of meat versus no meat. The textbook plays a lot of, uh, discusses this a lot, and here's really the question. The question is, is it better to eat, get your proteins from meat, or is it, get, is it better to avoid meat? Now, let's take a look at some of the pros and cons of eating meat. Well, first of all, it tastes good. <laughs> that's, you're not going to see that over here in the, um, in the, uh, on the slide, but that's, I guess, the first pro. Most, most people, if you ask them, why do you eat meat, the first thing they'll say is because it tastes good, or at least it can taste good, depending on how, it, how it, is, it is prepared. But the negative of meat, first of all, there are some health benefits, and second of all, there are some environmental, uh, some, I'm sorry, some health uh, risks associated with eating meat, and then there are also some environmental risks that are associated with eating meat. Let's take a look at the cons first, because the pros kind of answer the cons on this slide. Livestock production causes more greenhouse gas emissions than traffic. Then one bizarre reason is that cows tend cow flatulence uh, has methane in it, and methane is a greenhouse gas that's even more potent than carbon dioxide. So. If you haven't taken Earth science and you don't know what that means, basically that for purposes of global warming, purposes of putting more uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and causing climate change, methane is even worse than carbon dioxide, and cow flatulence has a lot of methane in it. So, And also livestock production and land deg degradation. When livestock are raised, then they have to eat grass, and the grass gets destroyed, and the, the land gets ravaged. Also deforestation. Of former forests for grazing. If big, if there are big farms, the cows have to graze somewhere. And one place they graze is well, the people cut down trees and make grazing fields for their cows, which could harm the environment by taking out the forest. Some counter arguments to that include that only 2.5 percent of methane production comes from cattle, so. It's not that big a deal. Less than 1% of the total 2001 U.S. beef supply was imported from countries with rainforests, and la large fast food chains don't go there. So in other words, it's not such a big deal in terms of rainforests, because we don't get our meat from countries that have rainforests anyway. Uh, some other examples, again, these are all essentially environmental issues. Uh, pr um, production of feed crops uses 33% of the global arable land, which means 33% of all the possible farmland in the world is used to grow crops to feed animals. Livestock production has produced reduced biodiversity, in other words, by ravaging areas and destroying whatever life is in these areas in order to make them grazing fields. And it takes a lot of water to produce a little meat, 430 gallons of water for produce every one pound of meat, whereas only 151 to produce a pound of wheat. And what this is really saying, essentially, is that it costs a lot of ground produce to feed cows to feed humans. You know, for example, if you say, well, wouldn't it take more wheat to, for us? To, if we ate wheat, wouldn't that decrease wheat supply? The answer is no, because if we ate meat, ate wheat and instead of meat, then a lot less wheat would have to be grown to feed the cows. It takes a lot more wheat to, or corn or whatever cows eat. <laughs> That's probably chickens. What, uh, grass, hay, whatever. It takes a lot more material to feed a cow that feeds a human than it does to feed the human being directly. But again, if you look at it the other way, the counter-arguments, livestock production accounts for only 11% of the water used in the U.S. People can reduce their meat consumption, which would allow for family farming. In other words, if you didn't have it in huge farms that had to deforest areas and build these huge grazing areas, it would be a little bit more efficient. However, and and it doesn't even mention that here, but the uh, the main another reason why people very sometimes don't eat meat is because meat can be high in fat, meat can be high in cholesterol, and in general they could cause health problems. So there are some people that have become vegetarians or vegans. Vegetarians are people who restrict their diet to food substances from plant origin. They don't eat meat, although very often vegetarians will eat maybe milk, maybe eggs, and again, it does kind of depend, vary from person to person. Vegans are like super duper vegetarians, vegeta vegetarians on steroids. These are people who don't produce any animal products, including milk, eggs, 
butter, mur nothing. They don't produce any um, animal substances at all. Here are some examples of vegetarian diets. There's semi-vegetarian diets, which uh, they eat chicken but or poultry, eggs, and dairy products, but won't eat red meat, which is not really so vegetarian, but that's because it's close enough. Um, peso ve pesco vegetarian, which excludes poultry. In other words, they don't eat meat or chicken, but they do eat milk, cheese, eggs. Uh, then there's lacto ovo vegetarian which excludes all animal flesh and fish, no animals or fish. Lacto-vegetarian, which also excludes eggs. Ovo-vegetarian, which also excludes dairy, meat, and seafood. Vegan, which doesn't do anything, it doesn't, doesn't eat anything from any animal. The macrobiotic diet, I actually know somebody who's on a macrobiotic diet, seems pretty brutal. <laughs> I think I'd rather die than go on, no, I'm kidding. Okay, anyway, uh, macrobiotic is a vegan-type diet and they <laughs> and more strict until almost all foods are eliminated only brown at the end only brown rice and a small amount of water or herbal tea is consumed <laughs> sounds a little crazy to me but listen people do it i guess they you know for people who are allergic to things or people who are trying to lose weight sometimes they go on this macrobiotic diet and if they don't go mentally insane then uh, they'll be very healthy then there's the fruititarian diet. <laughs> Love these names. Only raw or dried fruit, nuts, honey, vegetable oil. It's very restrictive, and you can see over here that some of these diets can cause decreases in vitamins and minerals because a lot of these foods over here contain vitamins and minerals that people need. The challenges of veg vegetarians, well, first of all, they, they have to get their amino acids from other places. So remember, if you're not going to eat meat, you're not going to eat milk or cheese, or especially a vegan, you're not going to eat eggs, well, we're, you, know, you might not get the proper combination of amino acids. So you got to make sure to eat many, maybe, maybe if you don't, if you're a vegetarian, so maybe you can have nuts and um, uh, beans and you know, soy, tofu, maybe have many different kinds of vegan uh, diet um, uh, protein, and maybe you can get a good good enough mix of amino acids that way. Uh, vegetarian diets can be low in some vitamins, like iron, calcium, zinc, vitamins D and B. Remember, calcium comes from milk and cheese products, so if you skip those, you might have trouble getting calcium. So vegetarians should plan for a balanced and adequate diet. Soy products are an excellent source of protein, and vegetarians should include some complementary proteins. Here's an example of a vegetarian food diet. Uh, daily physical activity, which is recommended for everyone. At every meal, it would be the best, uh, the best way to do it would be to have legumes and beans, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, and then some fats for egg whites, I guess if you do eat eggs, soy milk, which is milk from soy, it's not really milk, I don't know why they call it soy milk because it looks like milk, but whatever, uh, plant oils, nuts and seeds, and some eggs and sweets kind of sparingly, uh, six glasses of water a day, which is recommended for every, everyone, and alcohol only in moderation. And now let's look at our end of chapter multiple choice questions to achieve maximum benefits a diverse group of amino acids, which would be the best one to eat? A, broccoli with potatoes and tomato sauce. Well, it doesn't have any protein in it. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's good food. I mean, it has two different types of vegetables in there. That's fantastic, but you don't have any protein in there at all. Broccoli, potatoes, and tomato sauce have nothing. Apples and oranges, again, they're fruits. They're good for you, but they don't have any protein at all. Jelly and whole wheat bread, again, no protein there. Jelly is sugars, and whole wheat bread is starches. Chicken with soybeans on the side. Well, now you got two different types of proteins. you got soy protein from there, and you have chicken protein from there, so we're going to put a D in as the answer. Which of the following is true? A, HCL, remember this is hydrochloric acid, that is in uh, stomach gastric juice, inhibits the digestion of, uh, we don't want, inhibits means stops. I mean, right away I can see that's ridiculous, because HCL helps the digestion of fat, it doesn't inhibit it. Uh, HCL twists the strands of proteins and builds the peptide bonds? No, 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 no. It, maybe it destroys them uh, or it bends them out of shape. It doesn't build them. C, HCL denatures or den denatures, which means twisting protein to allow digestive enzymes to break down the protein. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds about right. Remember, the stomach juice breaks down the proteins. And D, which we know is wrong because C is right, HCL converts pepsin into pepsinogen, which is not that an enzyme would do that. It's not something that hydrochloric acid would do. So those are the questions for this chapter. 
Chapter 7 is about another very important material that we eat, but it's not necessarily a nutrient. It is fluid and electrolyte balance. Now, fluid itself, like water, is obviously necessary for survival, even though it doesn't give us any energy. And electrolytes are also necessary for our body's functioning, as we will discuss. Fluid, first of all, what is a fluid? A fluid is essentially a liquid. Well, there are some types of solids that are also considered fluids, but by and large, fluids are liquids that have free-moving particles, and they have the ability to conform to the shape of the container that holds them, and there are different types of fluids in our body, mostly water, also blood, some other secretions, things like that. There are also so there are also fluids that are in our, not necessarily in the bloodstream, but within the cells and outside the cells. And those are tissue fluid that are between the cells. Remember we discussed earlier that cells make up tissues, and the tissues themselves are swimming around in this fluid, which, which is also, of course, made substantially of water. And even within the cell, you have water, that's the, in the cytoplasm, and the blood itself flows because it has water in the form of plasma, which is a fluid portion of the blood that carries the cells. Blood is actually made of red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, which allow clotting, and of course the plasma, which causes it to have a fluid texture. The purpose of a fluid, well, water is the main component of the fluid because water is the universal solvent, which means all types of molecules, or most types of molecules, I should, I should say, will break down in it. These include things like ions, which we'll discuss a little bit later on, are in elect or, or caused generated by electrolytes, carbohydrates, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, etc. The blood volume, namely the amount of fluid in the blood, is of course something that's very important. Increased blood volume, too much blood volume, too much blood in the body, can cause blood pressure to rise because there's more blood being pushed around. Decreased blood, decreased blood volume can cause low blood pressure. Common sense. The less there is, the less force, the less momentum it's going to pick up, pick up as it's pushed. Fluids also help maintain body temperature. Fluids tend to cool things off and warm things up. And the reason is because water has a very high specific heat, has a very high heat capacity, which means it has a very strong ability to absorb heat. And therefore, if something, water can cool things down quickly if they're very hot, can warm things up quickly if they're cool, and we use in water in our bodies to regulate blood temperature. Sweating also releases heat as the evaporation from the water, from, if, of the water from the skin, cools the skin and blood, and fluids protect and lubricate body tissues. Regarding sweat, you may notice that if you walk in on a hot day, if you splash water in your face, even if the water is warm water, if you walk in and you're really hot and you splash warm water in your face, you'll still cool off. And the reason is because when you have warm water touching a warm surface, the hottest molecules of the water immediately evaporate and become water vapor and float off in the air, leaving the cool molecules behind, and that's why water tends to cool things. It's important, of course, to maintain fluid balance to make sure that we have an appropriate amount of fluid in our body. The thirst mechanism occurs from a cluster of nerve cells that stimulate our desire to drink. It's also it's important to make sure that even you, sometimes you need to drink even when you're not thirsty, but generally speaking, when you're th when you'll know when you have to drink because you're thirsty. If you live in a very dry climate like Phoenix or something, they say that you should drink a lot if you're going to be outside, even if you're not thirsty. Water can be gained by beverages or even food with water in it, or certain types of metabolic reactions, certain types of processes that your body does actually produces, produces water. Percentage of body water decreases either because a person weighs too much, then a less of a percentage of his or her body is fluid, and also age. As a person ages, he or she tends to decrease the amount of body fluid. Once water is lost, for whatever reason, because of sweat, because the person isn't drinking, because of vomiting, whatever, it's important to replace it. Water is lost through urine. That's how most water is lost. When you go to the bathroom, you obviously lose water. It's common sense. And the reason is because the kidneys function by filtering out the bloodstream, and it needs water in order to do that. It filters out the bloodstream, takes care of whatever needs to be gotten rid of by the body, and gets rid of it in the form of water. Excess water is, uh, excuse me, water is reabsorbed 
back into the bloodstream as needed, and the excess water, the water that the body doesn't need, is excreted by the body as urine. Also diuretics increase fluid loss via the urine as well. A diuretic simply means any substance that tends to cause people to go to the bathroom more. Sweat is another example of how we get rid of water. Again, common sense. If we sweat, which is water, the water evaporates. Exhalation. When we breathe out, we breathe out water vapor from our body. It doesn't seem like much, but you're breathing out all day long. And even if you only get a few molecules of water out each breath, that's still a lot of breaths. And feces, even though most of our feces is pretty dry because we reabsorb the water, still there needs to be some water in the feces, and especially if somebody has diarrhea where the feces are much more wet. Problems with fluid levels are very often a cause. Dehydration. Dehydration is when a person does not have enough water. An imbalance in fluid will cause irregular heart beats, and the problem is that the fluid will leave the cell causing a fluid imbalance. In other words, if the body needs more water for its metabolic functions but doesn't have enough water, it may have to draw the water from the individual cells, causing the cells to not have enough water, and you have a big problem. Uh, low blood pressure is a, a sim symptom of not having enough blood, which usually is because there isn't enough water to generate enough blood, and the symptoms of low, low blood pressure, lethargy, which means being tired, confusion, dizziness, these are all things that also are indicative of less energy, and low blood pressure, which is also caused, also similar to dehydration, can cause these things, being tired, dizzy, or confused. Electrolytes, the other element of this chapter, means salts that are absorbed in water. They're necessary for hydration and neuromuscular function. Essentially, these electrolytes, which are really ions that come from salt molecules, ions are molecules with a charge, and the salt is a neutral charge. When a salt breaks down, the combination that caused the salt to form in the first place break apart and become charged particles called ions. We're not going to get into the chemistry too much, but just realize that electrolyte, that's, those are really what electrolytes are, and they're necessary for the body. Water follows the movement of electrolytes by moving by osmosis from concentration where from areas where the concentration is high. In other words, when the cell needs water, the cell the body excuse me, water concentration moves from areas where their concentration is high to areas where the concentration is low. Sorry, the opposite. It moves from areas where the concentration is low of electrolytes to where it's high. So in other words, if the, you have a cell and inside the cell is too salty, it has too many of these salts, well, then water naturally moves into the body, which of course is very important because that's really necessary to keep the water level keep the water balance, level balanced between inside the cell and outside the cell to make sure the water flows to where it's needed. That's one reason why electrolytes are needed. We'll see other reasons as well. Uh, another thing is that it helps move brain messages throughout the body. And there are many different types of electrolytes. They all come in salt form. Sodium, potassium, chloride, and phosphorus are all elements, actually. But they all, the way we get them is by eating salts that contain sodium. We're not going to eat pure sodium, which is a very uh, flammable metal. Instead, we eat sodium chloride, which is table salt, uh, or various other types of salts. Uh, electrolytes, well, this is an example, actually, of the osmosis. If you have an area where you have an A and B both have water and then you pour water you pour salt into this into this side into the right side then more of the water is going to be drawn to there uh, you may know that the way people the way they the way they get the blood out of chickens once the chickens are killed is they salt the chickens drawing the blood out because salt draws water to it so if the cell has electrolytes in it the water is drawn into it and that's one way in which cells absorb water Okay, electrolytes include sodium, which is associated with blood pressure and bal acidity balance in the body. Actually, high sodium gives you blood pressure that's too high, but that's really our major problem is that we eat too much sodium, not too little sodium, but, you know, too little sodium would also be a problem. Processed foods are generally high in sodium, but too mu and too much sodium causes high blood pressure, edema, high blood volume, all these similar things, and they can cause problems such as heart failure and kidney disease. Too little sodium 
maybe people who sweat a lot and haven't been drinking uh, thing, haven't been eating or drinking things with salt in it, like marathon athletes who consume too much water but not enough salt in the water. You know, they don't eat food with salt in it. And this causes vomiting, diarrhea, sweating, not a very good thing. And we'll see in a few moments how you go about replacing those electrolytes. Another example of electrolytes uh, is potassium, which is very important in muscle contractions and transmission of nerve impulses. They can maintain a lower blood pressure, help maintain acid-base balance, and etc. Potassium is, of course, important to have, like many other electrolytes. Too much potassium is not good. It could result in a heart attack, but not enough potassium is also not good. Hypokalemia, it's called. The reason why it's called that, by the way, is because calium in la was the Latin for potassium. If you look at a periodic table, the letter for potassium is K, because originally it was called calium. I don't know how it became potassium, but the point is hypokalemia. Hypo means too low. Hyper, by the way, means too high. Hypo means too low. So hypokalemia means your blood, your potassium levels are too low. And it can be seen in patients with kidney disease or diabetic acidosis. So, of course, if you see something that if you, if somebody has hypokalemia, uh, kalemia, what you want to try to do is get them food with more potassium. Chlori, chlor, chloride, which comes from, which of course comes from the element of chlorine, is also important. It assists in maintaining fluid balance, immune system. It's also remember there's um, hydrochloric acid that's part of the gastric juice in the stomach, that's necessary for digestion. And so you need some chlorine in your body as well. How do we get our chlorine? We see, get it from table salt. Regular plain old table salt is sodium chloride. So if we eat table salt, we get both sodium and chlorine. Of course, too much of that is not good. Then you have phosphorus. Phosphorus is a major intracellular negatively charged par particle also an element on the periodic table. It's important for fluid balance, bone formation, regulating pathways throughout the body, and of course you need in ATP, which is uh, something that is used in the process of respiration, which is energy production, DNA, RNA, etc. How do you get phosphorus? Well, usually in foods that contain a lot of protein, meat, milk, eggs, etc. But as usual, too much is also not good. High blood levels of phosphorus can occur with kidney disease or with taking too many vitamin D supplements, and you can see all the bad things it can cause. Muscle spasms, convulsions, not good. Sodium levels, we discussed before that sodium is necessary, and sodium chloride, salt, is necessary to some extent, but you don't want to have too much of it. And the reason is, well, because that can cause other problems. How do you avoid sodium? Well, first of all, pickled foods have a lot of sodium, like pickles, for example, have a lot of salt, as we, as you know if you've tasted them. Canned foods very often have salt as a preservative, and they have salt because they want it to taste better, and so they have a lot of sodium. Fresh fruit and vegetables tend to have a low sodium content. Too much sodium in the body can cause high blood pressure or hypertension. Someone with hypertension should make sure to eat foods with no sodium or low sodium, like snacking on fresh carrots instead of a bag of potato chips. I think we actually had the multiple choice at the end of last chapter, which had some questions that probably should have been in this chapter, so I do apologize for that. Um, well, anyway, maybe that was a couple of chapters ago. That was the pre for the previous chapter. All right, so next I wanted to briefly discuss sports drinks. Now, sports drinks, things like Gatorade, Powerade, things like that, are sometimes known as salt bev uh, sports beverages because they have electrolytes. They have salt. The difference between that and regular plain old lemonade or soda or, you know, orange drink or something, is that both of them have sugar and both of them have water. The difference is is they have uh, is that they have salt in them to replenish electrolytes. And they're called sports drinks because athletes who sweat a lot may need to replenish their electrolytes. Uh, they'll give, tell you a quick story about how this was invented. Back in the, in, in, I guess in the 70s or 80s or whatever it was, maybe earlier, uh, uh, college football and other athletic coaches realized that they're that their athletes were wearing down late in the game because they were getting very tired. And so they used to feed them a lot of water and sugar drinks for energy. 
And they realized that wasn't working. And one person, the trainer of the University of Florida, uh, thought that, well, maybe it's not that they're missing their water or sugar. Maybe it's that they're missing the electrolytes in their body, missing, mixing their, missing their salts that are also necessary for the body to produce energy or to use energy, excuse me. And so what he did was he took some water and put some electrolytes, probably tasted terrible, some, some table salt and some different types of salt with potassium and, and chlorine and sodium and all these other things, phosphorus, and he gave it to his players and probably tasted horrible, but it worked. His players became less tired in the fourth quarter, and uh, I guess they did well. And so then he decided he was going to market it and to the pub to the general public and the general public wasn't going to eat disgustingly tasting salt water so instead he also put sugar in it to make it taste a little better and because the university of florida's nickname are the gators he called it gator aid and that's why how we have gator aid and now you know the rest of the story anyway so these things are very important for athletes because when you sweat you lose the both fluid and electrolytes to prevent dehydration athletes who and those who vigorously exercise can drink sports beverages Beverages. Now, if you're a regular couch potato, you don't need sports beverages. So you might like to sit around, you know, watching the football game, eating, or drinking Powerade, or just you don't really have to because you don't need get new electrolytes if you didn't spend your electrolytes uh, sweating them out. So really what they are is they're really not so good because if you don't need them, then you're just having extra salt for really no good reason at all. Uh, soft drinks are drinks that have sugars or other sweeteners, and they don't really have any health benefits like Coke and Pepsi. And if you have Powerade or something, you have sugar and water and salts, which really don't help you very much unless you really need them. All right. Oops. Let's hope you didn't see the answers to these questions. These are our end of choice, multiple cho uh, end of chapter, multiple choice for cha excuse me, chapter seven. On average, which of the following individuals would have the highest percentage of body order? 70-year-old lean man, 40-year-old overweight man, 70-year-old overweight, or 40-year-old lean? Well, remember we discussed age and obesity both decrease um, percentage of body water. So the 40-year-old will have more than the 70-year-old, and the lean person will have more than the obese person, and therefore the answer is D. Number, uh, many substances molecules will break down in water because water contains bonds that are uh, covalent and ionic. It was not true. Water only has covalent bonds. Is in a liquid at a state of room temperature, but that has nothing to do with breaking down. Has a high specific heat. heat that's also true, but has nothing to do with breaking down materials. But it is a universal solvent. That is what water is, and therefore the answer is D. The next chapter, chapter 8, continues on a theme of nutrients that are not energy producing. And those are antioxidants. And first we're going to go back over a little bit of chemistry because those are going to be necessary for our discussion of antioxidants. And then we will look at some other materials that are relevant to this chapter. If you recall, atoms were the smallest unit of matter. They were composed of the nucleus, which had protons and neutrons in the middle. Those were positively charged. The protons, the neutrons were neutrally charged, and the electrons kind of floated around the end. And the reason why that's important is because reactions are based on either oxidation reactions or reduction reactions. Reactions in general are both kinds, are really those are the two types, two of the types of chemical reactions. Oxidation is when a molecule becomes positively charged, whereas reduction is when it becomes negatively charged. Reduction, reduce, you can think of it as reduces the charge. Molecules are composed of two or more atoms, and reactions very often occur because electrons are transferred from one to the other. Just to give you an example, remember sodium chloride that we discussed, that salt? That's because sodium loses an electron and chlorine gains an electron. And kind of these, one of the sodium's electron gets captured by the, uh, by the chlorine's electron, and that kind of they, that's how they kind of hold on to each other. It's called an ionic bond, and it's a very strong type of bond because the chlorine really wants to hold on to that electron. Electron. And the reasons for it have to do with the, the numbers of electron mo uh, electrons on each level. We're not going to worry about that so much. But the point is, that's what an oxidation reaction is. They occur, well, really, they occur together. In that case, the oxidation, which is the loss of an electron, is what the sodium does. And the reduction, which is gaining an electron, is what the chlorine does. Well, here's an example. 
<coughs> hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide react. Now hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, well hydrochloric acid has chlorine in it, sodium hydroxide has um, has sodium in it. Now they've got other things in it. They both have hydrogen in it. There's an oxygen floating around in there in the, in the sodium hydroxide. But the reason why it happens this way when regular salt is formed is because regular chlorine and regular sodium just wouldn't react to each other. Chlorine is a, ga is a gas and sodium is a metal. They just wouldn't react with each other. But if, they, if there's a sodium in a sodium hydroxide for a solution and chlorine in a hydrochloric acid solution, there they can react when they're poured together. So the chlorine from the hydrochloric acid reacts from the sodium with the sodium from the sodium hydroxide. The sodium loses an atom and the chlorine gains, I'm sorry, loses an electron and the chlorine gains an electron, which is oxidation and the other way, the chlorine gaining an electron and the sodium losing the electron, it's opposite sides of the same coin, it's a reduction reaction, that's why sometimes they call it a redox reaction, redox standing for reduction, oxidation, one is reducing, the other is oxidation, when you have a redox reaction, when you have a reduction and oxidation reaction, in the end what you get is something that's neutral, because one gained, the other lost, overall it's neutral, and you've got a you've got usually now what might be a salt, which for example would be sodium chloride or various other types of salts. Here's an example, you have two of them. Oxidation is when you lose an electron and reduction is when you gain the electron. Of course, gaining an electron means reducing your charge because an electron is a negative charge. So the, in sodium chloride, the sodium would be a negative one charge, whereas the chlorine would be a positive one charge. And that brings us to something called free radicals. A stable atom, which is not a free radical, contains an even number of paired electrons. If you see this diagram, for example, a normal oxygen, electrons like to be in pairs. Electrons always have either zero or two on a level. Level of electrons is what's called an orbital uh, in chemistry, but you can see on the oxygen there are eight electrons altogether because oxygen's uh, Atomic number is 8, which means there are 8 protons and 8 electrons. So you can see there's 2 over here, 2 over here, 2 over here, and 2 over here. On the other hand, if an oxygen gains an electron, now you've got 9, and the ninth one is all by itself. And that's what you, you have a free radical. Now, a free radical, as you can imagine, is something that is very, very reactive. It wants to do something. They, I know, obviously, electrons don't have personalities, but think of an electron with a free radical, with an extra, ele excuse me, a level with only one electron in it as something that really, really, really wants to react. It either wants to get rid of its one electron on this level, or it wants to get another electron to get kind of twin. Electron are twins. They like to be two at a time. They like to have the buddy system. So if you have one that's sitting there all by its lonesome over here, oxygen will want to react with someone, either to give up its electron or over here, or to gain another electron, and to have 10 altogether and 2 on that level over here. So a free radical is an atom that's lost an electron, actually theoretically it could also be gained an electron, and is with an unpaired electron. It's highly reactive and it can cause damage to other molecules in the area, which is not good. So exposure to certain substances increases free radical production. Things like pollution, ultraviolet light, radiation, toxic substances, and in fact, many free radicals are formed as by healthy metabolism, which of course the body wants to get rid of as soon as possible. Many diseases are linked to these free radicals, including cancer, heart disease, diabetes, arthritis. I mean, you could just look at, look at this list over here. It's a pretty incredible list of of problematic situations that could be caused at least partially by free radicals. And for the rest of the chapter, we're going to be looking at vitamins and then certain diseases. Now we've briefly discussed vitamins earlier in the course, but now we're going to go into a, in, them in a little bit more depth, and specifically we're going to look at vitamin E. Vitamin E, which is a fat solute vitamin, remember one of those things that absorbs in fat, and also the sort of thing that you don't want too much of, uh, it's made from different uh, materials, whatever, it makes no difference. The point is the function of vitamin E, which is important, number one, it's an antioxidant, 
which means that it stops the oxidation of other molecules. You know, you hear that term all the time, antioxidants. They say, you know, red wines, grapes, certain other materials are antioxidants. Why is that good? Well, the reason why it's good is because it prevents oxidation reactions. Now, oxidation reactions are reactions involving, uh, not always involving oxygen, but very often involving oxygen, that very often cause an electron to be by itself. It causes that free radical state. Remember, we saw before free radicals are no good, and oxidation reactions can cause free radicals. Antioxidants, which prevent oxidation reactions, tend to help people because it decreases the number of free radicals that are floating around causing all these horrible diseases uh, that we discussed a few moments ago. It also protects unsaturated, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which we need, and low density types of proteins, lipoproteins, which are fat protein combinations. And so vitamin E, of course, is very important for us. Where can you get it? You can get it in vegetable oils, nuts, seeds, wheat germ, and soybean. soybeans. Not consuming enough vitamin E is a problem and can result in fragile red blood cells and various other issues. Sorry, I just paused it to take my vitamin D pills. <laughs> it just was reminding me that I hadn't taken mine today. Anyway, uh, what are some of the problems with consuming too much vitamin E? Number one, it can interfere with anticoagulant medications. Anticoagulant medications are things that try to prevent blood from coagulating, which means clotting. Uh, if, the, if the blood clots while it's still in your body, that's really bad. But on the other hand, if it leaves your body, like if you're bleeding, you do want it to clot. You do want it to coagulate. You do want it to, you know, become all sticky and gooey and stop everything from behind it. So therefore, taking too much vitamin E can cause uncontrollable bleeding, because if you're going to prevent the blood from clotting, then you're going to prevent the blood from stopping as well. It could also, it, some studies also suggest links to certain vascular diseases and common side effects of too much vitamin E include nausea and, di nausea and diarrhea, which you don't want. Vitamin C is also an important vitamin, and it's water solute, which means it dissolves in water, and too much of it is not a big deal, it's not a problem. Uh, what does vitamin D, what does vitamin C do? Well, a lot of stuff. It functions as an antioxidant. It helps produce collagen, which is a protein required in all connective tissues in the body. It prevents the scurvy disease which causes all sorts of skin deformities. I found this picture over here of somebody with scurvy in their gums. Look at the, you can see over here, these gums aren't too healthy. Uh, that's just an example of, uh, <laughs> of of what happens with scurvy. Scurvy is actually a disease that they, uh, that very often was associated with people who are on the seas a lot, who are on the, and, and the reason, one of the reasons why is because people who are on the seas a lot didn't eat a lot of citrus fruits, and uh, citrus fruits have vitamin C, and vitamin C prevents scurvy. Whenever you see vitamin C and scurvy, remember that. Vitamin C prevents scurvy. Without vitamin C, you could get a lot of scurvy. So just, you know, remember that. That's a question that comes up a lot on these sorts of tests. Um, it enhances the immune system, so vitamin C is good for your immune system. They say sometimes if you have a cold, people take uh, vitamin C pills to prevent colds. Whether they work or not is not 100% clear, but people do that. What? How can you get? Uh, it also enhances the uh, absorption of iron. How can you get vitamin C? Fresh fruits and vegetables, citrus fruits. Heat destroys vitamin C, and so therefore cooking your fruits and vegetables lowers their vitamin C content. Uh, what are some problems with vitamin C? Well, first of all, not consuming enough. The problems are scurvy, which is not a good thing. And this can occur, a kiss can occur after a month on a diet with, without enough vitamin C. Too much vitamin C can cause nausea, diarrhea, nosebleeds, and abdominal cramps, and even iron toxicity in some people, and can lead to kidney stone formation. So I guess you don't want to consume too much vitamin C. Not as bad as vitamin A. Too much vitamin A, which can cause, like, you know, death, but still, I guess you don't want to really too, too much vitamin C. Uh, some good reasons for a vitamin C, having a vitamin C diet. First of all, some people have low iron levels and need vitamin C to help them with their iron absorption. Some people are at risk to scurvy, like people who don't have access to citrus fruits. Some people have weak immune systems, and vitamin C strengthens the immune systems. Some people want to reduce their common cold duration, and some, some people think that taking vitamin C helps with that. And generally, some people are vitamin C deficient. These are all just kind of a review of what we discussed. Next type of nutrient we have are the carotenoid. 
the fat, which is a fat sol solube, again absorbs in fat, plant pigment that the body stores in the liver, uh, so, and they, it's important because it enhances the immune system, protects the skin from damage and from ultraviolet rays, and it protects the eyes from damage. And one of the ways we get uh, cart carotid Keratin, carotenoids is from beta carotene that you may have seen a lot in terms of commercials oh you know eat this this is a great source of beta carotene and it is a provitamin it is converted once it gets into the body into a form of the vitamin it's an antioxidant and it prevents oxidation well that's really kind of the same thing okay what, how do you get beta carotene? Fruits and vegetables that are red, orange, yellow, and deep green. I guess peppers. <laughs> peppers are all of those things, I guess, in, in one form or another. On the other hand, uh, turn, eating too much beta carotene, I, mean, I guess uh, you see you can't eat too many peppers, uh, skin may turn yellow or orange at high intakes. Not that big a deal. So you don't have to worry about eating too much beta carotene. All right, now we start getting into diseases. And there are two diseases that are covered in this chapter. The first is cancer. Now what cancer is not actually a virus or bacteria that comes from outside of the body and invades. What a cancer is, is a cell, cells that are running wild, that are growing wild. All cells have to grow normally by a process called mitosis. You may remember that which is where the cells split and become multiple cells. Well, cancer is when the cells are splitting and they're not in a controlled way, rather they're just running wild and growing too much and really, you know, blocking out and destroying the other healthy cells that are around it. Uh, you know, if you have a normal cell undergoing a mutation, namely a problem, some sort of an issue with the with the cell. Now, if it's just one cell and, and it, there's a mutation, it can be just be killed off. But if it starts growing rapidly, you can have this growth, this cancerous, gro cancerous growth over here, which of course could eventually keep growing and become very bad. It's a group of related diseases characterized by cells growing out of control. Uh, it's composed of three steps. First, a cell's DNA is mutated and starts and is not healthy is grow is not doing what it's supposed to do and then altered the altered cell can divide repeatedly and then the cells can grow out of control that's what happens in a cancerous situation obviously there are all sorts of problems that are relevant to cancer you can see the symptoms over here fever weight loss pain skin changes you know cancer we all know is a very very serious uh, disease now it could be there could be types of cancer that are less serious and types of cancer that are more serious obviously at its most most serious uh, it can definitely be fatal um, but at its, you know, even at its lower levels, it definitely could still, you know, some types of cancer are considered not as bad as other types, but still, none, none of them are good. How do you avoid cancer? Well, first of all, tobacco use is a carcinogen, which means a substance capable of causing mutations that lead to cancer. Weight, diet, and physical activity level. A diet rich in antioxidants, fiber, things like that, all healthy things reduce the risk for cancer. A diet high in fruits and vegetables and low in saturated fats also reduces the risk for cancer. On the other hand, obesity, being too heavy and drinking too much alcohol and char cured and charboiled meats increase the risk for, tan for cancer and an inactive lifestyle also increases the risk for cancer. Most of these things are generally things that people assume are healthy anyway. Infectious agents from outside the body, exposure to sunlight, occupational exposure, you know, coal miners, for example, of course, are more likely to get lung cancer. Different people and different people who work with radiation are more likely to get cancer. There are various occupations that make people more likely to get cancer. The next type of, of uh, problem that the chapter discusses is anorexia nervosa. This is where people starve themselves because they want to be extremely skinny. And very often this is with young people who are extremely conscious about their body, children, teenagers who really want to become extremely skinny, and it could be a serious, potentially deadly medical disorder. Uh, extremely restrictive eating practices, or self-starvation, self intense fear, fear of weight gain, uh, no menstrual periods for at least three months, unhealthy body images. These are all things that characterize um, uh, anorexia nervosa. You can see this quote over here 
with that, uh, the, these quotes that are characteristic of people that have this disease. I regularly stuff myself and then exercise, vomit, or use diet pills or laxative to get rid of all the foods and calories, etc. These are all examples. People who starve themselves, people who are extremely, excessively uh, worried about their weight, even if they're skinny, these are people that are at risk for this sort of a disease. What can you do to help? somebody who has anorexia nervosa, well, you can arrange for friend or family support to ensure them that they, very often people uh, become this, get into this situation because they don't have a healthy self, self-image, they don't have uh, self-confidence. If they feel better about themselves, they're less likely to assume that they have to be extremely skinny in order to uh, have a good image. Uh, encourage friends to get treatment. Obviously, tread lightly. You don't want people to get defensive. You don't want to run over someone and say, hey, you need help, and they're probably not going to get it. Gently express your concern. Don't judge. Think of yourself as an outsider. Uh, don't, In other words, don't automatically assume that you can force the person to, to get better. Take care of yourself. Seek advice from a health professional. Don't be a food police. Um, in other words, don't be so overly concerned. Obviously, you want to make sure your children, for example, are eating healthy, but you don't want to be crazy about it. You don't want to say they can never have any anything that has calories in it, obviously. Uh, be a good role model of healthy eating, body image, and exercise. Avoid threats, anger, scares, put-downs, etc. That's some of the ways to help people. A, avoid anorexia nervosa, and number two, try to cure it if it happens. Okay, now let's look at some end of chapter multiple choice. Which of the following is true regarding free radicals? That was bad. Okay, anyway. A, exposure to pollution decreases free radical production? Eh, I don't think so. I think it increases, so I think we can forget about that one. Our body has no mechanisms to combat free radicals. That's not true. You know, we've got the antioxidants. By the way, I, 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 shouldn't, I should have mentioned this before. What I recommend is as soon as I show this, you know, you can pause it and then you can think, see if you know the answer. And then after, we, after you look at it and, to see, and see whether you know the answer, then of course you can start playing it again and I'll go through it. Uh, free radicals are formed as a byproduct of healthy metabolism. That's true. Free radicals are produced as a byproduct of healthy metabolism, but the healthy body can get rid of it. D, many diseases such as cancer and heart disease are not related to free radical damage. Well, of course, that's not true because they are related very often to free radical damage. So C is the only one that makes sense. Merchant ships used to travel long distances at sea where the crew and passengers would have litter, little or no access to citrus fruits and other sources of vitamin C. Which disease is particularly likely? Remember, without vitamin C, the one that we're looking for, as I mentioned before, is scurvy, which is right there as choice A. So that is all for this chapter, and let us move on to the next chapter, chapter 9. Chapter 9 concerns bone health, of course, which is a very important component of nutrition. So the first thing we need to discuss is how do you assess bone health? In other words, you walk into the doctor's office, how does the doctor make a determination about whether your bone health is good? Well, first of all, bone density. You want to make sure that your bone density isn't too light, too soft, which means that the bones aren't, haven't completely filled out and aren't completely healthy. The peak bone density is the point at which your bone density is the strongest. Bone health is also assessed by a dual x-ray absort... I don't even know how to pronounce that word, absorptiometry or something, whatever, a DXA, which measures bone den density. It uses low-level x-ray energy. X-ray is a type of electromagnetic ray that passes through skin but does not pass through bones. That's why x-rays are used in medicine all the time to assess a bone, whether it's broken, how it works, teeth, uh, it also is used for teeth, etc. It's a non-invasive procedure. In other words, they don't actually have to cut into you. They just shine an x-ray at you. And they measure it by obtaining a T-score, which compares the bone of density to that of a normal 30-year-old. A T-score of plus between plus 1 and minus 1 is good, between negative 1 and negative 2.5 is low, and that's not good because the person that that would be an increased risk of fractures. The lower the bone density, the easier it is for the bone to break. A T-score below negative 2.5 is very low, and that person has what is called osteoporosis, which is a disease of the bone. How do you fight or try to prevent osteoporosis? Well, the main way is to get enough calcium. Calcium is the most abundant mineral in the body. Now, calcium is obviously a mineral, it's, uh, it, and it's really a metal, but the body gets it in the form of calcium that's attached to various other types of foods. 99% of the body's calcium is in the bone. It forms and maintains 
contains bones and teeth. It also assists with acid-base balance because calcium is basic. As I mentioned earlier in the course, we have acidic, which is below 7 on the pH scale, and basic, which is above 7 on the pH scale. 0 is the strongest acid, 14 is the strongest base, uh, and the cal uh, calcium is basic. It's higher than 7 on the pH scale, which means that it tends to neutralize certain acids that are in the body. And the blood calcium level has a narrow range, so therefore the body really should try and needs to try to maintain the, the acceptable, healthy range of calcium. Calcium, well, when, cal when blood calcium uh, uh, falls, osteoclasts, which are cells that are responsible for the dissolution of bones, uh, liberate calcium, which means take calcium from the bones. In other words, when your body needs calcium, it's got to get it from somewhere. So if it can't get it from the food you eat, it's got to get it from your bones. Now that's the only place, because the, the, the stuff is needed for to neutralize acids and to, uh, and to do all sorts of things for the body. So therefore, if you don't eat enough calcium and the body has to take the calcium from the bones, obviously that will cause a decrease in bone density and lack of bone health. Calcium also assists in transmission of nerve impulses, which are messages the brain sends around the body and assists in contracting muscles. How do you get this calcium, which is of course so important? Well, you get it primarily from dairy products like milk. It says skim milk, because that's the healthiest, but you can get it from whole milk also. Uh, yogurt and low-fat cheeses, again, they don't have to be low-fat. They're going to have calcium anyway, but uh, you can also get it from ice cream, whole fat milk, and regular cheese, but that should be eaten in moderation because, of course, those things are very high in fat and calories. Cottage cheese is not a good source, uh, or is not a good source of calcium, but uh, these other types of dairy products are. Griefy lean vegetables like kale, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, um, green cabbage, pork, bok choy, whatever that is, turnip greens. These are other types of uh, vegetables that are also uh, high in calcium and also calcium fortified foods. There are some things that don't have naturally and that don't naturally have a lot of calcium, but they can have calcium worked into it. Uh, if, you, if you look at orange juice in the store, sometimes it'll say on the side calcium fortified, which means that they added calcium to the uh, to the orange juice. And another thing that's important in calcium is vitamin D. The reason is because when blood calcium falls, the parathyroid gland, which is a part of the thyroid, which is, I guess, uh, around your neck throat area, uh, it's a part of your endocrine system, part of your gland system that stimulates and produces all sorts of things that the body needs. It, st um, it stimulates the activation of vitamin D, which causes the kidneys to retain more calcium from the blood rather than excreting. In other words, if you don't have enough calcium, the body's got to figure out a way to get calcium. Well, one thing it can do is it can retain more calcium from the blood rather than filtering, filtering it out. Osteoclasts, as we saw before, which are cells that break apart the bones, break down bones and release calcium, and stimulation of calcium absorption from the intestines. So the body kind of has to figure out whatever it can do to get enough calcium. Now, when the blood calcium rises, then the, then the blood does the opposite. In other words, when your blood calcium becomes too high, then your thyroid gland re releases something called calcitonin. Calcitonin prevents calcium reabsorption, limits calcium absorption from the, from the intestines, and limits osteoclasts from breaking down bones. In other words, calcitonin is the opposite. Calcitonin tries to keep down the amount of calcium that's in your bloodstream, because just like everything else, too little is bad, but also too much is bad. So calcitonin, by the way, just a little history. My mother, who worked as a uh, chemist for a pharmaceutical company, uh, used to work on a drug on calcitonin, which is produced by the body, but if your body doesn't produce enough of it, or if your body needs more of it, you can take commercial drugs that increase the level of calcitonin in your body, and that the function of calcitonin is to decrease the amount of calcium in your bloodstream when necessary. Vitamin D, which we just discussed while it's, why it's necessary, is another important element of bone health. It is a fat-soluble vitamin, like vitamin A. Remember those things that absorb in fat, and too much of it is not good for you. The, the, if you have extra vitamin D, it's stored in your liver and fat tissue. It can be synthesized by the body by exposure to ultraviolet rays. So people who walk around in the sun a lot or lie on the beach a lot, they may have other problems like, uh, you know, 
heat stroke and skin cancer and things like that, which are caused by too much ultraviolet radiation. But one thing that they're probably pretty good at is they probably have enough vitamin D. Because if, you, uh, if the body gets exposed to ultraviolet light from the sun, it can allow the synthesis of vitamin D. It's a hormone because it's synthesized in one part of the body and moved to another part of the body. That's really just the definition of a hormone. When the body produces it in one area and moves it to the rest of the body, we are necessary. Vitamin D is necessary for calcium and phosphorus absorption, as we discussed in the previous slide. It also regulates blood calcium levels, stimulates osteoclasts, and necessary for calcification uh, of the bone. All these things obviously relevant to bone health, as we just discussed. How do you get vitamin D? Well, most foods naturally contain very little vitamin D. And although it can be obtained by fortified foods, again, if you look at milk sometimes in the store, it'll say something like vitamin D fortified, or it, because they add vitamin D to certain foods so that people should be able to get enough of it. Vegetarians not consuming dairy foods can receive vitamin D from the sun, fortified soy, product, soy products, and supplements. Now, vitamin D is one of the uh, is, is one of the types of vitamins that people have the most trouble getting. You probably, I, I, I don't know about everybody, but doctors tell me that certainly the highest percentage of people in terms of deficiencies of vitamins that they have is vitamin D. I personally have a little bit of a vitamin D deficiency also. That's why I take these vitamin D pills. Uh, but anyway, so, so the values also assume that people's exposure to the sun is not enough to get the amount of vitamin D that we need, which is probably true because we don't spend most of our time outdoors. We spend most of our time indoors. People who are shepherds, although I don't know if they do that today, or, or construction workers, for example, probably don't have a problem uh, in terms of getting vitamin D, but most of us do because most of us kind of stay indoors most of the day. So risks for vitamin D exposure are when you ha don't have enough sunlight, like if you live in, in northern latitude, New York is, I guess, a middle latitude, but if you live certainly up in uh, northern Canada or something, you probably, ha you might, or northern Europe, you might have vitamin D deficiency. People are indoors most of the time, such as elderly institutionalized adults or people who happen to work in an office, perhaps, and people who don't drink milk and therefore don't get vitamin D fortified milk. So that's, then you might have to take vitamin D pills. Vitamin D toxicity is when you have too much of vitamin D. That's when you take too much of these supplements. Now, I don't take too much of these vitamin D supplements, but uh, if, if, if you take too much of it, it could cause a problem and could result in hypercalcemia, which means too much calcium, too much blood calcium. And remember, hyper again means a lot, and you can probably see the root of the word calcemia, meaning being the same as calcium. Then you have vitamin K, which is also similar in terms of the necessity for bone health. It's a fat-soluble vitamin also, like vitamin D and vitamin A. It is stored in the liver. You can get it from different forms of vitamin K in plant and bacteria. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce these words. You can read them, but the point is these are sources of vitamin K. And they're necessary for blood coagulation which means making sure the blood clots when necessary so that when you bleed, you don't bleed too much, and bone metabolism. The recommended intake is approximately uh, 120 micrograms per day. This little symbol with the upside down U is a micro, which means a millionth of a gram. So you really don't need a tremendous amount of vitamin K, but uh, you know, still, you should, you, you should have some of it. Where do you get vitamin K? From greasy, grease, green leafy vegetables and vegetable oils. For example, if you want to eat a half a cup of boiled turnip greens, you can have three times the recommended adequate intake, the AI, the adequate intake. Uh, of course, if you eat a half a cup of boiled turnip greens, <laughs> you're probably going to want some real food eventually. But all right, anyway, so if you happen to like boiled turnip greens, congratulations to you. You're probably not going to have a vitamin K deficiency. Osteoporosis, that is a bad thing because it means that your blood density is too low, negative 2.5 on your T-score. Uh, let's see, it is characterized by low bone mass and therefore deterioration of the bone tissue. And the bones become fragile, leading to easy bone fractures. If people fall, they can break their bones even if they wouldn't ordinarily. Compaction of bone, which causes people to shrink a little bit. Again, usually it's in people in old age, especially uh, people of old, older age, especially women. But uh, it could cause people to shrink a little bit because their bone is getting more compact because the density is less. 
uh, shortening and hunching of the spine, dowager's hump, obviously, the sort of thing that's not you know deadly, but you really don't want if you can avoid it. What are factors that tends to increase osteoporosis? Well, age, the older the person it is, the more per the person is at risk for osteoporosis. Gender, it's more common in women. Genetics, Caucasians and Asians are more at risk. Also, if there's osteoporosis in your family history, you're more likely to get it. Consumption of tobacco, tobacco alcohol, and caffeine. We've seen all sorts of bad things that those things cause. Smoking, repeated falls and fractures, bad nutrition, not getting enough calcium. Physical activity helps with osteoporosis. Uh, lack of physical activity puts people at risk of osteoporosis, and history of failure to menstruate. We don't need to go into that. All right. Not all risk factors can be changed. Obviously, race, gender, family history, and age, nothing you can do about that. Um, but supplements of vitamin D and calcium can prevent osteoporosis. Calcium can be gotten in milk and things like that, or you can take calcium carbonate, which just as it just so happens that Tums, you know, a lot of, many of these antacids that you use to treat stomach gas happen to be con composed of calcium carbonate, and which is really a type of salt, but uh, it can help if, if people sometimes use it as a calcium supplement to get enough calcium in their diet, even if their stomach is fine. So, let us now take a look at a couple of multiple choice questions. Mary Lou is 66. Again, you can pause it if you want, uh, and then take see if you can answer the questions. Okay, paused? Excellent. Now you've unpaused. Uh, Mary Lou is 66 and has had her first DXA. The result is at a T-score of plus 0 .0, 0 0.5. What does her T-score indicate? Well, nothing. DXA is not able to determine bone density in women over 50. B, compared to a 30-year-old healthy per adult, she has osteoporosis. C, she's, bone density is normal. And D, uh, compared to a 30-year-old, she now has low bone mass. Well, remember, normal is between negative 1 and positive 1. Osteoporosis is negative 2.5 or worse. And so hers is in the normal range. It's plus 0 0.5. And so therefore, C, compared to a normal 30, healthy 30-year-old, 30 her bone density is normal. If Maria's blood calcium levels fall, which of the following is most likely to occur? Okay, well, PTH is produced that activates vitamin C. Well, vitamin C has nothing to do with bone density. Uh, vitamin D stimulates the kidney to reabsorb calcium from the blood. Oh, okay, that makes sense, because if her blood calcium levels are too low, then the vitamin D is going to have to stimulate the reabsorption of calcium into the bloodstream to make it back to normal. Uh, okay, C is the opposite. You don't stimulate osteoplast to break osteoplast to break the bone uh, break the bone down. Yeah, I mean first, uh, I guess that would be an emergency measure later on, but um, you'd want this step is obviously the first thing that would happen uh, because you'd want to first reabsorb the calcium from the bone before it breaks down the bone for that calcium, especially in a healthy person that doesn't have osteoporosis or anything like that. And D is obviously incorrect because vitamin D decreases absorption of calcium from the intestines. No, you want to increase absorption of calcium, if anything. And so therefore, we will say that B is the best answer. From bone health, we now go to blood health and energy metabolism. Metabolism means the total of what your body's doing. Your body's moving things, your body's breathing, producing energy. All these things are part of your metabolism. And vitamins, of course, are required for proper metabolism, even though they don't directly provide energy. They're necessary for obtaining energy from the macronutrients, like carbohydrates, fats, and proteins from which you do get your energy. And vitamins also function as coenzymes. Coenzymes act with enzymes in order to function in the body. And coenzymes are molecules that combine with enzymes to activate it and help it do its job. This is a diagram that indicates what a coenzyme is. You need an enzyme. Well, this is a, an enzyme, and this is whatever compound that it's working on. But you can see the shape is incorrect. This thing fits in here, but it doesn't. But there will be an empty space over here. So the chemical reaction can't take place. But if you have a coenzyme, something that kind of fits the lock and key model, and remember, this is the substrate the thing that's being acted on, this is the enzyme, and then you have the compound going in over here, and you have the coenzyme filling out the, 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 the lock and key, then you can have the chemical, take, the chemical reaction take place. So this is the coenzyme, this is the enzyme, and this is the thing being acted on, or the substrate.
Now you got lots and lots of different types of vitamins, and they all have very important functions functions in the body. And they some of them act with vitamins, and they produce coenzymes, different different types of coenzymes. And of course, as usual, you need to remember all of these letters. Of course, not you don't have to worry about the letters. Just remember the fact that vitamins very often do produce coenzymes, which are necessary to allow the enzymes to do their job. Now, there are many different types of vitamins. We've discussed a lot of them. Now we're going to go into the B vitamins, and there are a whole bunch of different vitamins. There's B6, B12, B1, all sorts of things. There's thiamine, which is B1. There's riboflavin, or riboflavin, which is uh, B2. There's B12. There's niacin, B6, biotin, all sorts of different types of B vitamins, and many of them are very important. And now we're just going to look at a couple of examples for, that are relevant to vitamin B, the B vitamins. Niacin, which is also uh, known by different names, is a coenzyme that assists with metabolism of carbohydrates and fats. So that's obviously important because otherwise the enzymes cannot break down the carbohydrates and fats, which is necessary for them to become small enough or to small enough pieces to use the energy to actually get energy from these materials. They come, how do you get niacin? Well, you can get it from meat, poultry, fish, and bread products. Uh, if you eat too much of it, just like many of the other vitamins we were discussing, the fat soluble vitamins, the, if you have too much of it, like if you have supplements, and therefore you have too much of it, it can result in toxicity, which you don't want. A severe deficiency in niacin can cause a disease called pellagra, which causes diarrhea, dementia, dermatitis. Uh, which uh, the dermatitis means uh, you know it's abrasive skin, not so terrible. Diarrhea, annoying but not so terrible. Dementia is bad, and then you get to well, you know, death. Okay, that's not so good. Then you have folate, also an example of a B vitamin. It is involved in DNA synthesis, making the DNA, making the materials in the cell that are necessary to run the cell and eventually run the body. Uh, they also create red blood cells, and therefore they're critical for the cell division in very early embryos, namely children or babies or zygotes that are growing into children and babies, uh, babies and children. So therefore, because of that, because it's necessary for early embryos, the woman during pregnancy dramatically needs an increase in folate. One of the things that comes in pregnancy vitamins is a nice extra supply of folate because it's necessary for cell division and proper formation of the fetus. Food sources. How do you get folate? Well, some ready-to-eat cereals, some enriched bread products. For example, three-quarters of a cup of whole grain total cereal. You may not have eaten total cereal. Total cereal is a, is a cereal with lots of different types of vitamins and minerals. It doesn't taste very good, but it's really healthy for you. Uh, toxicity can mask B12 deficiency, so in other words, uh, you got to be careful to have the right amount. A deficiency of folate can cause macrocytic anemia, which means without blood, where the hemoglobin levels are too low. So, as usual, with folate, you want to have just the right amount. Not too much, not too little. And this is related to blood health, as we discussed a moment ago. So once we're discussing blood health, we have this little diagram that indicates what is actually in the blood. The blood really has four components. You have the red blood cells, you have the white blood cells, you have the platelets, and you have the plasma. The red blood cells, the reason why the blood is red is because of the red blood cells, and they have... The, they carry the oxygen from place to place. They have hemoglobin, and hemoglobin allows oxygen to be transported in the body from place to place. Then you have the leukocytes, which are white blood cells of the immune system, which help fight off foreign invaders and uh, uh, infections and whatnot. You have platelets that assist in clotting of the blood, namely the blood uh, coagulating and making sure that it doesn't continue to bleed, and you have plasma, which is the fluid portion of the blood. If you would break down blood, you'd see that most of it is plasma, about 55%, about 45% of red blood cells, and the white blood cells and the platelets together only cover less than 1% of the blood's volume. So let's take a look at some other important nutrients and vitamins and minerals, and first up on the list is vitamin K. Vitamin K is a fat-soluble vitamin. We've discussed this a little bit earlier anyway. 
but we can go ahead and discuss it again. It's important for bone and blood health. That's why we looked at the bone health part in Chapter 9, and now we're looking at the blood health part. It's a coenzyme for the synthesis of protein involved in blood clotting, so it's very important for blood clotting in general to ha get enough vitamin K. It also has helpful intestinal bacteria. Um, excuse me, it's helpful intestinal bacteria produce some vitamin K, so having the right bacteria in your intestines, which we all have to help us break down our food, can help us ensure that we have a proper level of vitamin K. How do you get this? I think we discussed this in the last chapter also. Greeny leaf leafy vegetables for vitamin K and also certain types of vegetable oils like soybean and can deficiencies can result from diseases that disturb, uh, d disturb absorption of fats. Remember, vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin, so if you can't absorb fats correctly, the vitamin K may not be absorbed into the bloodstream. Someone with Crohn's disease celiac disease or cystic fibrosis, different types of diseases, are at risk for vitamin K deficiency, and newborns, in order to help them maintain the appropriate balance at the early stage, are given vitamin K at birth. Now we have iron, which is another, an example of a mineral, and an iron has, ver has many very important uh, benefits and also some risks. Iron is a component, component of hemoglobin, which is part of the red blood cells which the uh, erythro erythrocytes, which are blood cells, which are red blood cells, excuse me, which carry oxygen through the body, so iron is necessary for that. It's also a component of myoglobin, which carries oxygen in muscle cells. Remember, hemoglobin carries it in blood cells, myoglobin in muscle cells. Vitamin uh, Iron is important for both of them. It's also a coenzyme involved in the metabolism of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So you can see iron has many important functions for human nutrition. <clears throat> How do you get iron? Meat, poultry, fish, and certain types of enriched cereals and breads. And eating meat with beans and vegetables increases iron absorption. So eating well-balanced meals helps in that respect. Meat is also a factor, meat factor, and vitamin C, excuse me, meat, the same meat, I don't know what this word is meant to do, and vitamin C enhance absorption. So therefore, eating a cereal with orange juice, which is high in vitamin C, increases iron absorption. So eating vitamin C so it helps enhance absorption, and eating meat also helps enhance iron absorption. Also, cooking food in a cast iron pan increases iron intake. Okay, problems with iron, and that too much iron is which is an iron overdose which is com more common in <coughs> in children can be very dangerous and it could cause things like nausea vomiting diarrhea dizziness confusion etc and delayed treatment of iron toxicity in other words iron toxicity is n if it's not treated it can lead to damage to the heart nervous system liver and kidneys the opposite end of the spectrum is the iron deficiency not having enough iron not having enough iron is the most common nutri nutrient deficiency in the world. And they have different stages. The first stage is no physical symptoms. The second stage, when you have iron deficiency, you have decreased iron transport, transferrin, and production of hemoglobin, which means the blood cells are suffering. And physical symptoms include re reduced work capacity, because if you're not having enough hemoglobin, you're not having transporting enough energy around the body, well, then the cells don't have enough energy. Remember, oxygen is necessary for cells to respirate, for cells to produce the energy they need to survive. Then you have the third level, which you have a full-fledged anemia, which results in small red blood cells that don't carry enough hemoglobin, and the symptoms can be even worse. Fatigue, pale skin, shortness of breath, unexplained generalized weakness, impaired work performance, etc. You can see all of these things are based on not having enough oxygen to go around. Uh, red blood cells require uh, carry oxygen through the body, so if the red blood cells don't have enough iron or they don't, uh, and therefore are not able to produce the hemoglobin necessary to do that, then you're going to have problems with the entire the, with an oxygen deficiency throughout the body. Okay, now we're going to look at dietary supplements. Dietary supplements, really for the last two chapters, we've been discussing many different types of vitamins and minerals. And the best way to get these things is to take them by food, is to take them, take them, get them in food. But if you can't get them in food, then one option is to take pills, take some sort of a supplement. There could be liquid supplements, there could be pills, could be food supplements. 
And of course, these are defined by the Food and Drug Administration as products taken by mouth containing at least one dietary ingredient to supplement the diet. Some vitamins you take may have many different types of vitamins in them. They may contain vitamins, minerals, herbs, amino acids. Remember, we need amino acids, and we need uh, nine different types, which are essential, uh, essential amino acids that the body can't make for itself. And so if you don't get them from your protein sources, you may need to take them. Enzymes tissue from animals or organs or glands, different things that the body may need. The benefits are common sense. The benefits are it prevents deficiencies for those who might otherwise not receive certain nutrients. A vegetarian, for example, might need to take a supplement of riboflavin or vitamin D, B12, D, all these different things that they would no people would normally get from animal products but that vegetarians don't get. And they also can increase energy and absorption of energy by giving you the vitamins that are necessary to assist with these products. The downsides to this, number one, they're not substitutes for whole foods. Just because you take a vitamin, you know, you take a vitamin to replace your uh, vitamin C doesn't mean that eating oranges and citrus fruits are not wouldn't also be good for other purposes. Too much of many different types of vitamins, like the fat soluble vitamins like A, D, K, etc., can cause toxicity. And suppl some supplements can cause weight gain. Iron also, having too much iron is a problem. So that's one reason why people are sometimes reluctant to take iron pills, even though iron, of course, is very important. So if you do take vitamins, there are a few things that are important to know. Number one, FDA approval. Even though drugs require the approval of the Food and Drug Administration, vitamins do not. So just because you see something in a drugstore in a CVS and say, you know, this is a vitamin, doesn't inherently mean that it's a good thing. Uh, manufacturers are solely responsible for the safety. Government, there's no government oversight, so you got to be careful. Sellers are not required to show evidence of safety. There are no guidelines to show to ensure purity, safety, or composition. No limits on serving sizes. Um, in order for the FDA, even if the FDA wants, let's say, iron supplements to be taken off the market, they would have to prove that it's unsafe for it to be removed from a store. So you always want to try to choose safe, good quality dietary supplements by buying, well, I mean, I guess you could buy nationally recognized brands, although honestly the CVS brands or the local, the Rite Aid brands are probably just as good. They're probably the exact same thing. I mean, just my vitamin D supplements over here that I'm holding, uh, <laughs> I keep talking about them for some reason, but they're right over here. They happen to be Walgreens because they're a little cheaper. Honestly, I think that if, uh, that they're the same exact thing as the vitamin D supplements that are manufactured by the uh, national brands, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, <clears throat> and look for the U.S. Pharmacopeia, whatever, <laughs> USP symbol, which is an organization to try to make sure that supplements are appropriate and safe. So now we've got some multiple choice. A person exhibiting symptoms, again, you can pause it and then we can see if you can get the answers and then we can go ahead and look at it. Okay, let's go. A person exhibiting symptoms of impaired work performance, general fatigue, pale skin, depressed immune, func uh, immune function, and all these other nasty prob problems is most likely suffering, well, we just, the one we discussed in this chapter is iron deficiency. These are also, these are all the advanced stages of iron deficiency, and therefore the correct answer is choice D. Next question, which of the following individuals be most at risk for vitamin K deficiency? A 55-year-old pre, well, perimenopausal, I guess, um, premenopausal, it probably should be, I guess that's what it means. Um, a 16-year-old adolescent who drinks four and five cans of soda, 30-year-old Crohn's disease, or a six-year-old child who doesn't eat any vegetables. Well, vitamin K, there are, of course, not eating vegetables might have might cause an issue with vitamin K, but the most direct um, problems with vitamin K are people with various diseases, including Crohn's disease, which is one of the diseases that causes vitamin K deficiency, and therefore the correct answer is choice C. And thankfully, this is where the course starts to get a little bit easier. You know, until now we've been doing a lot of technical stuff. Vitamin K causes this, and, and this deficiency causes that. Now we're going to discuss things like maintaining a healthy body weight, exercising, things like that. A lot of the stuff you probably already know, but you know we should definitely go through it anyway. First of all, the is the idea of maintaining a healthy body weight. A healthy body weight. What does that mean? 
Well, it doesn't necessarily mean a particular number of pounds, but there are a lot of factors you got to take into account. What's appropriate for your age? What can be maintained without constant dieting? If you have to diet constantly and you have to starve yourself in order to maintain a particular weight, maybe that weight is a little bit too low. It also, you have to determine what's acceptable to you. If it's acceptable to you to weigh 100 and, again, obviously it depends on whether you're male or female, obviously, and, and how tall you are, but if, if it's acceptable to you to weigh 175 pounds, well, then that might be, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea, but you need to count, to put that into, into, take that into account. It's based on family history, body shape and weight, and promotes good eating habits. If you have good eating habits and regular physical activity, then your weight might be healthy, even if it's a little bit higher than would other people might have in similar similar situate positions. Some factors that you need to take into, a term, into account, body mass index, which we'll see in a few minutes what that is. A body max, mass index is essentially when you look at a person's weight and a person's height, and there are, there's a chart to make a determination of what a person theoretically should weigh. Also, a body composition. A person who exercises a lot may have very little body fat and a lot of tissue. That person might be considered obese on the BMI chart, but the person might actually have a healthy weight. In other words, if a person has big bones or a lot of muscles, they might weigh a lot, but might not necessarily be unhealthy. You also want to look at the difference between uh, fat distribution. Apple-shaped fat patterning, uh, patterning where the, there's a lot of fat in the upper part of the, uh, the stomach area, is a problem, whereas pear-shaped fat pattern, where the fat is much lower, is not considered as bad. If you look over here, this part is con this type on the left over here, the apple-shaped fat patterning is considered worse than uh, the pear-shaped, which is down here, where the fat is kind of more further down. So upper healthy obesity, uh, upper body obesity, is considered unhealthy and consists and puts puts a person at risk for many diseases, including type 2 diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, etc. Lower body obesity uh, is not considered much of a problem. The BMI, which I referenced earlier, is a ratio of the person's weight to the person's height. And, of course, it is distorted for people with high muscle mass. You might have uh, football players that weigh 240 pounds and are 6 feet 2. They, uh, under the chart, they would be extremely obese, but it might be because they have a tremendous amount of muscle or they have big bones or whatever it is. Uh, so extra muscle adds weight, elevating a person's BMI, which isn't necessarily a problem. This is the BMI chart. Now it's it's pretty strict. <laughs> according to according to this chart, something like I don't know, 30, 35 percent of Americans are obese. You know, forget overweight, and and more than half I think are probably overweight. But so let's say for example, and it doesn't even distinguish between men and women, which is strange because the normal uh, way things work is that men tend to weigh more. But so, for example, if a person is five foot eight, let's say, and weighs 170 pounds, so that would be considered um, overweight. It would be right over here. So five eight 170 is considered overweight, even though most people that are five eight 170 might not consider themselves overweight. According to the chart, they are a little overweight. Uh, normal would be the BMI under 18.5 is considered underweight. Normal is 18.5 to 25. 25 to 30 is overweight, and 30 or higher is obese. 40 or higher, I think, is considered morbidly obese, which is like seriously obese. Um, but you can see this chart that indicates when a person officially, scientifically, is considered overweight, normal, underweight. But again, it does it does uh, depend on a lot of other factors. The way these things are measured is by body fat adipose tissue, and muscle mass, which is lean tissue, skinny tissue and fat tissue in English. When a person loses weight but doesn't increase physical activity, then the body will take away the lean tissue, which is not good. The body will use the muscle tissue to get energy. So then a person will, st will may be skinnier because that person has less mass, but on the other hand, the person might lose muscle and become weaker. So the best thing to do is to increase physical activity and to diet, and so the body will use up fat tissue uh, for energy instead of muscle tissue. 
The next issue I wanted to go into is the Bossol metabolic rate, the BMR, which is energy expended to maintain resting functions of the body. In other words, these are things that are necessary for not necessarily running around and doing work, but even things like breathing, respirating, just general things that everybody needs to do whether you're resting or not. In fact, 60 to 75 percent of your total energy expenditure is a Bossol metabolic rate, is, your, is, is activities that are not necessarily from doing work. For example, when you're sleeping, your body still uses energy. If you didn't eat at all and you just slept the whole day, you'd still lose weight because your body still needs energy to do other stuff. People who are more lean people, people who are skinny, likely have a higher BMR. They, they're including men more than women, people who are more physically active more than people who are sedentary, women who are pregnant or nursing, taller people, younger people, these are all people who generally have a higher, what, 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 this is what people call, when, this is what people mean when they say metabolism, you know, your metabolism uses a lot of energy. Well, so these people tend to have a stronger metabolism, which means that they use more energy when they're resting, and therefore they tend to stay skinnier, etc. And BMR decreases with age, 3 to 5 percent per decade after 30, which means, by the way, that if you eat the same amount, for your whole life, you'll slowly gain weight. Okay, energy balance occurs when energy intake, how much you bring in in terms of calories, is equal to how much you spend. The energy intake is the number of calories consumed, the number of kilocalories that you eat, and energy expenditure is the amount that the body spends to maintain the basic functions. When the total energy that you take in exceeds the amount that you spend, the person will gain weight. And the rate is about 3,500 calories for every pound. So if you, for example, need 2,000 calories in a day in order to do the metabolic functions that you need, and you eat 5,500 calories, which is a lot of calories, but it's certainly possible, uh, then you'll gain a pound. On the other hand, if you eat nothing, then you'll lose 2,000 calories worth of stuff, worth of, uh, then essentially your body will need to draw 2,000 calories from your stored up fat reserves. So if you do that for a couple of days, you'll lose 4,000 calories and you'll lose a pound. And then if you exercise to burn off even more calories, of course, you can lose weight even faster. This can be done to help a person calculate how many calories you would need to consume in order to lose weight. Example, let's say Mary Smith wants to lose two pounds a week. Presently, she takes in 4,400 calories a day. Oh, that's a lot of calories. She's probably some sort of an athlete. Uh, most people don't take in that much. To lose weight, she would need to first figure out how many calories she's consuming each week, which is 4,400 a day times seven days a week, which is 30,800. She would then need to figure out how many calories she needs to stop consuming. Well, she needs, she, or to under-consume, she needs to under-consume by 7,000 calories because 3,500 calories is the number that represents a pound times two pounds, which is 7,000. So subtract from what she eats to what she needs. She eats 30,800, take away 7,000, and then you got 23,800. So what she can do is only have 23,800 a day if she normally eats 4,400 a day and maintains whatever weight she is. And then she drops down to uh, she drops down to to 23,800 a week, which is 3,400 a day. She will lose two pounds a week. Now, of course, it also it also depends on other factors. As she loses weight, she will uh, tend to slow down in terms of her weight loss. And if she exercises more, it will it will speed it up. It depends on her age. It depends on a lot of things. But at least this is the very very basic math involved, and it's quite simple. In terms of burning calories, in terms of burning energy, it's all based on energy costs. Energy cost means the cost of physical activity. In other words, how much physical activity does the body need to do in order to get rid of X number of calories? In order to, in order to do these certain functions, and these functions cause the body to spend X number of calories in them. Because physical activities burn various amounts of calories depending on the intensity of what you're doing. Energy costs are based on calories, or kilocalories, food calories, per kilogram. Kilogram is based on body weight. A kilogram, we use pounds, but a kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. So about 100 pounds is about 200, I'm sorry, 100 kilograms is about 220 pounds, give or take. So John weighs, let's, let's take an example. John weighs 200 pounds, which is 2.2 uh, kilograms per pound, so he weighs about 90.91 kilograms. So we'll round it off to about 91 kilograms. 
Uh, the energy cost of running at six miles an hour, it's kind of more more like jogging. Six miles an hour is not exactly running fast, but it's you know it's jogging uh, at about 1.175 kilogram kilocalories per kilogram per minute. If you divide that up, uh, that's the amount of running of that running six miles per hour does. So 0.175 kilograms per kilogram. I'm sorry, excuse me, kilocalories per kilogram multiplied by his weight, which is about 91 kilograms. So he's going to spend about 16 calories a minute, 15.91 calories per minute. Again, just take this number, 0.175, because that's the amount that is constant of running uh, six running um, six miles per hour. Multiply it by its weight. So if he runs at this speed for 10 minutes, he'll burn off about 160 calories. If John Doe runs for 30 minutes, well then it's 30 times this number, 15.91 times 30, which is 477. If he did this three times a week, well then that would be 1,431 kilocalories per week. Now remember, 3,500 is enough to lose a pound. So if he does this every day, even if he doesn't change his eating habits at all, he will lose about, um, I guess, a pound once every, oh, every two and a half weeks. So he'll lose, it'll take about two and a half weeks to get 3,500 calories. So if you take up running, you'll lose weight slowly, but you'll lose weight eventually, if, even if you keep all the eating the same. The real way, I mean, exercising is great for a lot of reasons, but the real way to lose weight is to eat fewer calories. That's a lot uh, faster than exercising. Um, digesting food also requires some energy. 5 to 10% of the calories we consume are used to digest a meal. If you eat a breakfast of 30, 345 calories, you're, some of them, about 20, 20 calories, are going to be used to digest the meal. So I guess you do lose a little weight even when you eat, but it's not a net situation. If you eat, if you, you, know, if you eat a lot of food, you're still going to end up gaining weight because you're not going to use as much energy to digest it as you do as it gives you when you eat it. There are actually some foods which cost more calories to digest than it does to than they give you. I think peppers is one example. It actually has a negative number of calories because it costs more to digest than it does to than it gives your body. Here are a couple of little charts over here on some these are just kind of random over here, but here are some charts which you may be asked to use in an exam question that you can see there are calories. On the left side, you have some examples of calories, uh, of foods and how many calories they have. And on the right side, you have examples of burning off calories. Look at the left side and, and some of these, the number of calories. Chili's Awesome Blossom, which is, uh, this, it's, a, it's an appetizer with, uh, has like onions, gre greasy onions battered in, in, in fatty, uh, batter. I don't know. If you've ever been to Dougie's, it's similar to the Incredible Onion from Dougie's. And it has, I don't know if Dougie's also has 2,700 calories, but the Chili's Awesome Blossom has uh, 2,710 calories. And it's, it's almost all fat, which is really makes it a very, very, um, I think it was it was rated the worst food in the country or something by, because it really doesn't give you any, ener any nutrients. All it is is fat. doesn't really give you a lot of vitamins. doesn't give you a lot of other materials. It's really just, you know, disgusting high fat saturated trans fats and it's you know it's not not really a good thing to eat you'd have to walk 27 miles for an average person <laughs> or for nine hours for nine hours in order to burn off one chili's awesome blossom and you see some of the other examples romano's macaroni grilled spaghetti and meatballs 2270 nathan's famous seafood sampler sounds healthy with seafood but it's uh, 3379 calories and you'd have to walk 33 miles to burn it off if you look over here on the right side you can see some examples of how many is depending on your weight let's say you weigh between 160 and 170 so to walk walking three miles an hour which is normal speed you would burn off 50 calories every 10 minutes uh, dancing, cycling, of course. Uh, you know, there obviously the more the more you're the more you're doing, the higher the more you're going to lose. Jogging at six miles an hour, you lose 140 140 um, calories for every 10 minutes. Okay. Let's take a look at some multiple choice over here, which, again, you can pause it. I showed the answers by mistake a moment ago, but hopefully you didn't see it. But you can go ahead and pause it now. 
and which of the following individuals is most likely to have the lowest fossil metabolic rate? In other words, the lowest resting metabolic rate. A, 25-year-old conditioned male athlete, definitely not. It's a young man that's well-conditioned is going to have the highest type of fossil metabolic rate. A 20-year-old normal weight male, well, let's see. A 25-year-old overweight woman, that definitely is, is, is true. That's somebody that's overweight and a woman are more, le less likely to have slower metabolisms. And a 25-year-old pregnant woman, no, because pregnant women tend to actually speed up their metabolism. So C is the correct answer. And choice, and next question, body mass index can best be defined. A, a percentage of individual's body fat compared to a reference standard. Okay. Ratio of an individual's body weight come to their height squared. That's a better example because BMI measures what you actually weigh. It doesn't reference body fat specifically. You could have an athlete is going to be on the same BMI chart as somebody who has no, no muscle at all. So B looks good. Density has nothing to do with it. And fat tissue, again, isn't measured in BMI. So B is the one that looks like the best answer. Chapter 12 continues with the way in which to make sure that you're healthy. And last chapter we discussed about body weight and things like that, and now we're going to discuss physical activity. Physical activity means, first of all, any muscle movement that increases energy exposure. Pretty much everything is physical activity. Leisure time physical activity is an activity that's not related to your occupation. Things like hiking, walking, biking, jogging, things like that would be considered a leisure time physical activity because you don't actually have to do those things for your work. This includes, of course, exercise, which the purpose, which is a leisure activity, which is purposeful, planned, and structured, and designed to increase physical activity that you don't necessarily need. Physical fitness in general is a state of being that's created by the interaction between nutrition and physical activity. It includes things like cardiorespiratory fitness, which means your breathing and your heart functioning, your flexibility, your body composition, and your musculoskeletal fit fitness. In other words, the fitness of your muscle and the bones that your muscles are attached to. Here are some of the activities that are relevant to these types of fitness. Cardiorespiratory, namely your breathing system and your heart, you can do to help that, you can do aerobic type type of activities like running, walking, swimming, skiing, it's a cross country skiing, etc. Musculoskeletal f uh, fitness to help your muscular system, you can do weightlifting, sit-ups, calisthenics, put us push-ups for muscular strength. So you can do weightlifting uh, for muscular endurance. You can also do different types of weightlifting, flexibility. You can do stretching or yoga and body composition. In other words, to make sure that you have a low, low enough percentage of body fat, etc. You can do aerobic exercise like running or resistance training. And of course, the, I, the whole idea of this is to try to improve your physical fitness, which well, a sound physical fitness program, the sort of thing that's likely to work and the sort of thing that you're likely to stick to, A, meets your personal goals. Are you trying to become a bodybuilder or are you just trying to be uh, a little bit more healthy? Is it fun? Does it include variety and consistency? Do you do it every day and do you do something that's going to keep it interesting rather than doing just the same thing over and over and over again? Appropriately overloads the body. Obviously, you want to give your body a workout, but on the other hand, you don't want to do something that is too tough. And of course, it should also include a warm-up and a cool-down period. When you're running or when you're weightlifting, you shouldn't go right into it. You should warm up first. This prevents a shock to the body, and this prevents the body from straining itself. You also, of course, what kind of fitness regimen a person should take on depends on a lot of things. For example, if you're training for an athletic competition, it will have to be more rigorous, obviously. If you're working towards cardiorespiratory fitness, to, to do th you do more things that are respiratory um, aerobic exercise, like biking, jogging, swimming. Aerobic exercise really means anything that increases your heart rate that... It's not just weightlifting is not aerobic exercise, but things like running, jogging, swimming, those things are aerobic exercise. And of course, appropriate improving physical fitness includes trying to maintain overall physical health. Here's the pyramid, the physical activity pyramid, the idea is similar to the food pyramid that we looked at earlier in some context, but this means the sort of activities that are recommended. Every day, of course, you have to do your general activity, you have to go about your normal business every day because that's what you have to do. 
planned recreational activities, biking, running, tennis are some examples they give you over here that they say three to five times per week for 20 to 30 minutes, two to three times per week, things like stretching, yoga, trying to increase your, increase your flexibility, and of course TV, computer, and games they say that you should only do occasionally. It's not really what most people do, but that's at least the theoretical uh, thing to, look, to, to try to shoot for. Uh, types of exercise. You have aerobic exercise, which increase your need for oxygen. Uh, these examples are, again, anything that makes you breathe heavy, anything that, makes the, that, that gives your, your lungs and your breathing a little bit of a workout. Biking, tennis, jogging, swimming. And the benefits of aerobic exercise, of course, are that they're good for your cardiovascular health or cardiorespiratory health. Cardio means you, your heart, and respiratory means your lungs and your breathing system. Regular physical activity, walking a lot, weightlifting, whatever, is good for your overall health. It reduces the risk for chronic diseases like osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes, which comes from obesity, heart disease, etc. Moderate physical activity should be done most, if not all, days of the week, like 20 minutes of walking, 30 minutes of basketball, gardening, something like that. And you don't have to do it all at once. You can do it at different times of the day. Warm up and, warming up and cooling down is always very important with regard to exercise. You, it pr helps prevent injuries. For example, if you stretch your hamstrings too much at the beginning of your workout, you might actually pull them. But on the other hand, if you stretch them f first just to kind of stretch them gently to loosen them up a little bit, it's much, much less likely. This includes, includes stretching and calisthenics, and it can reduce muscle soreness afterwards, and it should usually last five or ten minutes even before you start your workout. And then after it's over, you want to rather if you're running, for example, at the end, you want to, you know, at the end, you might want to walk for a few minutes before completely stopping. Of course, the idea of exercise, especially when you're talking about losing weight, is to appropriately overload the body. The idea is to put physical demands on the body to improve fitness, improve muscle texture, burn calories, things like that. Too much physical exertion, on the other hand, is not recommended. How is this, how do you measure this? Well, you can measure it by the quote-unquote FIT principle. FIT is F-I-T, stands for frequency, intensity, and time of activity. Frequency means the number of activity sessions per week. Obviously, the more the better. Intensity, you want to try to make sure to maintain proper intensity, which can be based on heart rate, or it can be based on, you know, just how you feel. Uh, heart rate is based on the heart the rate at which the heart beats during its maximal intensity exercise. Now obviously if you know if you have one of these cardio machines sometimes it'll actually measure your heart rate for you if you put your hands on it. So um, so the recommended target is 50 to 70 percent of the person's individual maximal heart rate. Obviously, that can vary from person to person. I can tell you that people who are very healthy, their resting heart rate is about uh, 60 beats per minute, 70 beats per minute. People who are maybe a little bit less cardio healthy in terms of cardiovascular might uh, be 80 or 90. But uh, you know, exercise you want to try to you don't want to make it too much more than that. But obviously, you want to make it higher than that. Let's say 120, 150, some some somewhere in that range. Now, fat, of course, is an important energy source, and one of the benefits of exercising is that energy, of uh, using the energy for exercise burns the fat that your body is using as a source. The fat in trained athletes who regularly, regularly exercise vigorously often becomes the source of their energy, as opposed to other people very often using carbohydrates as a source of their energy. But they have an improved ability in the muscles to store, f the, that, to store fat, that's, that store fat it should be, to be uh, used for energy. And they have the ability to extract fat during exercise. That's very often why people who are in very good shape and run a lot don't breathe heavy because when you're breathing heavy essentially what that means is your body saying we need more oxygen oxygen is necessary for aerobic respiration and when you're running the body needs to do aerobic respiration and if the body doesn't have enough oxygen to do that aerobic respiration it's going to send a message to the respiratory system saying here get me more oxygen get me more oxygen and that's why you breathe heavy the people who are in really good shape they can actually burn fat aerobically and you know use and generate energy even without breathing heavy without getting more oxygen because their body is used to it. They also may have an increased number of enzymes in fat metabolism, <coughs> so they can break down fat and use that as energy relatively quickly.
The next important thing is setting up your exercise. Setting up an exercise regimen, which means a method by which you do your exercise, is of course very important. And it's generally better to work, work out multi more times for shorter periods than one long time per week. It helps the body stay fit to work out more times. In other words, you're better, doing, you're better off doing 20 minutes three times a week than one time for 60 minutes. So this spares the body from shock and strain. Somebody who rarely works out won't be able to lift a 50 pound weight right away, uh, while someone who works out periodically will build his body up better to handle that sort of strain. It's better for the body to have consistency. But of course, many people should seek medical advice before starting a new exercise regimen to make sure that they won't harm their body by over straining it or by shocking it, something to that effect. So, for example, especially people who have been inactive, people with medical concerns, and pregnant women should definitely at least see a, med a professional before they start an exercise routine, a regimen, just to make sure that they're not going to overstrain their body. Some other things regarding exercise include things like breathing during exercise, which is, of course, very important. You want to make sure the body has a requisite supply of oxygen whenever you do any exercise. So the more vigorous exercise a person becomes, the easier it is for the person to breathe easier, as we discussed. The body becomes used to doing aerobic respiration and is able to breathe even while it's exerted. Marathon runners, for example, are not huffing and puffing when, they, uh, when, when they're running a marathon because they're used to it and their body's able to do aerobic respiration which is necessary for ox which oxygen is necessary for even while they are exercising so a person who has overexerted himself may huff and puff because the body needs more oxygen. The body is required to do a lot of energy, can't use aerobic respiration because it's out of oxygen, so the body needs, says, okay, get us more oxygen, so the body involuntarily gulps down more oxygen, and this causes you to huff and puff. Another thing very important regarding exercise is hydration, which means drinking appropriately and getting enough water. Water leaves the body during exercise through sweat, especially on a hot day. So the, body t the reason why this happens is the body temperature rises and blood vessels move closer to the skin because it needs the cooler air. That also very often is why people uh, have red faces during, uh, when, 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 they're very, when they're sweated up because they are, the blood vessels have gotten closer to the skin, turning the skin a reddish color. So then, but it's important when a person sweats to get that, to replace that oxygen, to replace that energy, to replace that water. Uh, so drink adequate amounts of, of water, of fluid during, before, and after exercises. Some signs of proper hydration is when urine is a fairly light color. When the urine is a light yellow color, or a light color in general, then that is an indication that, that you're not dehydrated. That means there's plenty of water in your body. Normal appetite, proper exercise performance. Dehydration, on the other hand, when you're not getting enough water, signs of that are decreased ability to concentrate, fatigue, weakness, headache, dizziness, increase of heart rate uh, than you would normally expect, and doesn't say it here, but also a dark yellow urine. A dark, ye dark yellow urine is a sign of dehydration. So generally speaking, you know, if I guess first thing in the morning it's normal because you haven't drank all night, but if during the day your urine is dark yellow, that's a pretty good indication that it's a good idea to drink some water. Some other things regarding nutrition and exercise, people who use a lot of energy, like an athlete, need to make sure that they're consuming enough calories to maintain vigorous activity. Uh, but too, too, eating too many calories, of course, leads to weight gain and not enough calories. It could to weight loss. Of course, that could be uh, intentional. I mean, Michael Phelps, for example, who was the champion Olympic swimmer, they, I once read that he had something like 8,000 calories a day. <laughs> You're not, and he's obviously very, he's very thin. He's in very, very good shape. But because he exercises so much, he needs that much in order to maintain maintain his body. So the amount of calories an athlete needs is, varies greatly. A small female gymnast may only need 1,800 calories a day, while a male cyclist in the Tour de France may need 7,500 calories a day because they use so much energy. An athlete, of course, has to make sure to also to receive the appropriate nutri nutrients, things like enough protein, enough vitamins, enough minerals, etc. Finally, a note on the Atkins diet. I mentioned this very briefly earlier in the course. Atkins diet is a high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet. The proteins usually come from animal sources, so the people on the Atkins diet don't necessarily um, 
they have a low fat diet on the contrary because they eat a lot of meat they very often have a high fat diet but proteins replace carbohydrates people in the Atkins diet do not eat carbohydrates they probably do eat vegetables but certainly not grains and also they may cut back on fruits because fruits have sucrose which is a type of sugar People on the diet try to lose weight while eating a lot of proteins and fats. The idea of the Atkins diet is to reduce carbohydrates, to cause ketosis, which means the body burning um, its own fat and body burning protein. Remember, ketone, we discussed earlier, are elements of proteins. So ketosis is when the body burns protein for energy. So that's really the idea when you try to, when, when a, also the ketosis uh, person feels less hungry and generally eats less. So the idea is that the body won't have any carbohydrates to break down, and so we'll have to break down the fats or proteins, causing the person to be less hungry, and also causing the body to store less fat. So a, the body of a person on the Atkins changes from a carbohydrate burning engine to a fat burning engine. That's really the idea, to avoid carbohydrates, which quickly enter the bloodstream and allow the body to avoid um, burning fat. And it also tends to help with, uh, with things with blood sugar, because if a person does, carbohydrates break down very quickly and increase blood sugar level. If a person has diabetes or something that their blood sugar level is too high, they may very well want to... Um, to avoid, try to avoid eating carbohydrate as much as possible. And proteins from this high-protein diet are used to build muscle and improve performance. Again, those are the advantages of the Atkins diet. Earlier in the course, we discussed some of the disadvantages. Okay, let's see a couple of questions over here. After completing an exercise session, inadequate hydration, in other words, dehydration, is best determined by what? Urine that's dark yellow, yes, that indicates dehydration. Remember, a urine that's light yellow or white or watercolor is not white, but watercolor is generally healthy hydration. Lack of fatigue and soreness in the muscles, no, that would be good. Absence of leg cramps would be good. No sweat production would be would mean that you're really not overheated at all. So that the answer here would be A. Let's take a look at. Um, the next question, the Center for Disease Control recommends the target rate, um, heart rate um, range of an individual's maximal heart rate. Well, this we saw before, it's specifically said on the slide, to be 50 to 70 percent, and therefore the answer to this question is C. Chapter 13, as we continue with nutrition, is based on food technology and safety to make sure food is safe, and in other words, what kind of impacts technology has had on food. Well, first of all, the main threat to food safety is, of course, foodborne illnesses, which are viruses or bacteria that make their way in food from person to person. These are illnesses transported from food or water that contain some sort of in infectious agent or poisonous substance or protein causing some sort of immune reaction in various people. People. And there are multiple government agencies that are relevant to try to make sure that food is safe and has an acceptable level of quality. You have the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which oversees safety of meat, poultry, and eggs sold across state lines. You have the Food and Drug Administration, which regulates food standards of food products except for meat and poultry and eggs. Uh, and also, they also do regulate bottled water, and they regulate labeling and enforces pesticide use, as established by the Environmental Protection Agency, which is also one of the organizations over here, which regulates use of, use of pesticides. And then you have the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, which works with public health officials to try to educate the public about what foods are safe and what foods are dangerous. So first, let's start with foodborne illnesses. In other words, illnesses that are carried by food. These are illnesses that are resulted for, result from eating contaminated food with living microorganisms like bacteria or virus. And they could also, foodborne illnesses, also apply to food intoxications, which are illnesses that result from eating food in which microbes, namely bacteria or viruses, have secreted toxins which could be dangerous to people microorganisms in general, which of course could be dangerous, they're not inherently dangerous, certainly just because food has bacteria doesn't mean it's dangerous, all food has some bacteria in it, in fact we need bacteria, but 
that microorganisms sometimes can be dangerous, and the kind of environmental conditions that the food is prepared in and the food sits in has a lot of impact on what kind of microorganisms it has. Microorganisms typically need oxygen, so it's, if it's in a place, if they're airtight, like for example in a can, in a closed can, which is airtight, it's much less likely to be a problem because there's no oxygen in there, so the microorganisms cannot live there. A preferred range of acidity, if something is very acidic or very basic, you're probably not going to have these microbes in there. And in temperatures between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees, if things are kept in the freezer, as we all know, they're much less likely to be problematic. And by the same token, if things are boiled and uh, to above 140 degrees Fahrenheit, they also generally have much less of a problem. If there's water that you think might be uh, contaminated, so the best thing to do is to boil the water. Or, of course, you could freeze it. Either way, you'd probably get rid of the foodborne, uh, foodborne illnesses. You also have problems of various chemicals that accumulate in foods. Growth hormone, pesticides, insecticides, herbicide, fungicide, fungi fungicides. These are all things that are designed to kill these things, to kill if farmers spray their, spray their plants, to kill pests, kill in insects, it's, uh, kill fungus, kill different types of vegetables. These are all problems because when people eat that, they may, they may be de deadly for the insects, but they could also be dangerous for the humans. And also persistent organic pollutants like mercury and lead can get into food because they're being used in areas where the food is being prepared, and that, of course, can also cause problems. Pesticides, in general, means chemicals that are used in fields or in storage areas. And the purpose of pesticides is to prevent the pests from eating the crops and of course to reduce the incidence of disease. Obviously, if you decrease the insects that are going to be in the crops, well then the insects don't have a chance to spread their insect diseases. So in those, in those ways, of course, uh, insecticides can be very good. However, pesticides can poison people and pesticides can hurt people. Children are more sensitive to pesticides than adults because the children eat more for per, food per unit of weight than adults do. So their bodies are taking in a higher percentage of pesticides. If you have a child that weighs 40 pounds and an adult that weighs 160 pounds, well, the adult doesn't eat four times the amount the child does. So the child is taking in a higher percentage of his or her, his or her body weight than the adult does. So children are still developing their organs, so they're not as easily capable of dealing with pesticides, and they might not be able to excrete pesticides as effectively as adults, so that's one reason why children have to watch out for pesticides even more so than adults do. Certain people are particularly at risk when it comes to uh, foodborne illnesses. People who are a developing fetus or a young child, of course that includes pregnant women also because of the fetus there, people with a low immunity, people with immune system that's not functioning properly, such as people that have cancer or people that have AIDS. AIDS stands for autoimmunodeficiency syndrome, which is a problem with, which blocks the immune system from fighting off germs appropriately. Also, people with chronic illnesses such as diabetes, and generally speaking, the elderly are more at risk than people who are younger. And of course, that generates the question, what do you do to prevent these foodborne illnesses? Well, here are some examples. You can wash your hands and kitchen surfaces thoroughly and often to try to kill any bacteria or get rid of any bacteria or viruses that may be in the food. Washing dishes in a dishwasher or with hot water and soap like Dawn, which can kill the bacteria and viruses. Washing dish towels and apron often. Or often. Separ aprons often. Separate foods to, uh, that are raw and cooked to prevent cross-contamination. Raw foods are much more likely to have bacteria in them because they haven't been boiled and the bacteria haven't been killed, so you want to keep them separate from the cooked foods so that the bacteria from the raw foods don't crawl into the f cooked foods. Do not use porous wooding boards, or wooding, wood cutting boards, which are wood cutting boards that have holes in them that can cause cross cam contamination. If you're cutting something on it that does have bacteria, the bacteria will nestle themselves in these little holes and crawl into whatever food that you are cutting it next. Chill foods, put them in the fridge to prevent them from, prevent microbes from growing. If it's under 40 degrees Fahrenheit, microbes have a tough time growing there, and most refrigerators are approximately 40 degrees or a little bit less.
and food should be sl thawed slowly in the refrigerator. If you want to, if you want to cook something, rather than putting it from the freezer to the counter, it's a better idea to put them from the freezer to the refrigerator, even though it might take a little bit longer to thaw. Other ways, including things like cooking things, cooking foods to their proper temperature, not eating them when they're too when they're undercooked or cool, not letting perishable foods sit out longer from longer than 2 hours if you have milk or something, make sure to put it in the fridge when it's not being used. Keep meats at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or lower when they're not being cooked, when they're not being eaten obviously. Uh, even if you're having a barbecue, in other words, put them in the refrigerator until it's time to actually start cooking them. Foods should be cooked thoroughly to in, to kill microbes. In other words, don't let it let them be pink in the middle. Uh, don't let them be extremely rare. I mean, I guess eating a rare steak is not the end of the world, but if it's very rare and it's uncooked in the middle, that could cause a problem. Leftovers should be stored in the refrigerator for only a limited period of time, not for weeks and weeks <laughs> until they start growing stuff. Uh, when shopping, purchase refrigerated and frozen foods last so that they don't sit in your cart for a long time and get spoiled by the time you bring them home. This includes some things. Some these are these are some examples to kill bacteria, like this mean-looking green guy in the middle. His name is Bac because he's he's a bacteria, uh, or a bacterium. Clean in your hands and surfaces um, often. Separate things. The the thing that you're eating from the thing from the raw chicken and meat over here. Chill, refrigerate promptly, and cook to their proper temperatures. Uh, here are some examples of things that are important. The safety zone is 30 degrees, to 34 to 40 Fahrenheit, which most refrigerators are anyway. And this is a list of how long these things will keep safely in this sort of temperature. Uncooked hamburger, uncooked roast, you know, uncooked hamburger only one to two days. So obviously, if you're getting, having a barbecue next week, put them in the freezer. In the freezer, they'll hold for a lot longer. So you put them in the freezer until a day or two before you're ready to actually cook them. Uncooked roasts, three to five days. Most of these things, again, you can see these most of these between one and five days, depending on what they are. Uh, other thing in terms of, temp of ter in terms of foodborne illnesses, well. Uh, in terms of how, how, what temperature to cook them, leaf and beef, lamb and veal, steaks and roasts, medium rare, or can be cooked at 145 degrees, medium 160 degrees, and you can see these various temperatures up to 180 degrees. If you cook things at lower temperatures, you might not be cooking them at a high enough temperature to kill the bacteria. Remember, bacteria work live best between 40 and 140, so if you're cooking it at under 140 degrees, you could have an issue, which you don't want. Uh, foodborne illnesses internationally are a big problem. Things that foods that are imported may not have had the same level of precautions. So here are some examples of how to try to avoid foodborne illnesses when you're traveling. Number one, don't drink unpasteurized milk. Pasteurization is a way that was invented by a French scientist named Louis Pasteur. That's why it's called pasteurization. And essentially what, the pa what pasteurization is, is they, they boil the milk or orange juice or whatever is being pasteurized, mostly milk, but they boil it at a very high temperature, and then right away they put it into the can or put it into the plastic uh, carton or the paper carton or whatever it is they're storing in. In other words, so what they try to do is they try to boil it in order to kill, the, kill whatever bacteria are there, bacteria are there, then they put it into something that's airtight that don't allow more bacteria to come in. If they would just bottle it right away, whatever bacteria were there would stay there. And if they first boil it and then let it sit around for a few hours or a few days and then bottle it, well then more bacteria could come. So if you boil it and then quickly put it into the can or the plastic or whatever it is, that's the best way to try to keep things safe. And that's called pasteurization. Don't eat fruit that you have not peeled yourself because if it's been sitting in the soil or wherever for a long time, uh, germs could have uh, approached it. Uh, don't use local tap water. Water in some countries, especially third world countries, may not have the same level of purification and filters it, the fil and filtering. Don't even use it to brush your teeth or um, if you do drink it, at least boil it. So, for example, I mean, this is just an example of an essay question. If you're planning to, if you're planning a South to visit to visit a South Asian country, what steps can you do to make sure that you don't become infected with foodborne illnesses? One, don't drink the tap water; only drink bottled water. If you do drink the tap water, boil it first. Don't eat fruit that you haven't peeled yourself. Uh, try to make sure that whatever you drink is, has, has been pasteurized and bottled commercially. These are things that are all important. Generally speaking, I, I actually once found that out. I was in Israel and I drank the tap water and I ended up having stomach problems, which were not a lot of fun.
So you want to try to avoid that if you can. Okay, and the last, last uh, subject of this chapter is genetically modified organisms. The idea that some plants, uh, things like that, have been genetically engineered. In other words, they've been grown in a certain way or altered in a certain way so that they grow more or that they're tastier or for whatever reason, and these things are called genetically modified organisms. They're organisms in which DNA have been altered using recombinant DNA technology. What that means is that the scientists can actually take organisms or cells, individual cells of organisms or like plants that will eventually grow into whole plants and isolate a particular segment of the DNA and change that particular segment or add some sort of a gene that will allow it to maybe keep longer or allow it, you know, something, some kind of a benefit to try to make sure that uh, the trees will, uh, you know, will grow, will, will produce more fruit or produce healthier food or fruit or not produce seeds or whatever, you know, whatever is necessary, whatever uh, the scientists are looking for in that particular uh, combination or that particular trait. So scientists isolate a particular segment of the DNA of an animal, plant, or microbe, and then they isolate it, then cultivate it, and the cell is then cultivated and placed into an organism that's lack lacking that trait. So now when this new organism grows, obviously you don't do it for one organism. You hope this organism will then grow many more organisms with the same trait, like plants or, or trees, and then that's, that's what's called a genetically modified organism. The advantages are, of course, you can enhance the taste, nutrition, quality, crop yields, health. You can do all sorts of things using genetically modified organisms. Sometimes, for example, you make them more resistant to, in, to insects. So instead, of, so these are now resistant to insects. So instead of having to actually spray them and cause all these pesticide problems, you can just, uh, you can just grow them normally. So there are lots, lots of these advantages over here. Some of these, there are some disadvantages, of course. Genetically modified crops can disrupt other crops through cross-pollination. When plants uh, reproduce with each other, if they have different DNA, that could cause all sorts of confusion in the, in, in the uh, genetic code. Also, we don't know the long-term effects of genetically modified foods. If we genetically modify foods to make them taste juicier, how do we know what other side effects that, we, that, that might not be known for years until maybe people uh, you know, develop health problems? Loss of biodiversity because we are altering plants that have made up our environment and made up our ecosystem. New diseases could be produced. Maybe they're because they're, you know, antibiotics or like penicillin are usually used to kill bacteria. But if we change this bacteria to add a trait, how do we know that we're not going to make them immune to certain types of antibiotics? And if genetically modified organisms are misused, they could use to create biological weapons. For example, this, con this kind of technology can be used to create some sort of a virus that's particularly deadly or that can overcome a human immune system. So obviously it's not, it's not that genetically modifying oranges are going to cause uh, biological weapons, but it's that this technology can allow for this sort of devastating biological terrorism or fighting. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of the end of, uh, end of chapter multiple choice. And again, you can pause it if you like, and then uh, we will look at it. Okay, let's go. Uh, which of the following is a recommended method for preventing foodborne illnesses? A, washing utensils and cutting boards in the dishwasher. B, cooking with hands that have not been washed. Ouch, that's not, that doesn't sound good. Leaving meat on the counter overnight, that, leaves, that doesn't sound good either. You're leaving it at room temperature for more than a few hours. Leaving leftovers in the fridge for two weeks, that's almost always bad. Remember, we saw how long they keep, and usually it's not more than five days. So the only one that actually makes any sense is choice A, washing utensils and cutting boards in the dishwasher to kill all the bacteria and whatnot. Next question. For Memorial Day weekend, Sam is planning a barbecue with his friends at Lakeside Park. Congratulations to Sam. Sounds like fun. Why wasn't I invited? Which of the following practices should he do to prevent the outbreak of foodborne illnesses? A. Grill hamburgers to medium rare. Mm, I don't know about that. I mean, medium rare is a little, uh, is a little low. I mean, I, you know, that's not necessarily always dangerous, but not the safest thing in the world. Use dishes that have been sitting in dirt while they played basketball. Ouch. That doesn't sound good. All sorts of 
vi viruses and insects could have crawled into the uh, dishes. Let perishable food sit out longer than two hours. That doesn't. That sounds pretty stupid. <laughs> and but D. So by default, hopefully, it's going to be the right answer because the other choices are all kind of silly. Transport and keep burgers, hot dogs, and other foods at below 40 degrees. That's right, because below 40 is where microbes have the toughest time living. And that is all for that chapter. In the last two chapters, chapters 14 and 15, we are going to discuss the special nutritional needs that apply to certain people, namely pregnant women and children. The first thing, of course, regarding pregnancy and the nutrition for pregnant women is the idea of pre-pregnancy nutrition, and that is nutrition that women should, keep if they plan to keep even before, I'm sorry, excuse me, if they plan to become pregnant, what they should do to try to make that process as healthy and easy as possible. And a varied, healthy preconception diet certainly reduces the risk of pregnancy problems. Certain things that are important for women who may become pregnant to take include folate, which is uh, vitamin B, one of the forms of vitamin B, because inadequate levels of folate can result in brain and spinal cord defects for the fetus. Nutrients that are good to increase before pregnancy including things like, include things like vitamin B12, vitamin C, vitamin A, and vitamin D. During pregnancy, of course, the nutrition, nutritional requirements become even more specific, and that is Obviously, pregnant women need a certain level of macronutrients, which include carbohydrates and proteins. Proteins need in, needs increase during pregnancy because now you're now you need enough amino acids to be broken down and used for two people. Carbohydrates, if possible, should come from whole grains, brown rice, legumes, fruits, and vegetables, because all of these things have fiber. All of these things have extra vitamins. They don't they don't have the vitamins stripped away like enriched flour does. Fats percentage of fat doesn't necessarily have to change. In other words, the fat intake that a woman has before pregnancy can remain relatively constant. If the woman increases, obviously she's going to need to eat more when eating for two people. That should primarily come from the increases in carbohydrates and proteins, but fats should re remain relatively steady. Women who consume fish should not have too much fish, like tuna. There was a big thing about pregnant women eating tuna that came down a few years ago, and that's because you want to try to avoid mercury contamination. I guess everybody should try to avoid mercury contamination, but it's especially an issue for, uh, for pregnant women. Critical micronutrients, remember mic macronutrients are the ones that give you energy, the carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, whereas micronutrients means vitamins. The most important ones are folate, again vitamin B, calcium, iron, zinc, sodium, iodine, and vitamins A, B12, C, and D. And taking extra iron could also be important because iron is very difficult to meet. Iron is really necessary in extra quantities for a pregnant woman because iron stores are depleted to support the needs of the fetus, and therefore iron deficiency anemia is common during pregnancy. That's why very often women take iron supplements during pregnancy along with the other multivitamins that give you all these other micronutrients that are needed. Some other things include the things to limit would be caffeine, because caffeine can reach the placenta and you don't want the fetus to have to deal with caffeine. Caffeine is a stimulant, increases heart rate. For an adult, you know, an adult can handle it pretty well, but for a young child or a fetus, it can be a little bit of an issue. Other things you want to try to avoid are unpasteurized milk, juice, cheese, or raw or partially cooked eggs, meat, fish, poultry, or raw sprouts. Some of these because of the possibility of foodborne pathogens and others because of potential allergies that the fetus may have. Large fish and albacore tuna should be avoided by both pregnant and breastfeeding mothers, again because of the mercury, which is something you don't want the fetus to have to deal with. Other things that a pregnant woman should watch out for, alcohol, smoking, and drugs you want to try to avoid. Alcohol is a known teratogen, which just means something that tends to cause malfunctions or some problems, birth defects with children. Generally speaking, you want to avoid all teratogens, which are not good because they could cause birth defects. That's why they're called that.
It's so alcohol is associated with various birth defects, delivery complications, sudden infant death syndrome, increased risk of miscarriage. Obviously, a little bit of alcohol is probably okay, but more than just a little bit, you really, really want to avoid. Maternal smoking is also a very bad idea. Uh, first-hand smoking and second-hand smoking. You want to try, a pregnant woman should not only avoid smoking, but avoid being in places where other people are smoking. There's an increased risk of miscarriage, stillbirth, placental abnormalities, preterm delivery, low birth weight, all things obviously that you want to avoid. And drug, any drug that the mother takes is going to pass through the placenta, which is the cord that attaches the mother to the uh, to the fetus, to the baby, and will pass into the fetal blood, and therefore you want to try to avoid that. If a woman is taking various drugs, the newborn will actually suffer withdrawal symptoms once they're born, unless the mother keeps them on these drugs, which obviously you really, really, really don't want to do. Okay, other nutritional concerns that are relevant to um, to pregnant women include morning sickness, which doesn't necessarily have to occur in the morning. It means nausea, and throwing up, things like that. Gastroesophageal reflux, which is kind of like heartburn. Remember, gastroesophageal is when the gastro juices, the um, you know the gastric juices in the stomach, back up into the esophagus, which we discussed earlier, that causes heartburn. Gestational diabetes, which causes, which is based on a lack. Gestational means having to do with pregnancy. And diabetes, of course, is when the blood sugar level is gets out of control. And that's because insufficient insulin production or resistance that generates during pregnancy can increase blood sugar level, blood glucose level during pregnancy, and it usually resolves itself after birth occurs. But in the meantime, un, um, blood uncontrolled blue, uh, blood glucose levels can, read to, can lead to preeclampsia, which is a very serious uh, medical condition that, could, that occurs in many pregnant women. I mean, I, I know people that have suffered from preeclampsia. I mean, it, you, thankfully, everything's been okay. But preeclampsia leads to very high blood pressure, extra protein in the blood, things that you really don't want. <coughs> so preeclampsia, the symptoms are protein in the urine, which obviously is not good because the kidneys are supposed to filter out the protein, edema, uh, high blood pressure, and these are things that you really obviously are problems. Um, yeah, again, these, uh, by the way, edema is swelling and various problems that uh, can occur. Uh, deficiencies in vitamin C, vitamin E, magnesium um, increase the risk, and if not treated, it can actually be fatal, unfortunately. Uh, the, and the only way to actually end it is to actually give birth, and then it'll resolve itself on its own. But um, you want to try to avoid it, and taking these multivitamins for pregnancy are part of the ways to avoid it. The next part of the chapter deals with the infant once the infant is born. And as we know, in today's day and age, many people, I don't know if it's most people, but certainly many people, probably most people, uh, do nursing or breastfeeding. Uh, in the old days, there, there were more people that did not do that, but uh, recently, there have been many medical studies that have indicated you know, benefits to the fetus and to the mother, mother of breastfeeding, and because of that, I think there's been certainly an increase in the level of breastfeeding in the last few decades, and that's because the DHA, which is a federal organization that, um, that tr tries to educate people about health and do various other functions, they found, in bre found breast milk essential to the development of the infant's nervous system and retina, various things in the breast milk, uh, antibodies, things that the, from the mother's immune system that give over to the fetus things that are necessary for them. Uh, also, the protein in the breast milk is easy for the infant to digest, which reduces the risk of gastric distress, which means stomach aches and you know, colic, things like that. Cow's milk, which can be used um, alternatively, really they say cow's milk shouldn't be used for a baby until the baby turns a year old because of potential allergies. But even aside from allergies, cow's milk has too much protein for an in infant to absorb. So breast milk is certainly better than cow's milk. If they, when they, if the baby doesn't have breast milk, they have formulas which try to simulate breast milk as much as possible, but probably do not do so completely. Uh, there also protects the from allergies and infections. Antibodies and immune factors found in breast milk that the mother has in her bloodstream help to protect the infant from infection, and also it's non-allergenic. Babies are not, can be uh, allergic to other things, but are not generally allergic to breast milk. They can also benefit infants later on. Breastfed babies tend to have fewer ear infections, have a decreased chance of developing diabetes, obesity. Uh, in, it assists the mother in weight loss, the mother giving the nutrients in the breast milk 
allows the mother to lose maybe some of the weight that she might have put on during pregnancy. It provides an opportunity for bonding. It's it's convenient. It can be done. You don't have to uh, warm warm it up or cool it down or uh, make sure you know the bottle is clean, obviously. Uh, and it's cost efficient. It doesn't cost anything. Formula is very expensive, <laughs> as I know from firsthand. I mean, a bottle of formula costs a lot of money, and uh, if you can, breastfeeding obviously uh, eliminates the requirement to go out and buy it. Uh, now, in terms of obesity, as we discussed, it can, uh, breastfeeding can also help in that way. Infant feeding practices and other factors in early postnatal life, postnatal means after birth, um, it, the, it greatly influence the infant's physiology and risk for obesity. Breast infants grow slower uh, in length and weight than formula-fed infants. In other words, they tend to get less fat and less nutrients. Uh, not nutrients, but extra nutrients, extra fat that they don't really need. And the risk for obesity is decreased because there's lower protein. Remember, cow's milk has much more protein, and formula also has more protein than the infant can absorb, and so therefore the rest of it gets stored as energy or gets stored as fat. Breastfed infants feed more, more often than formula-fed infants, but they consume a smaller amount each one, and that causes different eating habits. It's generally healthier to eat less more often than to eat more less often. And breastfed babies have different metabolism. Again, all these things in the book obviously try to, incre to uh, encourage uh, breastfeeding. De then, now we're going to turn to infants themselves and what happens when they're getting a as they're getting a little older. Infants are at higher risk for dehydration. It's very important that infants drink a lot, whether it be breast milk formula or other things like you know Pediacure, which are you know these little uh, specially made juices, you know. I guess like almost like sports drinks that have electrolytes and a little sugar for for the taste and some water to kind of replenish infants' fluid. Pedialyte, I'm sorry, that's what it's called, pedialyte. Uh, they they have these fluids designed to try to make sure that infants don't, if they're not eating drinking enough breast milk or not drinking enough formula, that they should drink a little bit of that in order to try to get, avoid getting dehydrated. Uh, the reason for that infants are at higher risk for dehydration is that they lose more fluid by evaporation than adults. Just like adults, they sweat and evaporate, but because they're so small, the amount of sweat is a bigger percentage of their body's fluid. Infants have immature kidneys, and they're unable to concentrate urine as well as adults, so they need more water in order to filter out their bloodstream. Uh, we, adults can do, it, can do the same filtering with less water because their kidneys are much more efficient. And breast milk or formula meets an infant's fluids needs, but if they're, if obviously that's assuming that they're drinking properly, if they're not for whatever reason, then other things like Pedialyte might be necessary to um, to supplement. Uh, at six months, infants begin to need solid food. Um, foods do not. Food, there are certain foods that are obviously a bad idea for an infant, like foods that can cause choking. It's common sense. Corn syrup and honey too rich in terms of sugar content, uh, could also lead to allergies. Um, uh, goat's milk and cow's milk, again, because they have more protein and because of the allergy issue. Too much salt and sugar, you want to try to use baby food that is low in sodium and sugar. Too much formula or too much breast milk, obviously moderation is good for anything you eat, so no matter, what it, no matter how healthy it is, you don't want to have too much of it. And more than one highly allergenic foods, things like egg whites, peanuts, wheat, cow milk, cow milk based formulas, things like that. Again, you can try it once in a while. Obviously, you want to make sure the child doesn't have an allergic reaction to it, but you don't want to have too many of these because you don't want to have reactions combined. Food, foods that are good to feed an infant, iron fortified foods. They sell iron fortified rice cereal. You can just like a pregnant woman, uh, woman, uh, babies do need iron. They tend to have an iron deficiency if they're not given iron, and so therefore these special types of iron-fortified cereals are, are good for them. And rice generally has a low po probability of allergy. It's not much of an allergen, and that's why rice-based cereals are generally good. Uh, if a child isn't eating enough, very often they'll recommend that you give the child some of this special baby rice formula, which kind of supplements the breast milk and the formula. Uh, so, um, an infant's iron, dis iron stores deplete at six months, which means you want to make sure the infant is getting enough iron to keep lasting after that. And you should only introduce one new food at a time, so that if you introduce two foods at once and there's an allergic reaction, you don't know which one is actually causing the reaction. 
Okay, so now let's move to the end of chapter multiple choice. Uh, Jane thinks that all pregnant women's nutrients can be met by consuming a healthful, balanced diet. For which specific nutrient is she mistaken? Folate, calcium, protein, and iron. Now, of course, all of these things are important to get, but most of them can be met through diet alone. The one that's much more difficult is iron. As we discussed, iron is something that pregnant women are severe at severe risk for deficiency from, and so therefore iron supplements are very often a good idea. Which of the following would be good advice to give to a parent regarding introduction of solids to their six-month infant? Well, let's see. Add honey to cereal and fruit to improve their acceptance, improve their acceptance of new foods? Nope. Uh, for an infant under a year, honey is not usually a good idea. Introduce multiple new foods at a time? No, you want to try to introduce one at a time to try to isolate allergic reactions, if there are any. Iron-fortified rice cereal is the first food. It's... Mm, yeah, I mean, that's actually not a bad idea. I mean, it's rice cereal is, you know, it's, it's as the first solid food. I obviously, they don't mean formula or breast milk. But the first solid food, iron-fortified rice cereal, is probably a good idea, so that looks pretty good. And D, feed the baby foods that are high in sugar. No, you don't want to give the baby things that are high in sugar. And so, therefore, C seems to be the best answer. And finally, our very last chapter on childhood nutrition and the various differences between uh, childhood and, of course, adults. So let's take a look, first of all, at developing toddlers, obviously very young childs, very young children, excuse me. Number one, healthy eating habits include some of the following. Serving small portion sizes. Uh, one tablespoon of food for each year of age in one serving. That sounds like a little low to me. I mean, if you have a four-year-old, you're only going to give them four tablespoons, but hey, I guess uh, that's, that's what they recommend over here. Uh, one serving of cucumber would be four tablespoons, while two tablespoons of black beans or two tablespoons of cherry tomatoes would be one serving for a two-year-old. Sounds a little light, but... All right, I guess that definitely is small uh, small portion sizes. That's what they recommend over here. Snack b between meals are important rather than making the child extremely hungry during supper time because they haven't eaten in six hours. It's a good idea to give them snacks, small snacks, through the through the afternoon or through the morning so that when they get to the meal they shouldn't be overly hungry and so that they should have enough energy in between meals. Include toddlers in food shopping and preparation. Uh, I guess that's not really necessarily so much a nutrition issue, but it's uh, kind of helping them appreciate uh, what goes into food. Uh, use cookie cutters to cut a sandwich, sandwich in a star, make food fun for children, okay? Use positive reinforcements, encourage children to eat right, be a good role model, and don't bribe with food, like promising dessert as a reward for good behavior. Again, many parents do that. The book recommends that you don't. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's necessarily good one way or the other. Uh, allergies in children. You want to try to avoid allergies, obviously. If you know the child's allergic to something, common sense indicates that you shouldn't give it to the child. But rotating a food in the diet rather than serving the same one, even if the kid loves peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, giving the kid a peanut butter and jelly sandwich every single day uh, might not be the best idea in the world. And introducing new foods one at a time, as we discussed with infants, because if there is an allergy, you would like to be able to isolate it. You want to be able to make sure that you know which thing is causing the allergy. If you give the food two or th if the child two or three new foods in a day and the child has an allergic reaction, you don't know which one actually caused the uh, reaction. And when introducing a new food, watch for reactions for a full week before introducing the next new food. So one, every, one new food every week. Avoiding cherry tomatoes, excuse me, avoiding choking hazards, <laughs> not avoiding cherry tomatoes, cherry tomatoes happen to be good and they happen to be healthy, but uh, some examples of, for young children, cherry tomatoes might be a little bit of a, of a danger, if they're not cut. If they're cut, it's obviously much less of an issue. <laughs> Same thing is true with whole grapes, and again, you're talking about very young children here. You're talking about children one, two, three years old, that area. Once a child gets a little older than that, they can probably handle uh, food with skin around it. Raisins are also a choking hazard for very young children, or other large, or other solid foods which are small enough to be swallowed whole, but large enough to choke a person. So for those things, if you want to give the child a grape, I mean, when I give my two-year-old grapes, I always cut them, cut them in half, and I give it to the child that way. So it's not really a choking hazard because the juice comes out from the side that's not cut, and uh, it's, it's not as big a deal. There are some liquid foods that can be used to substitute for these. Liquid foods generally are not a problem with choking hazard for common sense reasons. Yogurt, mashed bananas, baby food in a jar, which is food that has been liquefied, these are things that are not choking hazards and therefore may be good alternatives to feed young children. 
some new concerns regarding children, and of course this includes younger children and older children. Obesity, children being overweight, a much, much bigger problem than it used to be 30, 40, 50 years ago. To help maintain a healthy weight, or to help achieve a healthy weight for a child who's already overweight, there are some things that make a lot of sense. Number one, consume appropriate sizes. Don't give the child uh, much more than is necessary for the child to satiate, satiate his or her appetite. Eat healthy snacks instead of snacks with little nutritional value. Good snacks include dried fruits and nuts, bananas, oranges, gran even granola bars. Some of these, for example, dried fruit, nuts, and granola bars all have calories. They all have plenty of calories, but at least they give you some nutrients rather than being completely empty like candy. Like um, li limit television watching. For those of you who don't know what a television is, well, it's this little box. Well, anyway, okay. Anyway, uh, I guess the same thing includes videos, uh, computer things like that. Um, limit sedentary entertainment time. Don't have a TV on during the meal because that de distracts the child from the food and makes them eat more and not enjoy the food that they actually eat and increase exercise time to at least an hour a day. The NFL, the National Football League, has this Play 60 campaign where they're trying to encourage children to play for 60 minutes a day. Uh, this helps use the extra energy that you're consumed, that the child has consumed, and it builds muscle strength. And weight loss comes from the extra uh, muscle tissue, which burns fat. The more muscle tissue you have, the faster your metabolism will burn the fat. Other nutritional concerns among children include not getting enough calcium, and so therefore you want to make sure the child drinks enough milk. Body image. This is something we discussed a little bit earlier, anorexia and other diseases like bulimia, diseases like this that arise from the fact that children, especially girls, think that they need to be super skinny, and if they're, uh, you know, if they're normal size, then, then they think that they're too fat, and that causes major problems. Body image could cause a big problem if girls mature and their bodies change, and they think that, the, and they think that they have to starve themselves in order to look normal. Children who are physically active tend to accept their body image and be more confident, which is another reason to try to get children to play more and to exercise more, and children have to understand that being thin doesn't guarantee health, popularity, or happiness. It's not the be-all, end-all. It's not the thing that is the only thing that they should be focused on, even though, of course, you know, it is important. Other nutritional concerns regarding children's nutrition include dental. Cavities and tooth decay are issues, were major issues with children, and they can be limited by frequent br br brushing, tooth brushing, limit limiting sugary sweets, using tap water with fluoride, like some cities automatically have, and fluoride toothpaste. Food insecurity and hunger, this is not as big a problem with many of us today because we live in a society where food is plentiful, but in some areas of the world food is much less plentiful. And so without adequate breakfast, children have a harder time paying attention. This actually is relevant, where children don't eat breakfast because either they don't have time or because they're not given breakfast or they're not hungry or whatever it is. And Sorry, so, so without breakfast, children have a harder time paying attention and concentrating in school when talking to parents, teachers, caretakers, etc. So what you want to make sure is that children do get an adequate breakfast. About 5 million Americans experience food insecurity. Now, food insecurity is a little different than just not eating breakfast. Food insecurity means that you don't have enough food to go around. Um, it, but it is pretty rare. You know, the United States has 300 million people, so 5 million is only less than 2%. But still, it does happen that people are too poor uh, to afford nutritious food. For adolescents, in other words for older children and teenagers, there are also similar nutritional concerns. Bone density is one from inadequate uh, calcium intake. There was a government campaign called Milk Matters to try to encourage teens to have more dairy foods and milk. And, of course, that would make sense for teens to be drinking more milk and less soda. Now, they're not going to lose weight by doing that. Milk, actually, Well, depending on the type of milk. Uh, milk, even skim milk. Well, skim, uh, skim milk has a little less calories than soda. Whole milk certainly has more calories than soda. Uh, Low-fat milk is probably about the same as soda. But certainly... It's, it's got proteins, it's got the amino acids that are necessary, it's got calcium, it's got vitamin D, if it's vitamin D fortified, these are all things that are very important. Uh, so it's definitely good to eat better to drink milk than to drink teens, even if, they, even if it has more calories.
Eating disorders and body image problems can can begin during the teen years, things like anorexia and bulimia that we discussed earlier in the course, and people should be aware of the warning signs. And other problematic activities include cigarette smoking, alcohol consumption, and drug use all have a significant impact, negative impact, on growth and health of the child. And finally, in terms of people that may have different nutritional needs, we are going to look at the elderly. The elderly have actually similar problems as children do, interestingly enough. Decreased muscle and lean tissue. Elderly people are more sedentary, they get around a little bit less, and they have to worry about you know, maybe making sure that they have enough calcium for the same reason. Decreased bone density and immune system, as we discussed before, osteoporosis is one, one potential problem. Increased fat, fat mass, impaired absorption of nutrients, taste and smell is often d diminished, uh, which for that reason, people who are elderly certainly have to pay very attention to eating, very much attention to eating a healthy diet. There's elderly people also sometimes suffer from chronic dehydration because the kidney function uh, changes in older adults, thereby changing the thirst mechanisms. Elderly people should try to always make sure to get enough fluids. Urinary incontinence may cause older adults to limit their fluid intake. If they're worried about incontinence, they may drink less, but of course that could lead to dehydration, which is not good. Let's look at some multiple choice over here. Lucy is three years old. What serving size of carrot would you recommend for her? Again, we're talking about according to the book, two tablespoons, three, four, and six. Well, as we saw before, earlier in the chapter, they recommend one tablespoon for each year of age. Since Lucy's three, three, or B in this case, would be the one. So we have B, let's look at the questions on the question on the right side. Which of the following is a cho choking hazard? Well, not sliced grapes, those are okay because they're sliced. Cherry tomatoes that are not sliced, yeah, that's definitely a choking hazard. Chocolate milk is liquid, so is yogurt's mostly liquid, so uh, the only one that really is a choking hazard would be B, and that is chocolate milk. I'm sorry, excuse me, that is cherry tomatoes. Here we have some sample essay questions for you. Just we're going to look at these essay questions, and I'm going to quickly discuss, uh, you know, what how you might answer a question like this. Here are three examples of the sorts of essay questions, mini essay questions you might get on the final exam. First, what vitamins and minerals are necessary to support bone health? Which of these are we most likely to be deficient in? Which dietary changes can we make to improve this deficiency? Well, the two main ones that come to my mind right away are vitamin D and calcium. Without calcium, you could have osteoporosis. And remember, vitamin D allows the body to produce what is necessary to maintain proper bone health. Low vitamin D levels have been associated with low bone density, etc. Same thing is true with a very similar thing with calcium. Um, vitamin D is something that people are very likely to be deficient in, especially if they don't spend a lot of the day outside. If you spend a lot of the day in the sunlight, that gives you vitamin D. But if you don't spend a lot of the day in the sunlight, vitamin D happens to be in very few natural foods that we eat. And the dietary changes you can make, well, I guess one thing, you can stay outside in the sun. The other thing is you can eat more products with, uh, you can take vitamin D supplements. That's one possibility for vitamin D. For calcium, you can drink milk and eat cheese. Things that are dairy products tend to have a lot of calcium. Also, certain types of leafy green vegetables have some calcium in it as well. And also, you can drink vitamin D fortified milk if you want to increase your uh, vitamin D uh, concentration in your body. Second one, Peter's a vegetarian, is concerned that he doesn't have enough protein. What ways could he increase his daily intake in protein? Well, the answer here, if you're, if you're a vegetarian, is to try to eat as wide a variety of different types of proteins that are not meat. Uh, you know, for example, if you do eat milk products, obviously milk products can be important. If you eat fish products, that could be important also. Eggs, if you don't eat any animal products at all, in other words, if you're a vegan, uh, then you can try soy, uh, tofu, nuts have certain, certain nuts have protein in it, um, beans, you know, legumes, things like that, and you drink a whole, or eat a whole bunch of different variety of protein sources, even if you don't eat meat or, veget or, or um, any animal products. And finally, question three, Sally works out for 45 minutes a day, five times a week. Mary works out every Monday for three and a half hours, but doesn't work out the rest of the week. Which strategy is healthier? Now, they're each getting three and a half hours. They're each getting, uh, what, 200 and... Actually, Sally's getting, well, let's see, Sally's getting uh, five times 45, which is 
225 minutes, whereas Mary is getting three and a half hours, which is 210. So Sally's actually getting a little more exercise, but let's assume they're they're pretty close. But still, it's definitely much ha healthier what Sally is doing. Uh, your body, there are many reasons why, as a matter of fact, why Sally, why it's why what Sally's doing is a lot better. Uh, first of all, the body doesn't strain as much when it's used to exercising, like it does uh, when when does when it exercises five times a week, as opposed to exercising one for three and a half hour, three and a half hours when the body's not used to it, could strain the body. Also. You don't condition the body as well when you're only exercising once a week. Uh, and there are many reasons why it's a lot healthier to exercise more infrequently, uh, more frequently, and less time than for less frequently and more time. So those are some examples of some essay questions. These are we've we've seen many multiple choice throughout. These are the kinds of combination of questions you're going to get on the on the final exam. And so as long as you know you can answer these kinds of questions and you basically understand what we've gone through, well, you don't have to understand every word. You know, Don't try to remember every single fact we've discussed. You're never going to be able to do that anyway. But if you get, uh, if you get most of them and you, get, you, ha you have, kind of have a feel of how to uh, answer these, you'll be fine. So thank you very much. Good luck. And you know, please contact us if you have any questions.